Preface of The Great Encyclical Letters of Pope Leo XIII. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Encyclical Letters of Pope Leo XIII. Translated from Approved Sources. Preface the popular demand for the encyclicals and apostolical letters of a roman pontiff is something so novel as to constitute of itself a proof of the esteem in which he is held it would seem that whatever is written of leo the thirteenth in books or newspapers instead of satisfying the universal desire for a knowledge of him only inspires the wish to know more and the conclusion that the writings of a man of such powers and worldwide sympathies must contain messages of interest and benefit to all humanity it is precisely the merit of the letters of the late pope that no matter when they were written or to whom they were addressed they are of actual and universal interest as intelligible to laymen and illiterate as to the theologian and scholar as urgent in their appeals to those who are not within the fold of which he was chief pastor as to the children of the household his arguments could not but command attention drawn as they were from history experience and reason as well as from scripture and tradition and his sincere interest in the civil and social improvements of every nation whether catholic or not made all hearken to his plea for religion as a chief factor of true progress the letters which we have selected are all characteristic of leo taken together they express his sentiments on the chief questions of a time which owing to his great influence in civil as well as in ecclesiastical matters is really an epoch in the history of men his influence on scientific studies alone is sufficient proof of this never was science so arrogant as when leo the thirteenth began to recommend to catholics the study of sound philosophy twenty-five years ago scientists everywhere were proclaiming oracularly like tyndall and huxley among the english-speaking nations the victory of science over religion when leo declared that there could be no question of victory where there was no conflict and that only men who were ignorant of the true nature of religion and science could consider them mutually antagonistic if to-day a brunetier without fear of contradiction can proclaim science bankrupt it is in a great measure because leo's encyclical on the study of st thomas and scholastic philosophy inspired catholic scientists and through their influence non-catholic scientists as well to study both theology and science more ardently systematically and conservatively and with such success in reconciling their apparent disagreements that the best scientists of our day recognize how each is but a study from a different aspect of the same great first cause and its effects and that each must necessarily therefore be in accord with the other lord kelvin's words science positively affirms creative power we are absolutely forced by science to believe with perfect confidence in a directive power and his further assertion if you think strong enough you will be forced by science to the belief in god which is the foundation of all religion you will find science not antagonistic but helpful to religion are but a re-echo of leo's utterances a quarter of a century ago a perusal of the letters contained in this volume will satisfy the reader that in other spheres as well as in that of science in education sociology and statesmanship the late pontiff by adapting himself to his age and studying carefully its needs and possibilities has so far influenced its thought and tendencies and so plainly altered its current of events as to have opened a new era in its history it would perhaps be an exaggeration to say that never before had a supreme pontificate been exercised with more distinction than by leo the thirteenth but surely in no pontiff has the world at large appreciated so well as in him the nature duties and prerogatives of the papal office and this appreciation is due chiefly if not entirely to his pontifical acts as a teacher ruler and high priest whose teachings authority and spiritual ministration have exercised an influence on all humanity as well as on his own subjects as teacher leo the thirteenth was not content with recommending true doctrine or urging reforms and improvements in catholic universities and seminaries but setting an example he issued in season and out of season his own instructions based on the soundest principles of reason and revelation about the family liberty socialism the relations of the working man and his employers the right use of political powers the menace of secret societies to the governments that harbor them the duties of christian citizens and the constitution of christian states 
as ruler he exercised a singular power over his cardinals and bishops many of whom he was magnanimous enough to appoint when their views and policy did not coincide entirely with his own by counsel direction and command he was ever aiding them to govern their dioceses and to impart to the faithful proper guidance in every matter affecting faith and morals as priest and pontiff he was solicitous for the unity integrity and splendor of christian worship instituting many reforms in the observance of the liturgy and in ecclesiastical music but he was more solicitous still for the interior holiness of the faithful as appears by his letters on human liberty the right ordering of christian life marriage the holy spirit christ the redeemer and by his zeal in raising to the altars the approved models of christian perfection in every walk of life an ardent love of truth an unwavering determination to preserve peace and concord not only among catholics but between them and their fellow citizens whether believers in christianity or not and an unfailing spirit of hope are the chief characteristics of leo in these encyclicals the great pontiff was no pessimist if he never lost sight of the evils afflicting humanity neither did he ever fail to provide a remedy nor on occasion to take comfort in what was good and to praise most generously all who had laboured to accomplish it in this he was really the vicar of christ from his tribulations learning patience from patience trial and from trial hope the hope that confoundeth not because it shared in the supreme confidence of christ in humanity who as leo loved to remind men was willing when we were yet weak according to the time to die even for the ungodly for translations of encyclicals not specially made for this book we are indebted to the tablet the american catholic quarterly review the catholic world the messenger the catholic mind the pope and the people and various pamphlets published by benzinger brothers end of preface Section 1 of The Great Encyclical Letters of Leo the Thirteenth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. On the Evils Affecting Modern Society Their Causes and Remedies. Encyclical Letter Inscrutabili, April 21, 1878 when by god's unsearchable design we though all unworthy were raised to the heights of apostolic dignity at once we felt ourselves moved by an urgent desire and as it were necessity to address you by letter not merely to express to you our very deep feeling of love but further in accordance with the task entrusted to us from heaven to strengthen you who are called to share our solicitude that you may help us to carry on the battle now being waged on behalf of the church of god and the salvation of souls for from the very beginning of our pontificate the sad sight has presented itself to us of the evils by which the human race is oppressed on every side the widespread subversion of the primary truths on which as on its foundations human society is based the obstinacy of mind that will not brook any authority however lawful the endless sources of disagreement whence arise civil strife and ruthless war and bloodshed the contempt of law which moulds characters and is the shield of righteousness the insatiable craving for things perishable with complete forgetfulness of things eternal leading up to the desperate madness whereby so many wretched beings in all directions scruple not to lay violent hands upon themselves the reckless mismanagement waste and misappropriation of the public funds the shamelessness of those who full of treachery make semblance of being champions of country of freedom and every kind of right in fine the deadly kind of plague which infests society in its inmost recesses allowing it no respite and foreboding every fresh disturbances and final disaster now the source of these evils lie chiefly we are convinced in this that the holy and venerable authority of the church which in god's name rules mankind upholding and defending all lawful authority has been despised and set aside the enemies of public order being fully aware of this have thought nothing better suited to destroy the foundations of society than to make an unflagging attack upon the church of god 
to bring her into discredit and odium by spreading infamous calumnies and accusing her of being opposed to genuine progress they labor to weaken her influence and power by wounds daily inflicted and to overthrow the authority of the bishop of rome in whom the abiding and unchangeable principles of right and good find their earthly guardian and champion from these causes have originated laws that shake the structure of the catholic church the enacting whereof we have to deplore in so many lands hence to have flowed forth contempt of episcopal authority the obstacles thrown in the way of the discharge of ecclesiastical duties the dissolution of religious bodies and the confiscation of property that was once the support of the church's ministers and of the poor thereby public institutions vowed to charity and benevolence have been withdrawn from the wholesome control of the church thence also has arisen that unchecked freedom to teach and spread abroad all mischievous principles while the church's claim to train and educate youth is in every way outraged and baffled such too is the purpose of the seizing of the temporal power conferred many centuries ago by divine providence on the bishop of rome that he might without let or hindrance use the authority conferred by christ for the eternal welfare of the nations we have recalled to your minds venerable brothers this deathly mass of ills not to increase the sorrow naturally caused you by this most sad state of things but because we believe that from his consideration you will most plainly see how serious are the matters claiming our attention as well as devotedness and with what energy we should work and more than ever under the present adverse conditions protect so far as in us lies the church of christ and the honour of the apostolic see the objects of so many slanders and assert their claims it is perfectly clear and evident venerable brothers that the very notion of civilization is a fiction of the brain if it rests not on the abiding principles of truth and the unchanging laws of virtue and justice and if unfeigned love knit not together the wills of men and gently control the interchange and the character of their mutual service now who would make bold to deny that the church by spreading the gospel throughout the nations has brought the light of truth amongst people utterly savage and steeped in foul superstition and has quickened them alike to recognize the divine author of nature and duly to respect themselves further who will deny that the church has done away with the curse of slavery and restored men to the original dignity of their noble nature and by uplifting the standards of redemption in all quarters of the globe by introducing or shielding under her protection the sciences and arts by founding and taking into her keeping excellent charitable institutions which provide relief for ills of every kind has throughout the world in private or in public life civilized the human race freed it from degradation and with all care trained it to a way of living such as befits the dignity and the hopes of man and if any one a sound mind compare the age in which we live so hostile to religion and to the church of christ with those happy times when the church was revered as a mother by the nations beyond all question we will see that our epoch is rushing wildly along the straight road to destruction while in those times which most abounded in excellent institutions peaceful life wealth and prosperity the people showed themselves most obedient to the church's rule and laws therefore if the many blessings we have mentioned due to the agency and saving help of the church are the true and worthy outcome of civilization the church of christ far from being alien to or neglectful of progress has a just claim to all men's praise as its nurse its mistress and its mother furthermore that kind of civilization which conflicts with the doctrines and laws of holy church is nothing but a worthless imitation and a meaningless name of this those people on whom the gospel light has never shone afford ample proof since in their mode of life a shadowy semblance only of civilization is discoverable while its true and solid blessings have never been possessed undoubtedly that cannot by any means be accounted the perfection of civilized life which sets all legitimate authority boldly at defiance nor can that be regarded as liberty which shamefully and by the vilest means spreading false principles and freely indulging the sensual gratification of lustful desires claims impurity for all crime and misdemeanor and thwarts the goodly influence of the worthiest citizens of whatever class delusive perverse 
and misleading as are these principles they cannot possibly have any inherent power to perfect the human race and fill it with blessing for sin maketh nations miserable such principles as a matter of course must hurry nations corrupted in mind and heart and to every kind of infamy we can all right order and thus sooner or later bring the standing and peace of the state to the very brink of ruin again if we consider the achievements of the see of rome what can be more wicked than to deny how much and how well the roman bishops have served civilized society at large for our predecessors to provide for the people's good encountered struggles of every kind endured to the utmost burdensome toils and never hesitated to expose themselves to most dangerous trials with eyes fixed on heaven they neither bowed down their head before the threats of the wicked nor allowed themselves to be led by flattery or bribes into unworthy compliance this apostolic chair it was that gathered and held together the crumbling remains of the old order of things this was the kindly light by whose help the culture of christian times shone far and wide this was an anchor of safety in the fierce storms by which the human race has been convulsed this was the sacred bond of union that linked together nations distant in region and differing in character in short this was a common centre from which was sought instruction in faith and religion no less than guidance and advice for the maintenance of peace and the functions of practical life in very truth it is the glory of the supreme pontiffs that they steadfastly set themselves up as a wall and a bulwark to save human society from falling back into its former superstition and barbarism would that this healing authority had never been slighted or set aside assuredly neither would the civil power have lost that venerable and sacred glory the lustrous gift of religion which alone renders the state of subjection noble and worthy of man nor would so many revolutions and wars have been fomented to ravage the world with desolation and bloodshed nor would kingdoms once so flourishing but now fallen from the height of prosperity lie crushed beneath the weight of every kind of calamity of this the people of the east also furnish an example who by breaking the most sweet yoke that bound them to this apostolic sea forfeited the splendour of their former greatness the renown in science and art and the dignity of their sway of these remarkable benefits however which illustrious monuments of all ages prove to have flowed upon every quarter of the world from the apostolic sea this land of italy has had the most abounding experience for it has derived advantages from the sea of peter proportionate to the greater nearness of its natural situation unquestionably to the roman pontiffs it is that italy must own herself indebted for the substantial glory and majesty by which she has been preeminent amongst nations the influence and fatherly care of the popes have upon many occasions shielded her from hostile attack and brought her relief and aid the effect of which is that the catholic faith has been ever maintained inviolate in the hearts of italians these services of our predecessors to omit mention of many others have been witnessed to in a splendid manner by the records of the times of saint leo the great alexander the third innocent the third saint pius v leo the tenth and other pontiffs by whose exertions or protection italy has escaped unscathed from the other destruction threatened by barbarians has kept unimpaired her old faith and amid the darkness and defilement of a ruder age has cultivated and preserved in vigour the lustre of science and the splendour of art to this furthermore bears witness our own fostering city the home of the popes which under their rule reaped this special benefit that it not only was the strong citadel of the faith but also became the refuge of the liberal arts and the very abode of culture winning for itself the admiration and respect of the whole world as these facts in all their amplitude have been handed down in historical records for the perpetual remembrance of posterity it is easy to understand that it is only with hostile design and shameless calumny meant to mislead men that any one can venture in speech and in writing to accuse the apostolic see of being an obstacle to the civil progress of nations and to the prosperity of italy seeing therefore that all the hopes of italy and of the whole world lie in the power so beneficent to the common good and profit wherewith the authority of the apostolic seat is endowed 
and in the close union which binds all the faithful of Christ to the Roman Pontiff. We recognize that nothing should be nearer our hearts than how to preserve safe and sound the dignity of the Roman See, and to strengthen ever more and more the union of members with the head, of the children with their father. Wherefore, that we may above all things, and in every possible way, maintain the rights and freedom of this holy see, we shall never cease to strive that our authority may meet with due deference, that obstacles may be removed which hamper the free exercise of our ministry, and that we may be restored to that condition of things in which the design of God's wisdom had long ago placed the Roman pontiffs. We are moved to demand this restoration, venerable brethren, not by any feeling of ambition or desire of supremacy, but by the nature of our office, and by our sacred promise, confirmed on oath. And further, not only because this sovereignty is essential to protect and preserve the full liberty of the spiritual power, but also because it is an ascertained fact that, when the temporal sovereignty of the apostolic see is in question, the cause of the public good and the well-being of all human society in general are also at stake. Hence, we cannot omit, in the discharge of our duty, which obliges us to guard the rights of Holy Church, to renew and confirm in every particular by this our letter those declarations and protests which Pius IX of sacred memory, our predecessor, on many and repeated occasions, published against the seizing of the civil sovereignty and the infringement of rights belonging to the Roman Church. At the same time, we address ourselves to princes and chief rulers of the nations, and earnestly beseech them, in the august name of the Most High God, not to refuse the Church's aid preferred them in a season of such need, but with united and friendly aims to join themselves to her as the source of authority and salvation, and to attach themselves to her more and more in the bonds of hearty love and devotedness. God grant that, seeing the truth of our words, and considering within themselves that the teaching of Christ is, as Augustine used to say, a great blessing to the state if obeyed, and that their own peace and safety, as well as that of their people, is bound up with the safety of the church, and the reverence due to her. They may give their whole thought and care to mitigating the evils by which the church and its visible head are harassed, and so it may at last come to pass that the peoples whom they govern might enter on the way of justice and peace, and rejoice in the happy era of prosperity and glory. In the next place, in order that the union of hearts between their chief pastor and the whole Catholic flock may daily be strengthened, we here call upon you, venerable brethren, with particular earnestness, and strongly urge you to kindle, with priestly zeal and pastoral care, the fire of the love of religion among the faithful entrusted to you, that their attachment to this chair of truth and justice may become closer and firmer, that they may welcome all its teachings with thorough assent of mind and will, wholly rejecting such opinions, even when most widely received, as they know to be contrary to the Church's doctrine. In this matter, the Roman pontiffs, our predecessors, and last of all, Pius the Ninth of sacred memory, especially in the General Council of the Vatican, have not neglected, so often as there was need to condemn widespreading errors and to smite them with the apostolic condemnation. This they did, keeping before their eyes the words of St. Paul, Beware lest any man cheat you by philosophy and vain deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the elements of the world, and not according to Christ. All such censures we, following in the steps of our predecessors, do confirm and renew from this apostolic seat of truth, whilst we earnestly ask of the Father of lights that all the faithful, brought to thorough agreement in the like feeling and the same belief, may think and speak even as ourselves. It is your duty, venerable brothers, sedulously to strive that the seed of heavenly doctrine be sown broadcast in the field of God, and that the teachings of the Catholic faith may be implanted early in the souls of the faithful, may strike deep root in them, and be kept free from the ruinous blight of error. The more the enemies of religion exert themselves to offer the uninformed, especially the young, such instruction as darkens the mind and corrupts morals, the more actively should we endeavor that not only a suitable and solid method of education may flourish, but above all that this education be wholly in harmony with the Catholic faith in its literature and system of training, and chiefly in philosophy, upon which the foundation of other sciences in great measure depends. 
Philosophy seeks not the overthrow of divine revelation, but delights rather to prepare its way and defend it against assailants, both by example and in written works, as the great Augustine and the angelic doctor, with all other teachers of Christian wisdom, have proved to us. Now, the training of youth most conducive to the defense of true faith and religion, and to the preservation of morality, must find its beginning from an early stage within the circle of home life, and this family Christian training, sadly undermined in these our times, cannot possibly be restored to its due dignity, save by those laws under which it was established in the Church by her divine founder himself. Our Lord Jesus Christ, by raising to the dignity of a sacrament the contract of matrimony, in which he would have his own union with the Church typified, not only made the marriage tie more holy, but in addition provided efficacious sources of aid for parents and children alike, so that, by the discharge of their duties one to another, they might with greater ease attain to happiness, both in time and in eternity. But when impious laws, setting at naught the sanctity of this great sacrament, put it on the same footing with mere civil contracts, the lamentable result followed, that, outraging the dignity of Christian matrimony, citizens made use of legalized concubinage in place of marriage husband and wife neglected their bounden duty to each other children refused obedience and reverence to their parents the bonds of domestic love were loosened and alas the worst scandal and of all the most ruinous public morality very frequently an unholy passion opened the door to disastrous and fatal separations these most unhappy and painful consequences, venerable brothers, cannot fail to arouse your zeal and move you constantly and earnestly to warn the faithful committed to your charge to listen with docility to your teaching regarding the holiness of Christian marriage and to obey the laws by which the Church controls the duties of married people and of their offspring. Then, indeed, will that most desirable result come about that, that the character and conduct of individuals also will be reformed. For just as from a rotten stock are produced healthless branches or worthless fruits, so do the ravages of a pestilence which ruins the household spread wide their cruel infection to the hurt and injury of the individual citizens. On the other hand, when domestic society is fashioned in the mold of Christian life, each member will gradually grow accustomed to the love of religion and piety, to the abhorrence of false and harmful teaching, to the pursuit of virtue, to obedience to elders, and to the restraint of that insatiable seeking after self-interest alone, which so spoils and weakens the character of men. To this end it will certainly help not a little to encourage and promote those pious associations which have been established, in our own times especially, with so great profit to the cause of the Catholic religion. Great indeed, and beyond the strength of man, are these objects of our hopes and prayers, venerable brothers. But since God has made the nations of the earth for health, when he founded the church for the welfare of the peoples, and promised that he will abide with her by his assistance to the end of the world, we firmly trust that, through your endeavors, the human race, taking warning from so many evils and visitations, will submit themselves at length to the Church, and turn for health and prosperity through the infallible guidance of this apostolic see. Meanwhile, venerable brothers, before bringing this letter to a close, we must express our congratulations on the striking harmony and concord which unites your minds among yourselves and with this apostolic see. This perfect union we regard as not merely an impregnable bulwark against hostile attacks, but also as an auspicious and happy omen, presaging better times for the Church, and while it yields great relief to our weakness, it seasonably encourages us to endure with readiness all labors and all struggles on behalf of God's Church and the arduous task which we have undertaken. Moreover, from the causes of hope and rejoicing which we have made known to you, we cannot separate those tokens of love and obedience which you, venerable brethren, in these first days of our pontificate, have shown our lowliness, and with you so many of the clergy and the faithful, who, by letters sent, by offerings given, by pilgrimages undertaken, and by other works of love, have made it clear that the devotion and charity which they manifested to our most worthy predecessor still lasts so strong and steadfast and unchanged as not to slacken towards the person of a successor so much inferior 
for these splendid tokens of catholic piety we humbly confess to the lord that he is good and gracious while to you venerable brothers and to all our beloved children from whom we have received them we publicly from the bottom of our heart avow the grateful feelings of our soul cherishing the fullest confidence that in the present critical state of things and in the difficulties of the times this your devotion and love and the devotion and love of the faithful will never fail us nor have we any doubt that these conspicuous examples of filial piety and christian virtue will be of such avail as to make our most merciful god moved by these dutiful deeds look with favor on his flock and grant the church peace and victory but as we are sure that this peace and victory will more quickly and more readily be given us if the faithful are unremitting in their prayers and supplications to obtain it we earnestly exhort you venerable brothers to stir up for this end the zeal and ardor of the faithful taking the immaculate queen of heaven as their intercessor with god and having recourse as their advocates to saint joseph the heavenly patron of the church and to saints peter and paul the princes of the apostles to the powerful patronage of all these we humbly commit our lowliness all ranks of the ecclesiastical hierarchy and all the flock of christ our lord for the rest we trust that these days on which we renew the memory of jesus christ risen from the dead may be to you venerable brothers and to all the fold of god a source of blessing and salvation and fullness of holy joy praying our most gracious god that by the blood of the lamb without spot which blotted out the handwriting that was against us the sins we have committed may be washed away and the judgment we are suffering for them may mercifully be mitigated the grace of our lord jesus christ and the charity of god and the communication of the holy ghost be with you all venerable brothers to each and all of whom as well as to our beloved children the clergy and faithful of your churches as a pledge of our special good will and as an earnest of the protection of heaven we lovingly impart the apostolic benediction end of section one Section two of the Great Encyclical Letters of Pope Leo the Thirteenth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Socialism, Communism, Nihilism. Encyclical Letter, Quod Apostolici Muneris, December twenty eighth, eighteen seventy eight. As the nature of our apostolic office required of us, we have not omitted from the very outset of our pontificate addressing you venerable brothers and encyclical letters in order to advert to the deadly plague which is tainting society to its very core and bringing it to a state of extreme peril at the same time we call attention to certain most effectual remedies by which society may be renewed unto salvation and enabled to escape the crisis now threatening but the evils which we then deplored have taken in a brief space of time such widespread growth that we are compelled to address you anew with the words of the prophet resounding as it were in our ears cry cease not lift up thy voice like a trumpet you understand as a matter of course venerable brothers that we are alluding to that sect of men who under the motley and all but barbarous terms and titles of socialists communists and nihilists are spreading abroad throughout the world and bound intimately together in baneful alliance no longer look for strong support in secret meetings held in darksome places but standing forth openly and boldly in the light of day strive to carry out the purpose long resolved upon of uprooting the foundations of civilized society at large these are they in very truth who as the sacred text bears witness defile the flesh and despise dominion and blaspheme majesty they leave nothing scatheless or uninjured of that which human and divine laws alike have wisely ordained to ensure the preservation and honor of life from the heads of states to whom as the apostle admonishes all owe submission and on whom the rights of authority are bestowed by god himself these sectaries withhold obedience and preach up the perfect equality of all men in regard to rights alike and duties the natural union of man and woman which is held sacred even among barbarous nations they hold in scorn and its bond whereby family life is chiefly maintained 
they slacken or else yield up to the sway of lust in short spurred on by greedy hankerings after things present which is the root of all evils which some coveting have erred from the faith they attack the right of property sanctioned by the law of nature and with signal depravity while pretending to feel solicitous about the needs and anxious to satisfy the requirements of all they strain every effort to seize upon and hold in common all that has been individually acquired by title of lawful inheritance through intellectual or manual labor or economy in living these monstrous views they proclaim in public meetings uphold in booklets and spread broadcast everywhere through the daily press hence the hallowed dignity and authority of rulers has incurred such odium on the part of rebellious subjects that evil-minded traitors spurning all control have many a time within a recent period boldly raised impious hands against even the very heads of states such daring conduct on the part of disloyal individuals which threatens the civilized community from day to day with even graver perils and troubles the mind of all with anxious fears draws its cause and origin from those venomous teachings which like pernicious seeds scattered far and wide among the nations have produced in course of time death-bearing fruits in fact venerable brothers you know full well that the atrocious war which starting from the sixteenth century was declared against the catholic faith by the reformers and which has been growing amain from day to day in vehemence aimed at giving free course to the rejection of all revelation the subversion of the supernatural order and the enthronement of unaided reason with its vagaries or rather ravings deriving pretentiously its name from reason this vague doctrine by flattering and stimulating the eagerness to outstrip others which is interwoven with man's nature and giving the rein to every kind of unlawful desire has taken willing possession of the minds of great numbers and has even pervaded the whole of civilized society hence by a fresh act of impiety unknown even to very pagans governments have been organized without god and the order established by him being taken at all into account it has even been contended that public authority with its dignity and its power of ruling originates not from god but from the mass of the people which considering itself unfettered by all divine sanction refuses to submit to any laws that it has not itself passed of its own free will next after having attacked and cast away the supernatural truths of faith as being contrary to reason the very author and redeemer of mankind has been forced slowly and gradually to withdraw from the scheme of studies at universities colleges and high schools as well as from all the practical working of public life in fine after having consigned to oblivion the rewards and punishments of a future and never-ending existence the keen longing after happiness has been narrowed down to the range of the present life with such doctrines spread far and wide and such license in thought and action it is no wonder that men of the most lowly condition heart-sick of a humble home or poor workshop should fix eager eyes on the abodes and fortunes of the wealthy no wonder that tranquillity no longer prevails in public or private life or that the human race has been hurried onward to well nigh the verge of ruin but the supreme pastors of the church on whom devolves the charge of guarding the lord's flock from the snares of the enemy have in good time devoted their energies to avert the danger impending and to provide for the safety of the faithful in fact as soon as secret societies began to take extension in the midst whereof the germs of those evil principles already averted to were nursed the roman pontiffs clement the fifteenth and benedict the fourteenth failed not to unmask the impious designs of the sectaries and to warn the faithful throughout the world concerning the mischiefs they were thus hatching in secret but when by those who gloried in the title of philosophers a certain unbridled liberty was assigned to man and the new law as they term it began in opposition to the divine and natural law to be set forth and gather sanction pius the sixth of happy memory forthwith laid bare by public documents the pernicious character and falsity of those principles and at the same time with apostolic foresight predicted the utter ruin to which the deluded multitudes were being hurried but since notwithstanding the measures resorted to 
none proved of avail to prevent their wicked doctrines from day by day gaining ground with the people and obtaining ascendancy even in public decisions of government popes pius the seventh and leo the twelfth excommunicated secret societies and once more gave warning to society of the perils that threatened it in fine the world at large is fully aware in what earnest terms and with what resoluteness of soul and unflinching constancy our glorious predecessor pius the ninth of happy memory by allocutions alike and encyclical letters addressed to the bishops of the whole world levelled war against the iniquitous endeavours of these sects and furthermore even denounced by name the plague of socialism thence bursting forth it is to be deplored however that they to whom has been entrusted the care of the common welfare allowing themselves to be circumvented by the fraudulent devices of infamous men and terror stricken at their threats have ever displayed towards the church feelings of suspicion or even of hostility not understanding that the endeavors of these sects would have been of no effect had the doctrine of the catholic church and the authority of the roman pontiff among rulers and people alike always remained in due honor for the church of the living god which is the pillar and ground of truth proclaims those doctrines and precepts whereby the security and calm of society is provided for and the accursed brood of socialism is utterly destroyed for although the socialists turning to evil used the gospel itself so as to deceive more readily the unwary have been wont to twist it to their meaning still so striking is the disagreement between their criminal teachings and the pure doctrine of christ that no greater can exist for what participation hath justice with injustice or what fellowship hath light with darkness they in good sooth cease not from asserting as we have already mentioned that all men are by nature equal and hence they contend that neither honor nor respect is owed to public authority nor any obedience to the laws saving perhaps to those which have been sanctioned according to their good pleasure contrawise from the gospel records equality among men consists in this that one and all possessing the same nature are called to the sublime dignity of being sons of god and moreover that one and the same end being set before all each and every one has to be judged according to the same laws and to have punishments or rewards meted out according to individual deserts there is however an inequality of right and authority which emanates from the author of nature himself of whom all paternity in heaven and earth is named as regards rulers and subjects all without exception according to catholic teaching and precept are mutually bound by duties and rights in such manner that on the one hand moderation is enjoined on the appetite for power and on the other obedience is shown to be easy stable and wholly honourable therefore does the church constantly urge upon each and all who are subject to her the apostolic precept there is no power but from god and those that are are ordained of god therefore he that resisteth the powers resisteth the ordinance of god and they that resist purchase to themselves damnation and again be subject of necessity not only for wrath but also for conscience's sake and render to all men their dues tribute to whom tribute is due custom to whom custom fear to whom fear honour to whom honour for he who has created and governs all things has in his provident wisdom so disposed them that the lowest attain to their end by the middlemost and the middlemost by the highest just then as the almighty willed that in the heavenly kingdom itself the choirs of angels should be of differing ranks subordinate the one to the other again just as in the church god has established different grades of orders with diversity of functions so that all should not be apostles all not doctors all not prophets so also has he established in civil society many orders of varying dignity right and power and this to the end that the state like the church should form one body comprising many members some excelling others in rank and importance but all alike necessary to one another and solicitous for the common welfare but to the end that the rulers of the people should employ the power bestowed for the advancement and not detriment of those under rule the church of christ very fittingly warns the rulers themselves 
that the sovereign judge will call them to a strict and speedy account and evoking the words of divine wisdom she addresses them one and all in god's name give ear you that rule the people and that please yourselves in multitudes of nations for power is given you by the lord and strength by the most high who will examine your works and search out your thoughts for a most severe judgment shall be for those that bear rule for god will not accept any man's person neither will he stand in awe of any one's greatness for he hath made the little and the great and he hath equally care of all but a greater punishment is ready for the more mighty should it however happen at any time that in the public exercise of authority rulers act rashly and arbitrarily the teaching of the catholic church does not allow subjects to rise against them without further warranty lest peace and order become more and more disturbed and society run the risk of greater detriment and when things have come to such a pass as to hold out no further hope she teaches that a remedy is to be sought in the virtue of christian patience and an urgent prayer to god but should it please legislatures and rulers to enjoin or sanction anything repugnant to the divine and natural law the dignity and duty of the name of christian and the apostolic injunction proclaim that one ought to obey god rather than men moreover the solitary influence of the church which redounds to the upholding of well-regulated order in civil society and promotes its conservation the family circle itself which is the starting point of every city and every state necessarily feels and experiences for you are fully aware venerable brothers that the governing principle of family life has in accordance with the requirements of natural law its basis in the indissoluble union of husband and wife and its superstructure in the duties and rights of parents and children and of masters and servants towards each other you are further aware that the theories of socialism would quickly destroy this family life since the stability afforded by marriage under religious sanction once lost paternal authority over children and the duties of children to parents are necessarily and most harmfully slackened contrariwise marriage honorable to all which from the beginning of the world god himself instituted for the propagation and preservation of the human race and decreed to be indissoluble the church holds to have become more stable and holy through christ who conferred on it the dignity of a sacrament and willed to make it an image of his own union with the church wherefore as the apostle admonishes as christ is the head of the church so is the husband the head of the wife and just as the church is subject to christ who cherishes it with most chaste and lasting love so is it becoming that women also should be subject to their husbands and by them in turn be loved with faithful and constant affection in like manner the church regulates the authority of the father and the master in such mode as to keep children and servants within their duty without however allowing authority to be overstepped for according to catholic teaching the authority of the heavenly father and lord flows forth upon parents and masters and on that account receives not only its origin and power from god but also its very nature and character hence does the apostle exhort children to obey their parents in the lord and to honor their father and their mother which is the first commandment with a promise and you fathers provoke not your children to anger but bring them up in the discipline and correction of the lord and again by the same divine apostolic injunction it is urged on servants and masters that the former should obey their masters according to the flesh as to christ with a good will serving as to the lord but the latter should forbear threatenings knowing that the lord of all is in heaven and there is no respect of persons with him were all these things observed by every one whom they concern according to the intent of the divine will each family would truly present a likeness of the heavenly home and the wondrous benefits thence resulting would not be limited simply to the family circle but would spread abroad abundantly over the state at large as regards the maintenance of public and private tranquillity catholic wisdom sustained by both divine and natural law prudently provides through what it holds and teaches touching the right of ownership and the apportioning of personal property which has been accumulated for the wants and requirements of life 
for the socialists wrongly assume the right of property to be of mere human invention repugnant to the natural equality between men and preaching of the community of goods declare that no one should endure poverty meekly and that all may with impunity seize upon the possessions and usurp the rights of the wealthy more wisely and profitably the church recognizes the existence of inequality amongst men who are by nature unlike in mental endowment and strength of body and even in amount of fortune and she enjoins that the right of property and of its disposal derived from nature should in the case of every individual remain intact and inviolate she knows full well indeed that robbery and rapine have been so forbidden by god the author and protector of every right that it is unlawful even to covet the goods of others and that thieves and robbers no less than adulterers and idolaters are excluded from the kingdom of heaven nor does she on this account loving mother as she is omit solicitude for the poor or fail to provide for their needs nay taking them to her arms with maternal affection and knowing that they in a manner represent the person of christ himself who accounts as done unto him any benefit conferred upon the lowliest among the poor she holds them in great account brings them aid to the utmost of her power takes thought to have erected in every land of their behoof homes and refuges where they can be received nurtured and tended and takes those charitable foundations under her protecting care moreover she lays the rich under her strict command to give of their superfluity to the poor and pressing them with fear of the divine judgment which will exact the penalty of eternal punishment unless they succor the wants of the needy in fine she cheers and comforts exceedingly the hearts of the poor either by setting before them the example of christ who being rich became poor for our sakes or by reminding them of the words by which jesus pronounced the poor to be blessed and enjoined them to hope for the reward of eternal bliss who then does not perceive that herein lies the best means of appeasing the undying conflict between the rich and poor for as the evidence of things in facts clearly demonstrates if such conclusion be disallowed or made light of it must come about either that the vast majority of mankind will fall back into that most abject condition of bondage which through a long lapse of time obtained amongst pagan nations or else that human society will be agitated by constant outbreaks and ravaged by plunder and rapine such as even of late years we have had occasion to deplore since things have come to this pass venerable brothers we on whom is laid the charge of governing the universal church pointed out even at the very outset of our pontificate to the nations and their rulers tossed about by so dire a tempest the port to which they could betake themselves in all safety and now moved greatly by the extreme peril which actually threatens we lift up anew our apostolic voice and conjure them again and again for the sake of their own safety and that of the state to welcome and obey the teaching of that church which has deserved so well in promoting the public prosperity of nations and to recognize once for all that the relations of the state and of religion are so bound together as that whatever is withdrawn from religion impairs by so much the dutiful submission of the subject and the dignity of authority and when they shall have recognized that the church of christ is possessed of a power to starve off the pest of socialism too mighty to be found in human enactments or in the strong hand of the civil power or in military force let them re-establish that church in the condition and liberty needed in order to be able to exercise their most salutary influence for the good of society in general do you however venerable brothers who have keen insight as to the nature and origin of the ills thickening ever in the world apply yourselves with all zeal and energy of spirit to inculcate catholic doctrine that it may reach and strike deep root in the souls of all provide as far as may be that from early years all may grow accustomed to cherish a filial love towards god and to revere his sovereign sway to show due submission to rulers and the laws to bridle their passions and zealously uphold the authority which god has established alike in the state and in the family circle moreover it behooves you to strive earnestly that the children of the catholic church venture not to lend their name nor in any way to give countenance to this hateful sect but on the contrary that by worthy deeds and honourable line of action in all particulars they show how well and happily human society would prosper were the individual members distinguishable for the regularity of their conduct and for their virtuous life 
Finally, as the confederates of socialism are sought mainly among those who occupy themselves in business pursuits or give themselves to manual labor, and who, wearied out by sheer hard work, are more easily entrapped by the hope of wealth and promise of prosperity, it seems expedient to encourage associations for handicraftsmen and laboring men which, placed under the sheltering care of religion, may render the members content with their lot and resigned to toil, inducing them to lead a peaceful and tranquil life. On our undertakings, venerable brothers, and on yours, may you confer a favoring aid to whom we are bound to refer the beginning and the end of all good. We have ample ground to hope for speedy help during these auspicious days, when the festival of our Lord's Nativity is being celebrated. That new deliverance which Christ, born into a world sinking with years and well nigh crushed with the weight of ills, charges us to hope for, that peace which then he announced to men through the ministry of angels, he has promised to bestow likewise on us. For the hand of the Lord is not shortened that he cannot save, neither is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. During these days, then, of most happy augury, venerable brothers, wishing to you and to all the faithful of your churches all joy and prosperity, we earnestly pray the giver of all good gifts that anew to men may appear the goodness and kindness of God our Saviour, who, after having snatched up from the power of a ruthless enemy, has raised us up to the most exalted dignity of being sons of God. And in order that our vows may be the more speedily and abundantly satisfied, join with us, venerable brothers, in addressing to God fervent prayers, invoking also the patronage of the Blessed Virgin Mary, ever immaculate, and of her spouse, Joseph, as also of the blessed apostles Peter and Paul, in whose intercession we greatly confide. And in the meantime, with inmost affection of heart to you, venerable brothers, to your clergy, and to all the faithful throughout the world, as a harbinger of the divine gifts, we impart our apostolic blessing. End of section 2section three of the great encyclical letters of pope leo the thirteenth this LibriVox recording is in the public domain the study of scholastic philosophy encyclical letter eterni patris august fourth eighteen seventy nine the only begotten son of the eternal father who came on earth to bring salvation and the light of divine wisdom to men conferred a great and wonderful blessing on the world when about to ascend again into heaven he commanded the apostles to go and teach all nations and left the church which he had founded to be the common and supreme teacher of the peoples for men whom the truth had set free were to be preserved by the truth nor would the fruits of heavenly doctrines by which salvation comes to men have long remained had not the lord christ appointed an unfailing authority for the instruction of the faithful and the church built upon the promises of its own divine author whose charity it imitated so faithfully followed out his commands that its constant aim and chief wish was this to teach true religion and contend for ever against errors to this end assuredly have tended the incessant labors of individual bishops to this end also the published laws and decrees of councils and especially the constant watchfulness of the roman pontiffs to whom as successors of the blessed peter in the primacy of the apostles belongs the right and office of teaching and confirming their brethren in the faith since then according to the warning of the apostle the minds of christ's faithful are apt to be deceived and the integrity of the faith to be corrupted among men by philosophy and vain deceit the supreme pastors of the church have always thought it their duty to advance by every means in their power science truly so called and at the same time to provide with special care that all studies should accord with the catholic faith especially philosophy on which a right apprehension of the other sciences in great part depends indeed venerable brethren on this very subject among others we briefly admonished you in our first encyclical letter but now both by reason of the gravity of the subject and the condition of the time we are again compelled to speak to you on the mode of taking up the study of philosophy which shall respond most fitly to the true faith 
and at the same time be most consonant with the dignity of human knowledge. Whoso turns his attention to the bitter strifes of these days, and seeks a reason for the troubles that vex public and private life, must come to the conclusion that a fruitful cause of the evils which now afflict, as well as of those which threaten us, lies in this, that false conclusions concerning divine and human things, which originated in the schools of philosophy, have crept into all the orders of the state, and have been accepted by the common consent of the masses. For since it is in the very nature of man to follow the guide of reason in his actions, if his intellect sins at all, his will soon follows. And thus it happens that looseness of intellectual opinion influences human actions and perverts them, whereas, on the other hand, if men be of sound mind and take their stand on true and solid principles, there will result a vast amount of benefits for the public and private good. We do not, indeed, attribute such force and authority to philosophy as to esteem it equally to the task of combating and rooting out all errors. For, when the Christian religion was first constituted, it came upon earth to restore it to its primeval dignity by the admirable light of faith, diffused not by persuasive words of human wisdom, but in the manifestation of spirit and of power. So also at the present time we look above all things to the powerful help of Almighty God to bring back to a right understanding the minds of men and dispel the darkness of error. But the natural helps with which the grace of the divine wisdom strongly and sweetly disposing all things have supplied the human race are neither to be despised nor neglected, chief among which is evidently the right use of philosophy. For not in vain did God set the light of reason in the human mind, and so far as the superadded light of faith from extinguishing or lessening the power of the intelligence, that it completes it, rather, and by adding to its strength renders it capable of greater things. Therefore divine providence itself requires that in calling back the peoples to the paths of faith and salvation, advantage should be taken of human science also an approved and wise practice which history testifies was observed by the most illustrious fathers of the church they indeed were wont neither to belittle nor undervalue the part that reason had to play as is summed up by the great augustine when he attributes to this science that by which the most wholesome faith is begotten is nourished defended and made strong in the first place philosophy if rightly made use of by the wise in a certain way tends to smooth and fortify the road to true faith and to prepare the souls of its disciples for the fit reception of revelation for which reason it is well called by ancient writers sometimes a stepping-stone to the christian faith sometimes the prelude and help of christianity sometimes the gospel teacher and assuredly the god of all goodness to all that pertains to divine things has not only manifested by the light of faith those truths which human intelligence could not attain of itself, but others also not altogether unattainable by reason, that by the help of divine authority they may be made known to all at once and without any admixture of error. Hence it is that certain truths which were either divinely proposed for belief or were bound by the closest chains to a doctrine of faith were discovered by pagan sages, with nothing but their natural reason to guide them, were demonstrated and proved by becoming arguments. For, as the Apostle says, the invisible things of him, from the creation of the world, are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, his eternal power also and divinity. And the Gentiles who have not the law show, nevertheless, the work of the law written in their hearts. But it is most fitting to turn these truths, which have been discovered by the pagan sages even, to the use and purposes of revealed doctrine, in order to show that both human wisdom and the very testimony of our adversaries serve to support the Christian faith, a method which is not of recent introduction, but of established use, and has often been adopted by the holy fathers of the church. For instance, those venerable men, the witnesses and guardians of religious traditions, recognize a certain form and figure of this in the action of the Hebrews, who, when about to depart out of Egypt, were commanded to take with them the gold and silver vessels and precious robes of the Egyptians, that by a change of use 
the things might be dedicated to the service of the true god which had formerly been the instruments of ignoble and superstitious rites gregory of neo caesarea praises origin expressly because with singular dexterity as one snatches weapons from the enemy he turned to the defence of christian wisdom and to the destruction of superstition many arguments drawn from the writings of the pagans and both gregory of nazianzen and gregory of nisa praise and commend a like mode of disputation in basil the great while jerome especially commends it in quadratus a disciple of the apostles and aristides justin irenaeus and very many others augustine says do we not see cyprian that mildest of doctors and most blessed of martyrs going out of egypt laden with gold and silver investments and lactantius also and victorinus optatus and hilary and not to speak of the living how many greeks have done likewise but if natural reason first sowed this rich field of doctrine before it was rendered fruitful by the power of christ it must assuredly become more prolific after the grace of the saviour has renewed and added to the native faculties of the human mind and who does not see that a plain and easy road is opened up to faith by such a method of philosophic study but the advantage to be derived from such a school of philosophy is not to be confined within these limits the foolishness of those men is gravely reproved in the words of divine wisdom who by these good things that are seen could not understand him that is neither by attending to the works could have acknowledged who was the workman in the first place then this great and noble fruit is gathered from human reason that it demonstrates that god is for by the greatness of the beauty and of the creature the creator of them may be seen so as to be known thereby again it shows god to excel in the height of all perfections an infinite wisdom before which nothing lies hidden and an absolute justice which no depraved affection could possibly shake and that god therefore is not only true but truth itself which can neither deceive nor be deceived whence it clearly follows that human reason finds the fullest faith and authority united in the word of god in like manner reason declares that the doctrine of the gospel has even from its very beginning been made manifest by certain wonderful signs the established proofs as it were of unshaken truth and that all therefore who set faith in the gospel do not believe rashly as though following cunningly devised fables but by a most reasonable consent subject their intelligence and judgment to an authority which is divine and of no less importance is it that reason must clearly set forth that the church instituted by christ as laid down in the vatican synod on account of its wonderful spread its marvellous sanctity and its inexhaustible fecundity in all places as well as of its catholic unity and unshaken stability is in itself a great and perpetual motive of belief and an irrefragable testimony of its own divine mission its solid foundations having been thus laid perpetual and varied service is further required of philosophy in order that sacred theology may receive and assume the nature form and genius of a true science for in this the most noble of studies it is of the greatest necessity to bind together as it were in one body the many and various parts of the heavenly doctrines that each being allotted to its own proper place and derived from its own proper principles the whole may join together in a complete union in order in fine that all in each part may be strengthened by its own and the other's invincible arguments nor is that more accurate or fuller knowledge of the things that are believed and somewhat more lucid understanding as far as it can go of the very mysteries of faith which augustine and the other fathers commended and strove to reach and which the vatican synod itself declared to me most fruitful to be passed over in silence or belittled those will certainly more fully and more easily attain that knowledge and understanding who to integrity of life and love of faith join a mind rounded and finished by philosophic studies as the same vatican synod teaches that the knowledge of such sacred dogmas ought to be sought as well as from analogy of the things that are naturally known as from the connection of those mysteries one with another and with the final end of man 
lastly the duty of religiously defending the truths divinely delivered and of resisting those who dare oppose them pertains to philosophic pursuits wherefore it is the glory of philosophy to be esteemed as the bulwark of faith and the strong defence of religion as clement of alexandria testifies the doctrine of the saviour is indeed perfect in itself and wanteth not since it is the power and wisdom of god and the assistance of the greek philosophy maketh not the truth more powerful but inasmuch as it weakens the contrary arguments of the sophists and repels the veiled attacks against the truth it has been fitly called the hedge and fence of the vine for as the enemies of the catholic name when about to attack religion are in the habit of borrowing their weapons from the arguments of philosophers so the defenders of sacred science draw many arguments from the store of philosophy which may serve to uphold revealed dogmas nor is the triumph of the christian faith a small one in using human reason to repel powerfully and speedily the attacks of its adversaries by the hostile arms which human reason itself supplied which species of religious strife st jerome writing to magnus notices as having been adopted by the apostle of the gentiles himself paul the leader of the christian army and the invincible orator battling for the cause of christ skilfully turns even a chance inscription into an argument for the faith for he had learned from the true david to wrest the sword from the hands of the enemy and to cut off the head of the boastful goliath with his own weapon moreover the church herself not only urges but even commands christian teachers to seek help from philosophy for the fifth council of lateran after it had decided that every assertion contrary to the truth of revealed faith is altogether false for the reason that it contradicts however slightly the truth advises teachers of philosophy to pay close attention to the exposition of fallacious arguments since as augustine testifies if reason is turned against the authority of sacred scripture no matter how specious it may seem it errs in the likeness of truth for true it cannot be but in order that philosophy may be found equal to the gathering of those precious fruits which we have indicated it behooves it above all things never to turn aside from that path which the fathers have entered upon from a venerable antiquity and which the vatican council solemnly and authoritatively approved as it is evident that very many truths of the supernatural order which are far beyond the reach of the keenest intellect must be accepted human reason conscious of its own infirmity dare not affect to itself two great powers nor deny those truths nor measure them by its own standard nor interpret them at will but receive them rather with a full and humble faith and esteem it the highest honour to be allowed to wait upon heavenly doctrines like a handmaid and attendant and by god's goodness attain to them in any way whatsoever but in the case of such doctrines as the human intelligence may perceive it is equally just that philosophy should make use of its own method principles and arguments not indeed in such fashion as to seem rashly to withdraw from the divine authority but since it is established that those things which become known by revelation have the force of certain truth and that those things which war against faith war equally against right reason the catholic philosopher will know that he violates at once faith and the laws of reason if he accepts any conclusion which he understands to be opposed to revealed doctrine we know that there are some who in their overestimate of the human faculties maintain that as soon as man's intellect becomes subject to divine authority it falls from its native dignity and hampered by the yoke of the species of slavery is much retarded and hindered in its progress towards the supreme truth and excellence such an idea is most false and deceptive and its sole tendency is to induce foolish and ungrateful men willfully to repudiate the most sublime truths and reject the divine gift of faith from which the fountains of all good things flow out upon civil society for the human mind being confined within certain limits and those narrow enough is exposed to many errors and is ignorant of many things whereas the christian faith reposing on the authority of god is the unfailing mistress of truth whom whoso followeth he will be neither enmeshed in the snares of air nor tossed hither and thither on the waves of fluctuating opinion those therefore who to the study of philosophy unite obedience to the christian faith are philosophers indeed 
for the splendor of the divine truths received into the mind helps the understanding and not only detracts in no wise from its dignity but adds greatly to its nobility keenness and stability for surely that is a worthy and most useful exercise of reason when men give their minds to disproving those things which are repugnant to faith and proving the things which conform to faith in the first case they cut the ground from under the feet of error and expose the viciousness of the arguments on which error rests while in the second case they make themselves masters of weighty reasons for the sound demonstration of truth and the satisfactory instruction of any reasonable person whosoever denies that such study and practice tend to add to the resources and expand the faculties of the mind must necessarily and absurdly hold that the mind gains nothing from discriminating between the true and the false justly therefore does the vatican council commemorate in these words the great benefits which faith has conferred upon reason faith frees and saves reason from error and endows it with manifold knowledge a wise man therefore would not accuse faith and look upon it as opposed to reason and natural truths but would rather offer heartfelt thanks to god and sincerely rejoice that in the density of ignorance and in the flood tide of air holy faith like a friendly star shines down upon his path and points out to him the fair gate of truth beyond all danger of wandering if venerable brethren you open the history of philosophy you will find all we have just said proved by experience the philosophers of old who lacked the gift of faith yet were esteemed so wise fell into many appalling errors you know how often among some truths they taught false and incongruous things what vague and doubtful opinions they held concerning the nature of the divinity the first origin of things the government of the world the divine knowledge of the future the cause and principle of evil the ultimate end of man the eternal beatitude concerning virtue and vice and other matters a true and certain knowledge of which is most necessary to the human race while on the other hand the early fathers and doctors of the church who well understood that according to the divine plan the restorer of human science is christ who is the power and the wisdom of god and in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge took up and investigated the books of the ancient philosophers and compared their teachings with the doctrines of revelation and carefully sifting them they cherished what was true and wise in them and amended or rejected all else for as the all-seeing god against the cruelty of tyrants raised up mighty martyrs to the defence of the church men prodigal of their great lives in like manner to false philosophers and heretics he opposed men of great wisdom to defend even by the aid of human reason the treasure of revealed truths thus from the first ages of the church the catholic doctrine has encountered a multitude of most bitter adversaries who deriding the christian dogmas and institutions maintained that there were many gods that the material world never had a beginning or cause and that the course of events was one of blind and fatal necessity not regulated by the will of divine providence but the learned men whom we call apologists speedily encountered these teachers of foolish doctrine and under the guidance of faith found arguments in human wisdom also to prove that one god who stands preeminent in every kind of perfection is to be worshipped that all things were created from nothing by his omnipotent power that by his wisdom they flourish and serve each their own special purposes among these st justin martyr claims a chief place after having tried the most celebrated academics of the greeks he saw clearly as he himself confesses that he could only draw truths in their fullness from the doctrines of revelation these he embraced with all the ardor of his soul purged of calumny courageously and fully defended before the roman emperors and reconciled with them not a few of the sayings of the greek philosophers quadratus also and aristides hermias and athenagoras stood nobly forth in that time nor did Irenaeus, the invincible martyr and bishop of lyons win less glory in the same cause when forcibly refuting the perverse opinions of the orientals the work of the gnostics 
scattered broadcast over the territories of the Roman Empire, he explained, according to Jerome, the origin of each heresy, and in what philosophic source it took its rise. But who knows not the disputations of Clement of Alexandria, which the same Jerome thus honorably commemorates? What is there in them that is not learned, and what that is not of the very heart of philosophy? He himself, indeed, with marvelous versatility, treated of many things of the greatest utility for preparing a history of philosophy, for the exercise of the dialectic art, and for showing the agreement between reason and faith. After him came Origen, who graced the chair of the school of Alexandria, and was most learned in the teachings of the Greeks and Orientals. He published many volumes, involving great labor, which were wonderfully adapted to explain the divine writings and illustrate the sacred dogmas, which, though as they now stand, not altogether free from error, contain nevertheless a wealth of knowledge tending to the growth and advance of natural truths. Tertullian opposes heretics with the authority of the sacred writings. With the philosophers he changes his fence, and disputes philosophically, but so learnedly and accurately did he confute them, that he made bold to say, Neither in science nor in schooling are we equals, as you imagine. Arnobius also, in his works against the pagans, and Lactantius in the divine institutions, especially, with equal eloquence and strength, strenuously strived to move men to accept the dogmas and precepts of Catholic wisdom, not by philosophic juggling, after the fashion of academicians, but vanquishing them partly by their own arms, and partly by arguments drawn from the mutual contentions of the philosophers. But the writings on the human soul, the divine attributes, and other questions of mighty moment, which the great Athanasius and Chrysostom, the prince of orators, have left behind them are, by common consent, so supremely excellent, that it seems scarcely anything could be added to their subtlety and fullness and, not to cover too wide a range, we add to the number of the great men of whom mention has been made the names of Basil the Great and of the two Gregories, who, on going forth from Athens, that home of all learning, thoroughly equipped with all the harness of philosophy, turned the wealth of knowledge which each had gathered up in a course of zealous study to the work of refuting heretics and preparing Christians. But Augustine would seem to have wrested the palm from all, of a most powerful genius and thoroughly saturated with sacred and profane learning with the loftiest faith and with equal knowledge he combated most vigorously all the errors of his age what height of philosophy did he not reach what region of it did he not diligently explore either in expounding the loftiest mysteries of the faith to the faithful or defending them against the fell onslaught of adversaries or again when in demolishing the fables of the academicians or the manichaeans he laid the safe foundations and sure structure of human science, or followed up the reason, origin, and causes of the evils that afflict man. How subtly he reasoned on the angels, the soul, the human mind, the will, and free choice, on religion and the life of the blessed, on time and eternity, and even on the very nature of changeable bodies. Afterwards, in the East John Damascene, treading in the footsteps of Basil and of Gregory Nazianzen, and in the West, Boetius and Anselm, following the doctrines of Augustine, added largely to the patrimony of philosophy. Later on the doctors of the Middle Ages, who are called scholastics, addressed themselves to a great work, that of diligently collecting and sifting and storing up, as it were, in one place, for the use and convenience of posterity, the rich and fertile harvests of Christian learning, scattered abroad in the voluminous works of the Holy Fathers. And with regard, venerable brethren, to the origin, drift, and excellence of the scholastic learning, it may be well here to speak more fully in the words of one of the wisest of our predecessors, Sixtus V. By the divine favor of him, who alone gives the spirit of science and wisdom and understanding, and who through all ages, as there may be need, enriches his church with new blessings and strengthens it with new safeguards, there was founded by our fathers, men of eminent wisdom, the scholastic theology, which two glorious doctors in particular, the angelic St. Thomas and the seraphic St. Bonaventure, illustrious teachers of this faculty, with surpassing genius, by unwearied diligence, and at the cost of long labors and vigils, set in order and beautified, 
and when skillfully arranged and clearly explained in a variety of ways handed down to posterity and indeed the knowledge and use of the solitary of science which flows from the fertilizing founts of the sacred writings the sovereign pontiffs the holy fathers and the councils must always be of the greatest assistance to the church whether with the view of really and soundly understanding and interpreting the scriptures or more safely and to better purpose reading and explaining the fathers or for exposing and refuting the various errors and heresies and in these late days when those dangerous times described by the apostle are already upon us when the blasphemers the proud and the seducers go from bad to worse erring themselves and causing others to err there is surely a very great need of confirming the dogmas of catholic faith and confuting heresies although these words seem to bear reference solely to scholastic theology nevertheless they may plainly be accepted as equally true of philosophy and its praises for the noble endowments which make the scholastic theology so formidable to the enemies of truth to wit as the same pontiff adds that ready and close coherence of cause and effect that order and array as of a disciplined army in battle those clear definitions and distinctions that strength of argument and those keen discussions by which light is distinguished from darkness the true from the false expose and strip naked as it were the falsehoods of heretics wrapped around by a cloud of subterfuges and fallacies those noble and admirable endowments we say are only to be found in a right use of that philosophy which the scholastic teachers have been accustomed carefully and prudently to make use of even in theological disputations moreover since it is the proper and special office of the scholastic theologians to bind together by the fastest chain human and divine science surely the theology in which they excelled would not have gained such honour and commendation among men if they had made use of a lame and imperfect or vain philosophy among the scholastic doctors the chief and master of all towers thomas aquinas who as cajetan observes because he most venerated the ancient doctors of the church in a certain way seems to have inherited the intellect of all the doctrines of those illustrious men like the scattered members of a body thomas collected together and cemented distributed in wonderful order and so increased with important additions that he is rightly and deservedly esteemed the special bulwark and glory of the catholic faith with his spirit at once humble and swift his memory ready and tenacious his life spotless throughout a lover of truth for its own sake richly endowed with human and divine science like the sun he heated the world with the ardour of his virtues and filled it with the splendour of his teaching philosophy has no part which he did not touch finely at once and thoroughly on the laws of reasoning on god the incorporeal substances on man and other sensible things on human actions and their principles he reasoned in such a manner that in him there was wanting neither a full array of questions nor an apt disposal of the various parts nor the best method of proceeding nor soundness of principles or strength of argument nor clearness and elegance of style nor facility for explaining what is abstruse moreover the angelic doctor pushed his philosophic conclusions into the reasons and principles of the things which are most comprehensive and contain in their bosom so to say the seeds of almost infinite truths to be unfounded in good time by later masters and with a goodly yield and as he also used this philosophic method in the refutation of error he won this title to distinction for himself that single-handed he victoriously combated the errors of former times and supplied invincible arms to put those to rout which might in after times spring up again clearly distinguishing as is fitting reason from faith while happily associating the one with the other he both preserved the rights and had regard for the dignity of each so much so indeed that reason borne on the wings of thomas to its human height can scarcely rise higher while faith could scarcely expect more or stronger aids from reason than those which she has already obtained through thomas for these reasons learned men in former ages especially of the highest repute in theology and philosophy after mastering with infinite pains the immortal works of thomas gave themselves up not so much to be instructed in his angelic wisdom as to be nourished from it 
It is known that nearly all the founders and framers of laws of the religious orders commanded their associates to study and religiously adhere to the teachings of St. Thomas, fearful lest any of them should swerve even in the slightest degree from the footsteps of so great a man. To say nothing of the family of St. Dominic, which rightly claims this great teacher for its own glory, the statutes of the Benedictines, the Carmelites, the Augustinians, the Society of Jesus, and many others, all testify that they are bound by this law. And hear how pleasantly one's thoughts fly back to those celebrated schools and academies which flourished of old in Europe, to Paris, Salamanca, Alcala, to Douai, Toulouse, and Louvain, to Padua and Bologna, to Naples and Coimbra, and to many another. All know how the fame of these seats of learning grew with their years, and that their judgment, often asked in matters of grave moment, held great weight everywhere. And we know how, in these great homes of human wisdom, as in his own kingdom, Thomas reigned supreme, and that the minds of all, of teachers as well as of taught, rested in wonderful harmony under the shield and authority of the angelic doctor. But, furthermore, our predecessors in the Roman pontificate have celebrated the wisdom of Thomas Aquinas by exceptional tributes of praise and the most ample testimonials. Clement the Sixth, Nicholas V, Benedict the Thirteenth, and others bear witness that the universal church borrows luster from his admirable teaching, while St. Pius V confesses that heresies, confounded and convicted by the same teaching, were dissipated, and the whole world daily freed from fatal errors. Others affirm with Clement XII that most fruitful blessings have spread abroad from his writings over the whole church, and that he is worthy of the honor which is bestowed on the greatest doctors of the church, on Gregory and Ambrose, Augustine and Jerome. While others have not hesitated to propose St. Thomas for the exemplar and master of the academies and great lyceums, whom they may follow with unfaltering feet. On which point the words of Blessed Urban V to the Academy of Toulouse are worthy of recall. It is our will, which you hereby enjoin upon you, that ye follow the teaching of Blessed Thomas as a true and Catholic doctrine, and that ye labor with all your force to profit by the same. Innocent the Twelfth followed the example of Urban in the case of the University of Louvain, and Benedict the Fourteenth with the Dionysian College of Granada while to these judgments of great pontiffs on thomas aquinas comes the crowning testimony of innocent the sixth his teaching above that of others the canons alone excepted enjoys such an elegance of phraseology a method of statement a truth of proposition that those who hold to it are never found swerving from the path of truth and he who dare assail it will always be suspected of error the ecumenical councils also where blossoms the flower of all earthly wisdom, have always been careful to hold Thomas Aquinas in singular honor. In the Council of Lyons, Vienna, Florence, and the Vatican, one might also say that Thomas took part and presided over the deliberations and decrees of the fathers, contending against the errors of the Greeks, of heretics and rationals, with invincible force and with the happiest results. But the chief and special glory of Thomas, one which he has shared with none of the Catholic doctors, is that the fathers of Trent made it part of the order of the conclave to lay upon the altar, together with the code of sacred scripture and the decrees of the supreme pontiffs, the summa of Thomas Aquinas, whence to seek counsel, reason, and inspiration. A last triumph was reserved for this incomparable man, namely to compel the homage, praise, and admiration of even the very enemies of the Catholic name. For it has come to light that there were not lacking among the leaders of heretical sects some who openly declared that, if the teachings of Thomas Aquinas were only taken away, they could easily battle with all Catholic teachers, gain the victory, and abolish the Church. A vain hope indeed, but no vain testimony. Therefore, venerable brethren, as often as we contemplate the good, the force, and the singular advantages to be derived from this system of philosophy, which our fathers so dearly loved, we think it hazardous that its special honor should not always and everywhere remain, especially when it is established that daily experience and the judgment of the greatest men, and, to crown all, the voice of the Church, have favored the scholastic philosophy. Moreover, to the old teaching a novel system of philosophy has succeeded here and there, in which we fail to perceive those desirable and wholesome fruits which the Church and civil society itself would prefer. 
for it pleased the struggling innovators of the sixteenth century to philosophize without any respect for faith the power of inventing in accordance with his own pleasure and bent being asked and given in turn by each one hence it was natural that systems of philosophy multiplied beyond measure and conclusions differing and clashing one with another arose about those matters even which are the most important in human knowledge from a mass of conclusions men often come to wavering and doubt and who knows not how easily the mind slips from doubt to error but as men are apt to follow the lead given them this new pursuit seems to have caught the souls of certain catholic philosophers who throwing aside the patrimony of ancient wisdom choose rather to build up a new edifice than to strengthen and complete the old by aid of the new ill-advisedly in sooth and not without detriment to the sciences for a multiform system of this kind which depends on the authority and choice of any professor has a foundation open to change and consequently gives us a philosophy not firm and stable and robust like that of old but tottering and feeble and if perchance it sometimes finds itself scarcely equal to sustain the shock of its foes it should recognize that the cause and the blame lie in itself in saying this we have no intention of discountenancing the learned and able men who bring their industry and erudition and what is more the wealth of new discoveries to the service of philosophy for of course we understand that this tends to the development of learning but one should be very careful lest all or his chief labor be exhausted in these pursuits and in mere erudition and the same thing is true of sacred theology which indeed may be assisted and illustrated by all kinds of erudition though it is absolutely necessary to approach it in the grave manner of the scholastics in order that the forces of revelation and reason being united in it it may continue to be the invincible bulwark of the faith with wise forethought therefore not a few of the advocates of philosophic studies when turning their minds recently to the practical reform of philosophy aimed and aim at restoring the renowned teaching of thomas aquinas and winning it back to its ancient beauty we have learned with great joy that many members of your order venerable brethren have taken this plan to heart and while we earnestly commend their efforts we exhort them to hold fast to their purpose and remind each and all of you that our first and most cherished idea is that you should all furnish a generous and copious supply to studious youth of those crystal rills of wisdom flowing in a never-ending and fertilizing stream from the fountainhead of the angelic doctor many are the reasons why we are so desirous of this in the first place then since in the tempest that is on us the christian faith is being constantly assailed by the machinations and craft of a certain false wisdom all youths but especially those who are the growing hope of the church should be nourished on the strong and robust food of doctrine that so mighty in strength and armed at all points they may become habituated to advance the cause of religion with force and judgment being ready always according to the apostolic council to satisfy every one that asketh you a reason of that hope which is in you and that they may be able to exhort in sound doctrine and to convince the gainsayers many of those who with minds alienated from the faith hate catholic institutions claim reason as their sole mistress and guide now we think that apart from the supernatural help of god nothing is better calculated to heal those minds and to bring them into favor with the catholic faith than the solid doctrine of the fathers and the scholastics who so clearly and forcibly demonstrate the firm foundations of the faith its divine origin its certain truth the arguments that sustain it the benefits it has conferred on the human race and its perfect accord with reason in a manner to satisfy completely minds open to persuasion however unwilling and repugnant domestic and civil society even which as all see is exposed to great danger from this plague of perverse opinions would certainly enjoy a far more peaceful and secure existence if a more wholesome doctrine were taught in the academies and schools one more in conformity with the teaching of the church such as is contained in the works of thomas aquinas for the teachings of thomas on the true meaning of liberty which at this time is running into license on the divine origin of all authority on laws and their force on the paternal and just rule of princes on obedience to the higher powers on mutual charity one towards another 
on all of these and kindred subjects have very great and invincible force to overturn those principles of the new order which are well known to be dangerous to the peaceful order of things and to public safety in short all studies ought to find hope of advancement and promise of assistance in this restoration of the philosophic discipline which we have proposed the arts were wont to draw from philosophy as from a wise mistress sound judgment and right method and from it also their spirit as from the common fount of life when philosophy stood stainless in honour and wise in judgment then as facts and constant experience showed the liberal arts flourished as never before or since but neglected and almost blotted out they lay prone since philosophy began to lean to error and join hands with folly nor will the physical sciences which are now in such great repute and by the renown of so many inventions draw such universal admiration to themselves suffer detriment but find very great assistance in the re-establishment of the ancient philosophy for the investigation of facts and the contemplation of nature is not alone sufficient for their profitable exercise and advance but when facts have been established it is necessary to rise and apply ourselves to the study of the nature of corporeal things to inquire into the laws which govern them and the principles whence their order and varied unity and mutual attraction and diversity arise to such investigations it is wonderful what force and light and aid the scholastic philosophy if judiciously taught would bring and here it is well to note that our philosophy can only by the grossest injustice be accused of being opposed to the advance and development of natural science for when the scholastics following the opinion of the holy fathers always held in anthropology that the human intelligence is only led to the knowledge of things without body and matter by things sensible they well understood that nothing was of greater use to the philosopher than diligently to search into the mysteries of nature and to be earnest and constant in the study of physical things and this they confirmed by their own example for st thomas blessed albertus magnus and other leaders of the scholastics were never so wholly wrapped in the study of philosophy as not to give large attention to the knowledge of natural things and indeed the number of their sayings and writings on these subjects which recent professors approve of and admit to harmonize with truth is by no means small moreover in this very age many illustrious professors of the physical sciences openly testify that between certain and accepted conclusions of modern physics and the philosophic principles of the schools there is no conflict worthy of the name while therefore we hold that every word of wisdom every useful thing by whomsoever discovered or planned ought to be received with a willing and grateful mind we exhort you venerable brethren in all earnestness to restore the golden wisdom of st thomas and to spread it far and wide for the defence and beauty of the catholic faith for the good of society and for the advantage of all the sciences the wisdom of st thomas we say for if anything is taken up with too great subtlety by the scholastic doctors or too carelessly stated if there be anything that ill agrees with the discoveries of a later age or in a word improbable in whatever way it does not enter our mind to propose that for imitation to our age let carefully selected teachers endeavour to implant the doctrine of thomas aquinas in the minds of students and set forth clearly his solidity and excellence over others let the academies already founded or to be founded by you illustrate and defend this doctrine and use it for the refutation of prevailing ears but lest the false for the true or the corrupt for the pure be drunken be ye watchful that the doctrine of thomas be drawn from his own fountains or at least from those rivulets which derive from the very fount have thus far flowed according to the established agreement of learned men pure and clear be careful to guard the minds of youth from those which are said to flow thence but in reality are gathered from strange and unwholesome streams but well do we know that vain will be our efforts unless venerable brethren he helps our common cause who in the words of divine scripture is called the god of all knowledge by which we are also admonished that every best gift and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the father of lights and again if any of you want wisdom let him ask of god who giveth to all men abundantly and upbraideth not and it shall be given him therefore in this also let us follow the example of the angelic doctor who never gave himself to reading or writing without first begging the blessing of god 
who modestly confessed that whatever he knew he had acquired not so much by his own study and labor as by the divine gift and therefore let us all in humble and united prayer beseech god to send forth the spirit of knowledge and of understanding to the children of the church and open their senses for the understanding of wisdom and that we may receive fuller fruits of the divine goodness offer up to god the most efficacious patronage of the blessed virgin mary who is called the seed of wisdom having at the same time as advocates saint joseph the most chaste spouse of the virgin and peter and paul the chiefs of the apostles whose truth renewed the earth which had fallen under the impure blight of air filling with the light of heavenly wisdom in fine relying on the divine assistance and confiding in your pastoral zeal we bestow on all of you venerable brethren on all the clergy and the flocks committed to your charge the apostolic benediction as a pledge of heavenly gifts and a token of our special esteem end of section three Section four of the Great Encyclical Letters of Leo the Thirteenth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Christian Marriage, Encyclical Letter Arcanum Divinae, February tenth, eighteen eighty. The hidden design of the divine wisdom which Jesus Christ, the Saviour of men, came to carry out on earth, had this end in view, that by himself and in himself he should divinely renew the world which was sinking as it were with lengths of years into decline the apostle paul summed this up in words of dignity and majesty when he wrote to the ephesians thus that he might make known unto us the mystery of his will to re-establish all things in christ that are in heaven and on earth in truth christ our lord setting himself to fulfill the commandment which his father had given him straightway imparted a new form and fresh beauty to all things taking away the effects of their time-worn age for he healed the wounds which the sin of our first father had inflicted on the human race he brought all men by nature children of wrath into favour with god he led to the light of truth men wearied out by long-standing errors he renewed to every virtue those who were weakened by lawlessness of every kind and giving them again an inheritance of never-ending bliss he added a sure hope that their mortal and perishable bodies should one day be partakers of immortality and of the glory of heaven in order that these unparalleled benefits might last as long as men should be found on earth he trusted to his church the continuance of his work and looking to future times he commanded her to set in order whatever might have become deranged in human society and to restore whatever might have fallen into ruin although the divine renewal we have spoken of chiefly and directly affected men as constituted in the supernatural order of grace nevertheless some of its precious and salutary fruits were also bestowed abundantly in the order of nature hence not only individual men but also the whole mass of the human race have in every respect received no small degree of worthiness for so soon as christian order was once established in the world it became happily possible for all men one by one to learn what god's fatherly providence is and to dwell in it habitually thereby fostering that hope of heavenly help which never confoundeth from all this outflowed fortitude self-control constancy and the evenness of a peaceful mind together with many high virtues and noble deeds wondrous indeed was the extent of dignity steadfastness and goodness which thus accrued to the state as well as to the family the authority of rulers became more just and revered the obedience of the people more ready and unforced the union of citizens closer the rights of dominion more secure in very truth the christian religion thought of and provided for all things which are held to be advantageous in a state so much so indeed that according to st augustine one cannot see how it could have offered greater help in the matter of living well and happily had it been instituted for the single object of procuring or increasing those things which contribute to the conveniences or advantages of this mortal life still the purpose we have set before us is not to recount in detail benefits of this kind 
our wish is rather to speak about that family union of which marriage is the beginning and the foundation the true origin of marriage venerable brothers is well known to all though the revilers of the christian faith refuse to acknowledge the never interrupted doctrine of the church on this subject and have long striven to destroy the testimony of all nations and of all times they have nevertheless failed not only to quench the powerful light of truth but even to lessen it we record what is to all known and cannot be doubted by any that god on the sixth day of creation having made man from the slime of the earth and having breathed into his face the breath of life gave him a companion whom he miraculously took from the side of adam when he was locked in sleep god thus in his most far-reaching foresight decreed that this husband and wife should be the natural beginning of the human race from whom it might be propagated and preserved by an unfailing fruitfulness throughout all futurity of time and this union of man and woman that it might answer more fittingly to the infinite wise counsels of god even from the beginning manifested chiefly two most excellent properties deeply sealed as it were and signed upon it namely unity and perpetuity from the gospel we see clearly that this doctrine was declared and openly confirmed by the divine authority of jesus christ he bore witness to the jews and to his apostles that marriage from its institution should exist between two only that is between one man and one woman that of two they are made so to say one flesh and that the marriage bond is by the will of god so closely and strongly made fast that no man may dissolve it or render it asunder for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they two shall be in one flesh therefore now they are not two but one flesh what therefore god hath joined together that no man put asunder this form of marriage however so excellent and so preeminent began to be corrupted by degrees and to disappear among the heathen and became even among the jewish race clouded in a measure and obscured for in their midst a common custom was gradually introduced by which it was accounted as lawful for a man to have more than one wife and eventually when by reason of the hardness of their heart moses indulgently permitted them to put away their wives the way was open to divorce but the corruption and change which fell on marriage among the gentiles seem almost incredible inasmuch as it was exposed in every land to floods of air and of the most shameful lusts all nations seem more or less to have forgotten the true notion and origin of marriage and thus everywhere laws were enacted with reference to marriage prompted to all appearance by state reasons but not such as nature required solemn rites invented at will of the lawgivers brought about that women should as might be bear either the honourable name of wife or the disgraceful name of concubine and things came to such a pitch that permission to marry or the refusal of the permission depended on the will of the heads of the state whose laws were greatly against equity or even to the highest degree unjust moreover plurality of wives and husbands the abounding source of divorce caused the nuptial bond to be relaxed exceedingly hence too sprang up the greatest confusion as to the mutual rights and duties of husbands and wives inasmuch as a man assumed right of dominion over his wife ordering her to go about her business often without any just cause while he was himself at liberty as st jerome says to run headlong with impunity into lust unbridled and unrestrained in houses of ill fame and amongst his female slaves as if the dignity of the persons sinned with and not the will of the sinner made the guilt when the licentiousness of a husband thus showed itself nothing could be more piteous than the wife sunk so low as to be all but reckoned as a means for the gratification of passion or the production of offspring without any feeling of shame marriageable girls were bought and sold just like so much merchandise and power was sometimes given to the father and to the husband to inflict capital punishment on the wife of necessity the offspring of such marriages as these were either reckoned among the stock and trade of the commonwealth or held to be the property of the father of the family and the law permitted him to make and unmake the marriages of his children at his mere will and even to exercise against them the monstrous power of life and death 
so manifold being the vices and so great the ignominies with which marriage was defiled an alleviation and a remedy were at length bestowed from on high jesus christ who restored our human dignity and who perfected the mosaic law applied early in his ministry no little solicitude to the question of marriage he ennobled the marriage in cana of galilee by his presence and made it memorable by the first of the miracles which he wrought and for this reason even from that day forth it seemed as if the beginning of new holiness had been conferred on human marriages later on he brought back matrimony to the nobility of its primeval origin by condemning the customs of the jews in their abuse of the plurality of wives and of the power of giving bills of divorce and still more by commanding most strictly that no one should dare to dissolve that union which god himself had sanctioned by a bond perpetual hence having set aside the difficulties which were addressed from the law of moses he in character of supreme lawgiver decreed as follows concerning husbands and wives i say to you that whosoever shall put away his wife except it be for fornication and shall marry another committeth adultery and he that shall marry her that is put away committeth adultery but what was decreed and constituted in respect to marriage by the authority of god has been more fully and more clearly handed down to us by tradition and the written word through the apostles those heralds of the laws of god to the apostles indeed as our masters are to be referred the doctrines which our holy fathers the councils and the tradition of the universal church have always taught namely that christ our lord raised marriage to the dignity of a sacrament that to husband and wife guarded and strengthened by the heavenly grace which his merits gained for them he gave power to attain holiness in the married state and that in a wondrous way making marriage an example of the mystical union between himself and his church he not only perfected that love which is according to nature but also made the natural union of one man and one woman far more perfect through the bond of heavenly love paul says to the ephesians husbands love your wives as christ also loved the church and delivered himself up for it that he might sanctify it so also ought men to love their wives as their own bodies for no man ever hated his own flesh but nourished and cherished it as also christ doth the church because we are members of his body of his flesh and of his bones for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they shall be two in one flesh this is a great sacrament but i speak in christ and in the church in like manner from the teaching of the apostles we learn that the unity of marriage and its perpetual indissolubility the indispensable conditions of its very origin must according to the command of christ be holy and inviolable without exception paul says again to them that are married not i but the lord commandeth that the wife depart not from her husband and if she depart that she remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband and again a woman is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth but if her husband die she is at liberty it is for these reasons that marriage is a great sacrament honourable in all holy pure and to be reverenced as a type and symbol of most high mysteries furthermore the christian perfection and completeness of marriage are not comprised in those points only which have been mentioned for first there has been vouchsafed to the marriage union a higher and nobler purpose than was ever previously given to it by the command of christ it not only looks to the propagation of the human race but to the bringing forth of children for the church fellow citizens with the saints and the domestics of god so that a people might be born and brought up for the worship and religion of the true god and our saviour jesus christ secondly the mutual duties of husband and wife have been defined and their several rights accurately established they are bound namely to have such feelings for one another as to cherish always very great mutual love to be ever faithful to their marriage vow and to give one another an unfailing and unselfish help the husband is the chief of the family and the head of the wife the woman because she is flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone must be subject to her husband and obey him not indeed as a servant 
but as a companion, so that her obedience shall be wanting in neither honor nor dignity. Since the husband represents Christ, and since the wife represents the church, let there always be, both in him who commands and in her who obeys, a heaven-born love guiding both in their respective duties. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, so also let wives be to their husbands in all things. As regards children, they ought to submit to the parents and obey them and give them honor for conscience's sake. While on the other hand, parents are bound to give all care and watchful thought to the education of their offspring and their virtuous bringing up. Fathers, bring them up, that is, your children, in the discipline and correction of the Lord. From this we see clearly that the duties of husbands and wives are neither few nor light. Although to marry people who are good, these burdens become not only bearable but agreeable, owing to the strength which they gain through the sacrament. Christ, therefore, having renewed marriage to such and so great excellence, commended and entrusted all the discipline bearing upon these matters to his church. The church, always and everywhere, has so used her power with reference to the marriages of Christians, that men have seen clearly how it belongs to her as of native right, not being made hers by any human grant, but given divinely to her by the will of her founder. Her constant and watchful care in guarding marriage, by the preservation of its sanctity, is so well understood as to not need proof, that the judgment of the Council of Jerusalem reprobated licentiousness and free love we all know as also that the incestuous corinthian was condemned by the authority of blessed paul again in the very beginning of the christian church were repulsed and defeated with a like unremitting determination the efforts of many who aimed at the destruction of christian marriage such as the gnostics manichaeans and montanists and in our own time mormons st simonians Phalansterians and communists. In like manner, moreover, a law of marriage just to all and the same for all was enacted by the abolition of the old distinction between slave and freeborn men and women. And thus the rights of husbands and wives were made equal, for, as St. Jerome says, with us that which is unlawful for women is unlawful for men also, and the same restraint is imposed on equal conditions. The self-same rights also were firmly established for reciprocal affection and for the interchange of duties. The dignity of the woman was asserted and assured, and it was forbidden to the man to inflict capital punishment for adultery, or lustfully and shamefully to violate his plighted faith. It is also a great blessing that the Church has limited, so far as is needful, the power of fathers of families, so that sons and daughters, wishing to marry, are not in any way deprived of their rightful freedom that, for the purpose of spreading more widely the supernatural love of husbands and wives, she has decreed marriages within certain degrees of consanguinity or affinity to be null and void, that she has taken the greatest pains to safeguard marriage, as much as is possible, from error and violence and deceit, that she has always wished to preserve the holy chasteness of the marriage bed, personal rights, the honor of husband and wife, and the security of religion lastly with such power and with such foresight of legislation has the church guarded its divine institution that no one who thinks rightfully of these matters can fail to see how with regard to marriage she is the best guardian and defender of the human race and how with all her wisdom has come forth victorious from the lapse of years from the assaults of men and from the countless changes of public events Yet, owing to the efforts of the arch-enemy of mankind, there are persons who, thanklessly casting away so many other blessings of redemption, despise also, or utterly ignore the restoration of marriage to its original perfection. It is the reproach of some of the ancients, that they showed themselves the enemies of marriage in many ways. But in our own age, much more pernicious is the sin of those who would fain pervert utterly the nature of marriage, perfect though it is, and complete in all its details and parts. The chief reason why they act in this way is because very many, imbued with the maxims of a false philosophy and corrupted in morals, judge nothing so unbearable as submission and obedience, 
and strive with all their might to bring about that not only individual men but families also nay indeed human society itself may in haughty pride despise the sovereignty of god now since the family and human society at large spring from marriage these men will on no account allow matrimony to be the subject of the jurisdiction of the church nay they endeavor to deprive it of all holiness and so bring it within the contracted sphere of those rights which having been instituted by man are ruled and administered by the civil jurisprudence of the community wherefore it necessarily follows that they attribute all power over marriage to civil rulers and allow none whatever to the church and when the church exercises any such power they think that she acts either by favor of the civil authority or to its injury now is the time they say for the heads of the state to vindicate their rights unflinchingly and to do their best to settle all that relates to marriage according as to them seems good hence are owing civil marriages commonly so called hence laws are framed which impose impediments to marriage hence arise judicial sentences affecting the marriage contract as to whether or not it had been rightfully made lastly all power prescribing and passing judgment in this class of cases is as we see of set purpose denied to the catholic church so that no regard is paid either to her divine power or to her prudent laws yet under these for so many centuries have the nations lived on whom the light of civilization shone bright with the wisdom of christ jesus nevertheless all those who reject what is supernatural as well as all who profess that they worship above all things the divinity of the state and strive to disturb whole communities with such wicked doctrines cannot escape the charge of delusion marriage has god for its author and was from the very beginning a kind of foreshadowing of the incarnation of his son and therefore there abides in it a something holy and religious not extraneous but innate not derived from men but implanted by nature innocent the third therefore and honorius the third our predecessors affirm not falsely nor rashly that a certain sacredness of marriage rights existed ever amongst the faithful and unbelievers we call to witness the monuments of antiquity as also the manners and customs of these people who being the most civilized had the greatest knowledge of law and equity in the minds of all of them it was a fixed and foregone conclusion that when marriage was thought of it was thought of as conjoined with religion and holiness hence among those marriages were commonly celebrated with religious ceremonies under the authority of pontiffs and with the ministry of priests so mighty even in the souls ignorant of heavenly doctrine was the force of nature of the remembrance of their origin and of the conscience of the human race as then marriage is holy by its own power in its own nature and of itself it ought not to be regulated and administered by the will of civil rulers but by the divine authority of the church which alone in sacred matters professes the office of teaching next the dignity of the sacrament must be considered for through addition of the sacrament the marriages of christians have become far the noblest of all matrimonial unions but to decree and ordain concerning the sacrament is by the will of christ himself so much a part of the power and duty of the church that it is plainly observed to maintain that even the very smallest fraction of such power has been transferred to the civil ruler lastly should be borne in mind the great weight and crucial test of history by which it is plainly proved that the legislative and judicial authority of which we are speaking has been freely and constantly used by the church even when times when some foolishly supposed the head of the state either to have consented to it or connived at it it would for instance be incredible and altogether absurd to assume that christ our lord condemned the long-standing practice of polygamy and divorce by authority delegated to him by the procurator of the province or the principal ruler of the jews and it would be equally extravagant to think that when the apostle paul taught that divorce and incestuous marriages were not lawful it was because tiberius caligula and nero agreed with him or secretly commanded him so to teach 
no man in his senses could ever be persuaded that the church made so many laws about the holiness and indissolubility of marriage and the marriages of slaves with the freeborn by power received from roman emperors most hostile to the christian name whose strongest desire was to destroy by violence and murder the rising church of christ still less could any one believe this to be the case when the law of the church was sometimes so divergent from the civil law that ignatius the martyr justin athenagoras and tertullian publicly denounced as unjust the adulterous certain marriages which had been sanctioned by imperial law furthermore after all power had devolved upon the christian emperors the supreme pontiffs and bishops assembled in council persisted with the same independence and consciousness of their right in commanding or forbidding in regard to marriage whatever they judged to be profitable or expedient for the time being however much it might seem to be at variance with the laws of the state it is well known that with respect to the impediments arising from the marriage bond though vow disparity of worship blood relationship certain forms of crime and from previously plighted troth many decrees were issued by the rulers of the church in the councils of granada arles chalcedon the second of milevum and others which were often widely different from the decrees sanctioned by the laws of the empire furthermore so far were christian princes from arrogating any power in the matter of christian marriage that they on the contrary acknowledged and declared that it belonged exclusively in all its fullness to the church in fact honorius the younger theodosius and justinian also hesitated not to confess that the only power belonging to them in relation to marriage was that of acting as guardians and defenders of the holy canons if at any time they enacted anything by their edicts concerning impediments of marriage they voluntarily explained the reason affirming that they took it upon themselves so to act by leave and authority of the church whose judgment they were wont to appeal to and reverently to accept in all questions that concern legitimacy and divorce as also in all those points which in any way have a necessary connection with the marriage bond the council of trent therefore had the clearest right to define that it is in the church's power to establish diamond impediments of matrimony and that matrimonial causes pertain to ecclesiastical judges let no one then be deceived by the distinction which some court legists have so strongly insisted upon the distinction namely by virtue of which they sever the matrimonial contract from the sacrament with intent to hand over the contract to the power and will of the rulers of the state while reserving questions concerning the sacrament to the church a distinction or rather severance of this kind cannot be approved for certain it is that is christian marriage the contract is inseparable from the sacrament and that for this reason the contract cannot be true and legitimate without being a sacrament as well for christ our lord added to marriage the dignity of a sacrament but marriage is the contract itself whenever that contract is lawfully concluded marriage moreover is a sacrament because it is a holy sign which gives grace showing forth an image of the mystical nuptials of christ with the church but the form and image of these nuptials is shown precisely by the very bond of that most close union in which man and woman are bound together in one which bond is nothing else but the marriage itself hence it is clear that among christians every true marriage is in itself and by itself a sacrament and that nothing can be further from the truth than to say that the sacrament is a certain added ornament or outward endowment which can be separated and torn away from the contract at the caprice of man neither therefore by reasoning can it be shown nor by any testimony of history be proved that power over the marriages of christians has ever lawfully been handed over to the rulers of the state if in this matter the right of any one else has ever been violated no one can truly say that it has been violated by the church would that the teaching of those who reject what is supernatural besides being full of falsehood and injustice were not also the fertile source of much detriment and calamity but it is easy to see at a glance the greatness of the evil which unhallowed marriages have brought and ever will bring on the whole of human society 
From the beginning of the world, indeed, it was divinely ordained that things instituted by God and by nature should be proved by us to be the more profitable and salutary, the more they remain unchanged in their full integrity. For God, the maker of all things, well knowing what was good for the institution and preservation of each of his creatures, so ordered them by his will and mind that each might adequately attain the end for which it was made. If the rashness or the wickedness of human agency venture to change or disturb that order of things which has been constituted with fullest foresight, then the designs of infinite wisdom and usefulness begin either to be hurtful or cease to be profitable, partly because, through the change undergone, they have lost their power of benefiting, and partly because God chooses to inflict punishment on the pride and audacity of man. Now those who deny that marriage is holy, and who relegate it, stripped of all holiness, among the class of common things, uproot thereby the foundations of nature, not only resisting the designs of providence, but so far as they can, destroying the order that God has ordained. No one, therefore, should wonder if, from such insane and impious attempts, there spring up a crop of evils, pernicious in the highest degree, both to the salvation of souls and to the safety of the commonwealth. If, then, we consider the end of the divine institution of marriage, we shall see very clearly that God intended it to be a most fruitful source of individual benefit and of public welfare. Not only, in strict truth, was marriage instituted for the propagation of the human race, but also that the lives of husbands and wives might be made better and happier. This comes about in many ways, by their lightening each other's burdens through mutual help, by constant and faithful love, by having all their possessions in common, and by the heavenly grace which flows from the sacrament. Marriage also can do much for the good of families, for, so long as it is conformable to nature and in accordance with the counsels of God, it has power to strengthen union of heart in the parents, to secure the holy education of children, to attemper the authority of the father by the example of the divine authority, to render children obedient to their parents and servants obedient to their masters. From such marriages as these, the state might rightly expect a race of citizens animated by a good spirit and filled with reverence and love for God, recognizing it their duty to obey those who rule justly and lawfully, to love all and to injure no one. These many and glorious fruits were ever the product of marriage, so long as it retained those gifts of holiness, unity, and indissolubility from which proceeded all its fertile and saving power. Nor can any one doubt but that it would always have brought forth such fruits at all times and in all places, had it been under the power and guardianship of the Church, the trustworthy preserver and protector of these gifts. But now there is a spreading wish to supplant natural and divine law by human law, and hence has begun a gradual extinction of that most excellent ideal of marriage, which nature herself had impressed on the soul of man, and sealed, as it were, with her own seal. Nay, more, even in Christian marriages, this power, productive of so great good, has been weakened by the sinfulness of man. Of what advantage is it if a state can institute nuptials estranged from the Christian religion, which is the mother of all good, cherishing all sublime virtues, quickening and urging us to everything that is the glory of a lofty and generous soul? When the Christian religion is rejected and repudiated, Marriage sinks of necessity into the slavery of man's vicious nature and vile passions, and finds but little protection in the help of natural goodness. A very torrent of evil has flowed from this source, not only into private families, but also into states. For the solitary fear of God being removed, and there being no longer that refreshment and toil which is nowhere more abounding than in the Christian religion, it very often happens, as from facts is evident, that the mutual services and duties of marriage seem almost unbearable, and thus very many yearn for the loosening of the tie which they believe to be woven by human law and of their own will, whenever incompatibility of temper or quarrels, or the violation of the marriage vow, or mutual consent, or other reasons induce them to think that it would be well to be set free. 
then if they are hindered by law from carrying out this shameless desire they contend that the laws are iniquitous inhumane and at variance with the rights of free citizens adding that every effort should be made to repeal such enactments and to introduce a more human code sanctioning divorce now however much the legislators of these our days may wish to guard themselves against the impiety of men such as we have been speaking of they are unable to do so seeing that they profess to hold and defend the very same principles of jurisprudence and hence they have to go with the times and render divorce easily obtainable history itself shows this for to pass over other instances we find that at the close of the last century divorces were sanctioned by law in that upheaval or rather as it might be called conflagration in france when society was wholly degraded by the abandoning of god many at the present time would fain have those laws reenacted because they wish god and his church to be altogether exiled and excluded from the midst of human society madly thinking that in such laws a final remedy must be sought for that moral corruption which is advancing with rapid strides truly it is hardly possible to describe how great are the evils that flow from divorce matrimonial contracts are by it made variable mutual kindness is weakened deplorable inducements to unfaithfulness are supplied harm is done to the education and training of children occasion is afforded for the breaking up of homes the seeds of dissension are sown among families the dignity of womanhood is lessened and brought low and woman runs the risk of being deserted after having ministered to the pleasures of men since then nothing has such power to lay waste families and destroy the mainstay of kingdoms as the corruption of morals it is easily seen that divorces are in the highest degree hostile to the prosperity of families and states springing as they do from the depraved morals of the people and as experience shows us opening out a way to every kind of evil doing in public alike and in private life further still if the matter be duly pondered we shall clearly see these evils to be the more especially dangerous because divorce once being tolerated there will be no restraint powerful enough to keep it within the bounds marked out or pre-surmised great indeed is the force of example and even greater still the might of passion with such incitements it must needs follow that the eagerness for divorce daily spreading by devious ways will seize upon the minds of many like a virulent contagious disease or like a flood of water bursting through every barrier these are truths that doubtlessly are all clear in themselves but they will become clearer yet if we call to mind the teachings of experience so soon as the road to divorce began to be made smooth by law at once quarrels jealousies and judicial separations largely increased and such shamelessness of life followed that men who had been in favor of those divorces repented of what they had done and feared that if they did not carefully seek a remedy by repealing the law the state itself might come to ruin the romans of old are said to have shrunk with horror from the first examples of divorce but ere long all sense of decency was blunted in their soul the meagre restraint of passion died out and the marriage vow was so often broken that what some writers have affirmed would seem to be true namely women used to reckon years not by the change of consuls but of their husbands in like manner at the beginning protestants allowed legalized divorces in certain although but few cases and yet from the affinity of circumstances of like kind the number of divorces increased to such an extent in germany america and elsewhere that all wise thinkers deplored the boundless corruption of morals and judged the recklessness of the laws to be simply intolerable even in catholic states the like evil existed for whenever at any time divorce was introduced the abundance of misery that followed far exceeded all that the framers of the law could have foreseen in fact many lent their minds to contrive all kinds of fraud and device and by accusations of cruelty violence and adultery to feign grounds for the dissolution of the matrimonial bond of which they had grown weary and all this was so great havoc to morals that an amendment of the laws was deemed to be urgently needed can any one therefore doubt that laws in favour of divorce would have a result equally baneful and calamitous 
were they to be passed in these our days there exists not indeed in the projects and enactments of men any power to change the character and tendency which things have received from nature those men therefore show but little wisdom in the ideas they have formed of the well-being of the commonwealth who think that the inherent character of marriage can be perverted with impunity and who disregarding the sanctity of religion and of the sacrament seem to wish to degrade and dishonor marriage more basely than was done even by heathen laws indeed if they do not change their views not only private families but all public society will have unceasing cause to fear lest they should be miserably driven into that general confusion and overthrow of order which is even now the wicked aim of socialists and communists thus we see most clearly how foolish and senseless it is to expect any public good from divorce when on the contrary it tends to the certain destruction of society it must consequently be acknowledged that the church has deserved exceedingly well of all nations by her ever watchful care in guarding the sanctity and indissolvability of marriage again no small amount of gratitude is owing to her for having during the last hundred years openly denounced the wicked laws which have grievously offended on this particular subject as well as for her having branded with anathema the baneful heresy obtaining among protestants touching divorce and separation also for having in many ways condemned the habitual dissolution of marriage among the greeks for having declared invalid all marriages contracted upon the understanding that they may be at some future time dissolved and lastly for having from the earliest times repudiated the imperial laws which disastrously favoured divorce as often indeed as the supreme pontiffs have resisted the most powerful among rulers in their threatening demands that divorces carried out by them should be confirmed by the church so often must we account them to have been contending for the safety not only of religion but also of the human race for this reason all generations of men will admire the proofs of amending courage which are to be found in the decrees of nicholas i against lothair of urban the second and pascal the second against philip the first of france of celestine the third and innocent the third against alphonsus of Lyon and philip the second of france of clement the seventh and paul the third against henry the eighth and lastly of pius the seventh that holy and courageous pontiff against napoleon the first when at the height of his prosperity and in the fullness of his power this being so all rulers and administrators of the state who are desirous of following the dictates of reason and wisdom and anxious for the good of their people ought to make up their minds to keep the holy laws of marriage intact and to make use of the preferred aid of the church for securing the safety of morals and the happiness of families rather than suspect her of hostile intention and falsely and wickedly accuse her of violating the civil law they should do this the more readily because the catholic church though powerless in any way to abandon the duties of her office or the defence of her authority still very greatly inclines to kindness and indulgence whenever they are consistent with the safety of her rights and the sanctity of her duties wherefore she makes no decrees in relation to marriage without having regard to the state of the body politic and the condition of the general public and has besides more than once mitigated as far as possible the enactments of her own laws when there were just and weighty reasons moreover she is not unaware and never calls in doubt that the sacrament of marriage being instituted for the preservation and increase of the human race has a necessary relation to circumstances of life which though connected with marriage belong to the civil order and about which the state rightly makes strict inquiry and justly promulgates decrees yet no one doubts that jesus christ the founder of the church willed her sacred power to be distinct from the civil power and each power to be free and unshackled in its own sphere with this condition however a condition good for both and of advantage to all men that union and concord should be maintained between them and that on those questions which are though in different ways of common right and authority the power to which secular matters have been entrusted should happily and becomingly depend on the other power which has in its charge the interests of heaven in such arrangement and harmony is found not only the best line of action for each power but also the most opportune and efficacious method of helping men in all that pertains to their life here and to their hope of salvation hereafter 
for as we have shown in former encyclical letters the intellect of man is greatly ennobled by the christian faith and made better to shun and banish all error while faith borrows in turn no little help from the intellect and in like manner when the civil power is on friendly terms with the sacred authority of the church there accrues to both a great increase of usefulness the dignity of the one is exalted and so long as religion is its guide it will never rule unjustly while the other receives help of protection and defence for the public good of the faithful being moved therefore by these considerations as we have exhorted rulers at other times so still more earnestly we exhort them now to concord and friendly feeling and we are the first to stretch out our hand to them with fatherly benevolence and to offer to them the help of our supreme authority a help which is the more necessary at this time when in public opinion the authority of rulers is wounded and enfeebled now that the minds of so many are inflamed with a reckless spirit of liberty and men are wickedly endeavouring to get rid of every restraint of authority however legitimate it may be the public safety demands that both powers should unite their strength to avert the evils which are hanging not only over the church but also over civil society but while earnestly exhorting all to a friendly union of will and beseeching god the prince of peace to infuse a love of concord into all hearts we cannot venerable brothers refrain from urging you more and more to fresh earnestness and zeal and watchfulness though we know that these are already very great with every effort and with all authority strive as much as you are able to preserve whole and undefiled among the people committed to your charge the doctrine which christ our lord taught us which the apostles the interpreters of the will of god have handed down and which the catholic church has herself scrupulously guarded and commanded to be believed in all ages by the faithful of christ let special care be taken that the people be well instructed in the precepts of christian wisdom so that they may always remember that marriage was not instituted by the will of man but from the very beginning by the authority and command of god that it does not admit of plurality of wives or husbands that christ the author of the new covenant raised it from a right of nature to be a sacrament and gave to his church legislative and judicial power with regard to the bond of union on this point the very greatest care must be taken to instruct them lest their minds should be led into error by the unsound conclusions of adversaries who desire that the church should be deprived of that power in like manner all ought to understand clearly that if there be any union of a man and a woman among the faithful of christ which is not a sacrament such union has not the force and nature of a proper marriage that although contracted in accordance with the laws of the state it could not be more than a right or custom introduced by the civil law further the civil law can deal with and decide those matters alone which in the civil order spring from marriage and which cannot possibly exist as is evident unless there be a true and lawful cause for them that is to say the nuptial bond it is of the greatest consequence to husband and wife that all these things should be known and well understood by them in order that they may conform to the laws of the state if there be no objection on the part of the church for the church wishes the effects of marriage to be guarded in all possible ways and that no harm may come to the children in the great confusion of opinions however which day by day is spreading more and more widely it should further be known that no power can dissolve the bond of christian marriage whenever this has been ratified and consummated and that of a consequence those husbands and wives are guilty of a manifest crime who plan for whatever reason to be united in a second marriage before the first one has been ended by death when indeed matters have come to such a pitch that it seems impossible for them to live together any longer then the church allows them to live apart and strives at the same time to soften the evils of the separation by such remedies and helps as are suited to their condition yet she never ceases to endeavour to bring about a reconciliation and never despairs of doing so but these are extreme cases and they would seldom exist if men and women entered into the married state with proper dispositions not influenced by passion but entertaining right ideas of the duties of marriage and of its noble purpose neither would they anticipate their marriage by a series of sins 
drawing down upon them the wrath of God. To sum up all in a few words, there would be a calm and quiet constancy in marriage if married people would gather strength and life from the virtue of religion alone, which imparts to us resolution and fortitude. For marriage would enable them to bear tranquilly, and even gladly, the trials of their state, such as, for instance, the faults that they discover in one another, the difference of temper and character, the weight of a mother's cares, the wearing anxiety about the education of children, reverses of fortune, and the sorrows of life. Care also must be taken that they do not easily enter into marriage with those who are not Catholics, for when minds do not agree as to the observances of religion, it is scarcely possible to hope for agreement in other things. Other reasons also proving that persons should turn with dread from such marriages are chiefly these that they give occasion to forbidden association and communion in religious matters, endanger the faith of the Catholic partner, are a hindrance to the proper education of the children, and often lead to a mixing up of truth and falsehood, and to the belief that all religions are equally good. Lastly, since we well know that none should be excluded from our charity, we commend, venerable brothers, to your fidelity and piety those unhappy persons who, carried away by the heat of passion, and being utterly indifferent to their salvation, live wickedly together without the bond of lawful marriage. Let your utmost care be exercised in bringing such persons back to their duty, and, both by your own efforts and by those of good men who will consent to help you, strive by every means that they may see how wrongly they have acted, that they may do penance, and that they may be induced to enter into a lawful marriage according to the Catholic rite. You will at once see, venerable brothers, that the doctrine and precepts in relation to Christian marriage, which we have thought good to communicate to you in this letter, tend no less to the preservation of civil society than to the everlasting salvation of souls. May God grant that, by reason of their gravity and importance, minds may everywhere be found docile and ready to obey them. For this end, let us all suppliantly, with humble prayer, implore the help of the blessed and immaculate Virgin Mary, that, our hearts being quickened to the obedience of faith, she may show herself our mother and our helper. With equal earnestness, let us ask the princes of the apostles, Peter and Paul, the destroyer of heresies, the sowers of the seed of truth, to save the human race by their powerful patronage from the deluge of errors that is surging afresh. In the meantime, as an earnest of heavenly gifts, and a testimony of our special benevolence, we grant you all, venerable brothers, and to the people confided to your charge, from the depths of our heart, the apostolic benediction. End of section 4「Section 5 of The Great Encyclical Letters of Leo the Thirteenth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Freemasonry. Encyclical Letter, Humanum Genus. April 20th, 1884. The race of man, after its miserable fall from God, the creator and the giver of heavenly gifts, through the envy of the devil, separated into two diverse and opposite parts, of which the one steadfastly contends for truth and virtue, the other for those things which are contrary to virtue and to truth. The one is the kingdom of God on earth, namely the true church of Jesus Christ, and those who desire from their heart to be united with it, so as to gain salvation, must of necessity serve God and his only begotten Son, with their whole mind and with an entire will. The other is the kingdom of Satan, in whose possession and control are all whosoever follow the fatal example of their leader and of our first parents, those who refuse to obey the divine and eternal law, and who have many aims of their own in contempt of God, and many sins also against God. The twofold kingdom, St. Augustine keenly discerned and described, after the manner of two cities, contrary in their laws, because striving for contrary objects, and with a subtle brevity he expressed the efficient cause of each in these words. Two loves formed two cities, the love of self, reaching even to contempt of God, an earthly city, and the love of God, 
reaching to contempt of self a heavenly one at every period of time each has been in conflict with the other with a variety and multiplicity of weapons and of warfare although not always with equal ardor and assault at this period however the partisans of evil seem to be combining together and to be struggling with united vehemence led on or assisted by that strongly organized and widespread association called the freemasons no longer making any secret of their purposes they are now boldly rising up against god himself they are planning the destruction of holy church publicly and openly and this with the set purpose of utterly despoiling the nations of christendom if it were possible of the blessings obtained for us through jesus christ our saviour lamenting these evils we are constrained by the charity which urges our heart to cry out often to god for lo thy enemies have made a noise and they that hate thee have lifted up the head they have taken a malicious counsel against thy people and they have consulted against thy saints they have said come and let us destroy them so that they be not a nation at so urgent a crisis when so fierce and so pressing an onslaught is made upon the christian name it is our office to point out the danger to mark who are the adversaries and to the best of our power to make head against their plans and devices that those may not perish whose salvation is committed to us and that the kingdom of jesus christ entrusted to our charge may not only stand and remain whole but may be enlarged by an ever-increasing growth throughout the world the roman pontiffs our predecessors and their incessant watchfulness over the safety of the christian people were prompt in detecting the presence and the purpose of this capital enemy immediately it sprang into light instead of hiding as a dark conspiracy and moreover they took occasion with true foresight to give as it were the alarm and to admonish both princes and nations to stand on their guard and not allow themselves to be caught by the devices and snares laid out to deceive them the first warning of the danger was given by clement the twelfth in the year seventeen thirty eight and his constitution was confirmed and renewed by benedict the fourteenth pius the seventh followed the same path and leo the twelfth by his apostolic constitution quo graviora put together the acts and decrees of former pontiffs on this subject and ratified and confirmed them forever in the same sense spoke pius the eighth gregory the sixteenth and many times over pius the ninth for as soon as the constitution and the spirit of the masonic sect were clearly discovered by manifest signs of its action by cases investigated by the publication of its laws and of its rights and commentaries with the addition often of the personal testimony of those who were in the secret this apostolic see denounced the sect of the freemasons and publicly declared its constitution as contrary to law and right to be pernicious no less to christendom than to the state and it forbade any one to enter the society under the penalties which the church is wont to inflict upon exceptionally guilty persons the sectaries indignant at this thinking to elude or to weaken the force of these decrees partly by contempt of them and partly by calumny accused the sovereign pontiffs who had passed them either of exceeding the bounds of moderation in their decrees or of decreeing what was not just this was the manner in which they endeavoured to elude the authority and the weight of the apostolic constitutions of clement the twelfth and benedict the fourteenth as well as pius the seventh and pius the ninth yet in the very society itself there were to be found men who unwillingly acknowledged the roman pontiffs had acted within their right according to the catholic doctrine and discipline the pontiffs received the same assent and in strong terms from many princes and heads of governments who made it their business either to delate the masonic society to the apostolic see or of their own accord by special enactments to brand it as pernicious as for example in holland austria switzerland spain bavaria savoy and other parts of italy but what is of highest importance the course of events has demonstrated the prudence of our predecessors for their provident and paternal solicitude had not always and everywhere the result desired and this either because of the simulation and cunning of some who were active agents in the mischief or else of the thoughtless levity of the rest 
who ought in their own interest to have given to the matter their diligent attention in consequence the sect of freemasons grew with a rapidity beyond conception in the course of a century and a half until it came to be able by means of fraud or of audacity to gain such entrance into every rank of the state as to seem to be almost its ruling power this swift and formidable advance has brought upon the church upon the power of princes upon the public well-being precisely that grievous harm which our predecessors had long before foreseen such a condition has been reached that henceforth there will be grave reason to fear not indeed for the church for her foundation is much too firm to be overturned by the efforts of men but for those states in which prevails the power either of the sect of which we are speaking or of other sects not dissimilar which lend themselves to it as disciples and subordinates for these reasons we no sooner came to the helm of the church than we clearly saw and felt it to be our duty to use our authority to the very utmost against so vast an evil we have several times already as occasion served attacked certain chief points of teaching which showed in a special manner the perverse influence of masonic opinions thus in our encyclical letter quod apostolici muneris we endeavoured to refute the monstrous doctrines of the socialists and communists afterwards in another beginning arcanum we took pains to defend and explain the true and genuine idea of domestic life of which marriage is the spring and origin and again in that which begins de Euternum, we describe the ideal of political government conformed to the principles of christian wisdom which is marvellously in harmony on the one hand with the natural order of things and on the other with the well-being of both sovereign princes and nations it is now our intention following the example of our predecessors directly to treat of the masonic society itself of its whole teaching of its aims and of its manner of thinking and acting in order to bring more and more into the light its power for evil and to do what we can to arrest the contagion of this fatal plague there are several organized bodies which though differing in name in ceremonial in form and origin are nevertheless so bound together by community of purpose and by the similarity of their main opinions as to make in fact one thing with the sect of the freemasons which is a kind of centre whence they all go forth and whither they all return now these no longer show a desire to remain concealed for they hold their meetings in the daylight and before the public eye and publish their own newspaper organs and yet when thoroughly understood they are found still to retain the nature and the habits of secret societies there are many things like mysteries which it is the fixed rule to hide with extreme care not only from strangers but from very many members also such as their secret and final designs the names of their chief leaders and certain secret and inner meetings as well as their decisions and the ways and means of carrying them out this is no doubt the object of the manifold difference among the members as to right office and privilege of the received distinction of orders and grades and of that severe discipline which is maintained candidates are generally commanded to promise nay with a special oath to swear that they will never to any person at any time or in any way make known the members the passes or the subjects discussed thus with a fraudulent external appearance and with a style of simulation which is always the same the freemasons like the manichees of old strive as far as possible to conceal themselves and to admit no witnesses but their own members as a convenient manner of concealment they assume the character of literary men and scholars associated for purposes of learning they speak of their zeal for a more cultured refinement and of their love for the poor and they declare their one wish to be the amelioration of the condition of the masses and to share with the largest possible number all the benefits of civil life were these purposes aimed at in real truth they are by no means the whole of their object moreover to be enrolled it is necessary that the candidates promise and undertake to be thenceforward strictly obedient to their leaders and masters with the utmost submission and fidelity and to be in readiness to do their bidding upon the slightest expression of their will or if disobedient to submit to the direst penalties and death itself 
as a fact if any are judged to have betrayed the doings of the sect or to have resisted commands given punishment is inflicted on them not infrequently and with so much audacity and dexterity that the assassin very often escapes the detection and penalty of his crime but to simulate and wish to lie hid to bind men like slaves in the very tightest bonds and without giving any sufficient reason to make use of men enslaved to the will of another for any arbitrary act to arm men's right hands for bloodshed after securing impunity for the crime all this is an enormity from which nature recoils wherefore reason and truth itself make it plain that the society of which we are speaking is in antagonism with justice and natural uprightness and this becomes still plainer inasmuch as other arguments also and those very manifest prove that it is essentially opposed to natural virtue for no matter how great may be men's cleverness in concealing and their experience in lying it is impossible to prevent the effects of any cause from showing in some way the intrinsic nature of the cause whence they come a good tree cannot produce bad fruit nor a bad tree produce good fruit now the masonic sect produces fruits that are pernicious and of the bitterest savour for from what we have above most clearly shown that which is their ultimate purpose forces itself into view namely the other overthrow of that whole religious and political order of the world which the christian teaching has produced and the substitution of a new state of things in accordance with their ideas of which the foundations and laws shall be drawn from mere naturalism what we have said and are about to say must be understood of the sect of the freemasons taken generally and in so far as it comprises the associations kindred to it and confederated with it but not of the individual members of them there may be persons amongst these and not a few who although not free from the guilt of having entangled themselves in such associations yet are neither themselves partners in their criminal acts nor aware of the ultimate object which they are endeavouring to attain in the same way some of the affiliated societies perhaps by no means approve of the extreme conclusions which they would if consistent embrace as necessarily following from their common principles did not their very foulness strike them with horror some of these again are led by circumstances of time and places either to aim at smaller things than the others usually attempt or than they themselves would wish to attempt they are not however for this reason to be reckoned as alien in the masonic federation for the masonic federation is to be judged not so much by the things which it has done or brought to a completion as by the sum of its pronounced opinions now the fundamental doctrine of the naturalists which they sufficiently make known by their very name is that human nature and human reason ought in all things to be mistress and guide laying this down they care little for duties to god or pervert them by erroneous and vague opinions for they deny that anything has been taught by god they allowed no dogma of religion or truth which cannot be understood by the human intelligence nor any teacher who ought to be believed by reason of his authority and since it is a special and exclusive duty of the catholic church fully to set forth in words truths divinely received to teach besides other divine helps to salvation the authority of its office and to defend the same with perfect purity it is against the church that the rage and attack of the enemies are principally directed in those matters which regard religion let it be seen how the sect of the freemasons acts especially where it is more free to act without restraint and then let any one judge whether in fact it does not wish to carry out the policy of the naturalists by a long and persevering labor they endeavor to bring about this result namely that the office and authority of the church may become of no account in the civil state and for this same reason they declare to the people and contend that church and state ought to be altogether disunited by this means they reject from the laws and from the commonwealth the wholesome influence of the catholic religion and they consequently imagine that states ought to be constituted without any regard for the laws and precepts of the church nor do they think it enough to disregard the church 
the best of guides, unless they also injure it by their hostility. Indeed, with them it is lawful to attack with impunity the very foundations of the Catholic religion, in speech, in writing, and in teaching, and even the rights of the Church are not spared, and the offices with which it is divinely invested are not safe. The least possible liberty to manage affairs is left to the Church, and this is done by laws not apparently very hostile, but in reality framed and fitted to hinder freedom of action. Moreover, we see exceptional and onerous laws imposed upon the clergy, to the end that they may be continually diminished in number and in necessary means. We see also the remnants of the possessions of the Church, fettered by the strictest conditions, and subjected to the power and arbitrary will of the administrators of the state, and the religious orders rooted up and scattered. But against the apostolic see and the Roman pontiff, the contention of these enemies has been for a long time directed. The pontiff was first, for specious reasons, thrust out from the bulwark of his liberty and of his right, the civil princedom. Soon he was unjustly driven into a condition which was unbearable because of the difficulties raised on all sides. And now the time has come when the partisans of the sects openly declare what in secret among themselves they have for so long time plotted, that the sacred power of the pontiffs must be abolished, and that the pontificate itself, founded by divine right, must be utterly destroyed. If other proofs were wanting, this fact will be sufficiently disclosed by the testimony of men well informed, of whom some at other times, and others again recently, have declared it to be true of the Freemasons, that they especially desire to assail the church with irreconcilable hostility, and that they will never rest until they have destroyed whatever the supreme pontiffs have established for the sake of religion. If those who are admitted as members are not commanded to abjure by any form of words the Catholic doctrines, this omission, so far from being adverse to the designs of the Freemasons, is more useful for their purposes. First, in this way they easily deceive the simple-minded and the heedless, and can induce a far greater number to become members. Again, as all who offer themselves are received, whatever may be their form of religion, they thereby teach the general heir of this age, that a regard for religion should be held as an indifferent matter, and that all religions are alike. This manner of reasoning is calculated to bring about the ruin of all forms of religion, and especially of the Catholic religion, which, as it is the only one that is true, cannot without great injustice be regarded as merely equal to other religions. But the naturalists go much further, for having, in the highest things, entered upon a wholly erroneous course, they are carried headlong to extremes, either by reason of the weakness of human nature, or because God inflicts upon them the just punishment of their pride. Hence it happens that they no longer consider as certain and permanent those things which are fully understood by the natural light of reason, such as certainly are, the existence of God, the immaterial nature of the human soul, and its immortality. The sect of the Freemasons, by a similar course of error, is exposed to these same dangers, for although in a general way they may profess the existence of God, they themselves are witnesses that they do not all maintain this truth with the fullest assent of the mind, or with a firm conviction. Neither do they conceal that this question about God is the greatest source and cause of discords among them. In fact, it is certain that a considerable contention about this same subject has existed among them very lately. But indeed, the sect allows great liberty to its votaries, so that to each side is given the right to defend its own opinion, either that there is a God, or that there is none. And those who obstinately contend that there is no God are as easily initiated as those who contend that God exists, though, like the pantheists, they have false notions concerning him, all which is nothing else than taking away the reality while retaining some absurd representation of the divine nature. When this greatest fundamental truth has been overturned or weakened, it follows that those truths also, which are known by the teaching of nature, must begin to fall, namely, that all things are made by the free will of God, the Creator, that the world is governed by providence, that souls do not die, 
that to this life of men upon the earth there will succeed another and an everlasting life when these truths are done away with which are the principles of nature and important for knowledge and for practical use it is easy to see what will become of both public and private morality we say nothing of those more heavenly virtues which no one can exercise or even acquire without a special gift and grace of god of which necessarily no trace can be found in those who reject as unknown the redemption of mankind the grace of god the sacraments and the happiness to be obtained in heaven we speak now of the duties which have their origin and natural probity that god is the creator of the world and its provident ruler that the eternal law commands the natural order to be maintained and forbids that it be disturbed that the last end of men is a destiny far above human things and beyond the sojourning upon the earth these are the sources and these the principles of all justice and morality if these be taken away as the naturalists and freemasons desire there will immediately be no knowledge as to what constitutes justice and injustice or upon what principle morality is founded and in truth the teaching of morality which alone finds favor with the sect of freemasons and in which they contend that youth should be instructed is that what they call civil and independent and free namely that which does not contain any religious belief but how insufficient such teaching is how wanting in soundness and how easily moved by every impulse of passion is sufficiently proved by its sad fruits which have already begun to appear for wherever by removing christian education the sect has begun more completely to rule their goodness and integrity of morals have begun quickly to perish monstrous and shameful opinions have grown up and the audacity of evil deeds has risen to a high degree all this is commonly complained of and deplored and not a few of those who by so means wish to do so are compelled by abundant evidence to give not infrequently the same testimony moreover since human nature was stained by original sin and is therefore more disposed to vice than to virtue for a virtuous life it is absolutely necessary to restrain the disorderly movements of the soul and to make the passions obedient to reason in this conflict human things must very often be despised and the greatest labors and hardships must be undergone in order that reason may always hold its sway but the naturalists and freemasons having no faith in those things which we have learned by the revelation of god deny that our first parents sinned and consequently think that free will is not at all weakened and inclined to evil on the contrary exaggerating rather our natural virtue and excellence and placing therein alone the principle and rule of justice they cannot even imagine that there is any need at all of a constant struggle and a perfect steadfastness to overcome the violence and rule the passions of our nature wherefore we see that men are publicly tempted by the many allurements of pleasure that there are journals and pamphlets with neither moderation nor shame that stage plays are remarkable for license that designs for works of art are shamelessly sought in the laws of a so-called realism that the contrivances for a soft and delicate life are most carefully devised and that all the blandishments of pleasure are diligently sought out by which virtue may be lulled to sleep wickedly also but at the same time quite consistently do those act who do away with the expectation of the joys of heaven and bring down all happiness to the level of mortality and as it were sink it in the earth of what we have said the following fact astonishing not so much in itself as in its open expression may serve as a confirmation for since generally no one is accustomed to obey crafty and clever men so submissively as those whose soul is weakened and broken down by the domination of the passions there have been in the sect of the freemasons some who have plainly determined and proposed that artfully and of set purpose the multitude should be satiated with a boundless license of vice as when this has been done it would easily come under their power and authority for any acts of daring what refers to domestic life and the teaching of the naturalists is almost all contained in the following declarations that marriage belongs to the genus of commercial contracts which can rightly be revoked by the will of those who made them and that the civil rulers of the state have power over the matrimonial bond that in the education of youth nothing is to be taught in the matter of religion 
as of certain and fixed opinion and each one must be left at liberty to follow when he comes of age whatever he may prefer to these things the freemasons fully assent and not only assent but have long endeavoured to make them into a law and institution for in many countries and those nominally catholic it is enacted that no marriage shall be considered lawful except those contracted by the civil right in other places the law permits divorce and in others every effort is used to make it lawful as soon as may be thus the time is quickly coming when marriages will be turned into another kind of contract that is into changeable and uncertain unions which fancy may join together and which the same when changed may disunite with the greatest unanimity the sect of the freemasons also endeavours to take to itself the education of youth they think that they can easily mould to their opinions that soft and pliant age and bend it whither they will and that nothing can be more fitted than this to enable them to bring up the youth of the state after their own plan therefore in the education and instruction of children they allow no share either of teaching or of discipline to the ministers of the church and in many places they have procured that the education of youth shall be exclusively in the hands of laymen and that nothing which treats of the more important and most holy duties of men to god shall be introduced into this instruction on morals then come their doctrines of politics in which the naturalists lay down that all men have the same right and are in every respect of equal and like condition that each one is naturally free that no one has the right to command another that it is an act of violence to require men to obey any authority other than that which is obtained from themselves according to this therefore all things belong to the free people power is held by the command or permission of the people so that when the popular will changes rulers may lawfully be deposed and the source of all rights and civil duties is either in the multitude or in the governing authority when this is constituted according to the latest doctrines it is held also that the state should be without god that in the various forms of religion there is no reason why one should have precedence of another and that they are all to occupy the same place that these doctrines are equally acceptable to the freemasons and that they would wish to constitute states according to this example and model it is too well known to require proof for some time past they have openly endeavoured to bring this about with all their strength and resources and in this they prepare the way for not a few bolder men who are hurrying on even to worse things in their endeavour to obtain equality and community of all goods by the destruction of every distinction of rank and property what therefore the sect of freemasons is and what course it pursues appears sufficiently from the summary we have briefly given their chief dogmas are so greatly and manifestly at variance with reason that nothing can be more perverse to wish to destroy the religion and the church which god himself has established and whose perpetuity he ensures by his protection and to bring back after a lapse of eighteen centuries the manners and customs of the pagans is signal folly and audacious impiety neither is it less horrible nor more tolerable that they should repudiate the benefits which jesus christ has mercifully obtained not only for individuals but also for the family and for civil society benefits which even according to the judgment and testimony of enemies of christianity are very great in this insane and wicked endeavour we may almost see the implacable hatred and spirit of revenge with which satan himself is inflamed against jesus christ so also the studious endeavour of the freemasons to destroy the chief foundations of justice and honesty and to co-operate with those who would wish as if they were mere animals to do what they please tends only to the ignominious and disgraceful ruin of the human race the evil too is increased by the dangers which threaten both domestic and civil society as we have elsewhere shown in marriage according to the belief of almost every nation there is something sacred and religious and the law of god has determined that marriages shall not be dissolved if they are deprived of their sacred character and made dissoluble trouble and confusion in the family will be the result the wife being deprived of her dignity and the children left without protection as to their interests and well-being to have in public matters no care for religion 
and in the arrangement and administration of civil affairs to have no more regard for god than if he did not exist is a rashness unknown to the very pagans for in their heart and soul the notion of a divinity and the need of public religion were so firmly fixed that they would have thought it easier to have a city without foundation than a city without god human society indeed for which by nature we are formed has been constituted by god the author of nature and from him as from their principle and source flow in all their strength and permanence the countless benefits with which society abounds as we are each of us admonished by the very voice of nature to worship god in piety and holiness as the giver unto us of life and of all that is good therein so also and for the same reason nations and states are bound to worship him and therefore it is clear that those who would absolve society from all religious duty act not only unjustly but also with ignorance and folly as men are by the will of god born for civil union in society and as the power to rule is so necessary a bond of society that if it be taken away society must at once be broken up it follows that from him who is the author of society has come also the authority to rule so that whosoever rules he is the minister of god wherefore as the end and nature of human society so requires it is right to obey the just commands of lawful authority as it is right to obey god who ruled all things and it is most untrue that the people have it in their power to cast aside their obedience whensoever they please in like manner no one doubts that all men are equal one to another so far as regards their common origin and nature or the last end which each one has to attain or the rights and duties which are thence derived but as the abilities of all are not equal as one differs from another in the powers of mind or body and as there are very many dissimilarities of manner disposition and character it is most repugnant to reason to endeavour to confine all within the same measure and to extend complete equality to the institutions of civil life just as a perfect condition of the body results from the conjunction and composition of its various members which though differing in form and purpose make by their union and the distribution of each one to its proper place a combination beautiful to behold firm in strength and necessary for use so in the commonwealth there is an almost infinite dissimilarity of men as parts of the whole if they are to be all equal and each is to follow his own will the state will appear most deformed but if with a distinction of degrees of dignity of pursuits and employments all aptly conspire for the common good they will present a natural image of a well-constituted state now from the disturbing errors which we have described the greatest dangers to states are to be feared for the fear of god and reverence for divine laws being taken away the authority of rulers despised sedition permitted and approved and the popular passions urged up to lawlessness with no restraint save that of punishment a change and overthrow of all things will necessarily follow yes this change and overthrow is deliberately planned and put forward by many associations of communists and socialists and to their undertaking the sect of freemasons is not hostile but greatly favors their designs and holds in common with them their chief opinions and if these men do not at once and everywhere endeavor to carry out their extreme views it is not to be attributed to their teaching and their will but to the virtue of that divine religion which cannot be destroyed and also because the sounder part of men refusing to be enslaved to secret societies vigorously resist their insane attempts would that all men would judge of the tree by its fruits and would acknowledge the seed and origin of the evils which press upon us and of the dangers that are impending we have to deal with a deceitful and crafty enemy who gratifying the ears of people and princes has ensnared them by smooth speeches and by adulation ingratiating themselves with rulers under a pretense of friendship the freemasons have endeavoured to make them their allies and powerful helpers for the destruction of the christian name and that they might more strongly urge them on they have with determined calumny accused the church of individually contending with rulers in matters that affect their authority and sovereign power having by these artifices ensured their own safety and audacity 
they had begun to exercise great weight in the government of states but nevertheless they are prepared to shake the foundations of empires to harass the rulers of the state to accuse and to cast them out as often as they appear to govern otherwise than they themselves would have wished in like manner they have by flattery deluded the people proclaiming with a loud voice liberty and public prosperity and saying that it was owing to the church and to sovereigns that the multitude were not drawn out of their unjust servitude and poverty they have imposed upon the people and exciting them by a thirst for novelty they have urged them to assail both the church and the civil power nevertheless the expectation of the benefit which were hoped for was greater than the reality indeed the common people more oppressed than they were before are deprived in their misery of that solace which if things had been arranged in a christian manner they would have had with ease and in abundance but whoever strive against the order which divine providence has constituted pay usually the penalty of their pride and meet with affliction and misery where they have rashly hoped to find all things prosperous and in conformity with their desires the church if she directs men to render obedience chiefly and above all to god the sovereign lord is wrongly and falsely believed either to be envious of the civil power or to arrogate to herself something of the rights of sovereigns on the contrary she teaches that what is rightly due to the civil power must be rendered to it with a conviction and consciousness of duty in teaching that from god himself comes the right of ruling she adds a great dignity to civil authority and no small help towards obtaining the obedience and good will of the citizens the friend of peace and sustainer of concord she embraces all with maternal love and intent only upon giving help to moral man she teaches that to justice must be joined clemency equity to authority and moderation to law-giving that no one's right must be violated that order and public tranquillity are to be maintained and that the poverty of those who are in need is as far as possible to be relieved by public and private charity but for this reason to use the words of st augustine men think or would have it believed that christian teaching is not suited to the good of the state for they wish the state to be founded not on solid virtue but on the impunity of vice knowing these things both princes and people would act with political wisdom and according to the needs of general safety if instead of joining the freemasons to destroy the church they join with the church in repelling their attacks whatever the future may be in this grave and widespread evil it is our duty venerable brethren to endeavour to find a remedy and because we know that our best and firmest hope of a remedy is in the power of that divine religion which the freemasons hate in proportion to their fear of it we think it to be of chief importance to call that most saving power to our aid against the common enemy therefore whatsoever the roman pontiffs our predecessors have decreed for the purpose of opposing the undertakings and endeavours of the masonic sect and whatsoever they have enacted to deter or withdraw men from societies of this kind we ratify and confirm it all by our apostolic authority and trusting greatly to the good will of christians we pray and beseech each one for the sake of his eternal salvation to be most conscientiously careful not in the least to depart from what the apostolic see has commanded in this matter we pray and beseech you venerable brethren to join your efforts with ours and earnestly to strive for the extirpation of this foul plague which is creeping through the veins of the state you have to defend the glory of god and the salvation of your neighbour and with this object of your strife before you neither courage nor strength will be wanting it will be for your prudence to judge by what means you can best overcome the difficulties and obstacles you meet with but as it befits the authority of our office that we ourselves should point out some suitable way of proceeding we wish it to be your role first of all to tear away the mask from freemasonry and to let it be seen as it really is and by sermons and pastoral letters to instruct the people as to the artifices used by societies of this kind in seducing men and enticing them into their ranks and as to the depravity of their opinions and the wickedness of their acts as our predecessors have many times repeated let no man think that he may for any reason whatsoever join the masonic sect if he values his catholic name and his eternal salvation as he ought to value them 
let no one be deceived by a pretense of honesty it may seem to some that freemasons demand nothing that is openly contrary to religion and morality but as the whole principle and object of the sect lies in what is vicious and criminal to join with these men or in any way to help them cannot be lawful further by assiduous teaching and exhortation the multitude must be drawn to learn diligently the precepts of religion for which purpose we earnestly advise that by opportune writings and sermons they may be taught the elements of those sacred truths in which christian philosophy is contained the result of this will be that the minds of men will be made sound by instruction and will be protected against many forms of error and inducements to wickedness especially in the present unbounded freedom of writing and insatiable eagerness for learning great indeed is the work but in it the clergy will share your labors if through your care they are fitted for it by learning in a well-trained life this good and great work requires to be helped also by the industry of those amongst the laity in whom a love of religion and of country is joined to learning and goodness of life by uniting the efforts of both clergy and laity strive venerable brethren to make men thoroughly know and love the church for the greater their knowledge and love of the church the more will they be turned away from clandestine societies wherefore not without cause do we use this occasion to state again what we have stated elsewhere namely that the third order of st francis whose discipline we a little while ago prudently mitigated should be studiously promoted and sustained for the whole object of this order as constituted by its founder is to invite men to an imitation of jesus christ to a love of the church and to the observance of all christian virtues and therefore it ought to be of great influence in suppressing the contagion of wicked societies let therefore this holy sodality be strengthened by a daily increase amongst the many benefits to be expected from it will be the great benefit of drawing the minds of men to liberty fraternity and equality of right not such as the freemasons absurdly imagine but such as jesus christ obtained for the human race and saint francis aspired to the liberty we mean of sons of god through which we may be made free from slavery to satan or to our passions both of them most wicked masters the fraternity whose origin is in god the common creator and father of all the equality which founded on justice and charity does not take away all distinctions among men but out of the varieties of life of duties and of pursuits forms that union and that harmony which naturally tend to the benefit and dignity of the state in the third place there is a matter wisely instituted by our forefathers but in course of time laid aside which may now be used as a pattern in form of something similar we mean the associations or guilds of workmen for the protection under the guidance of religion both of their temporal interests and of their morality if our ancestors by long use and experience felt the benefit of these guilds our age perhaps will feel it the more by reason of the opportunity which they will give of crushing the power of the sex those who support themselves by the labor of their hands besides being of their very condition most worthy above all others of charity and consolation are also especially exposed to the allurements of men whose ways lie in fraud and deceit therefore they ought to be helped with the greatest possible kindness and to be invited to join associations that are good lest they be drawn away to others that are evil for this reason we greatly wish for the salvation of the people that under the auspices and patronage of the bishops and at convenient times these guilds may be generally restored to our great delight sodalities of this kind and also associations of masters have in many places already been established having each class of them for their object to help the honest workmen to protect and guard his children and family and to promote in them piety christian knowledge and a moral life and in this matter we cannot omit mentioning that exemplary society named after its founder st vincent which has deserved so well of the people of the lower order its acts and its aims are well known its whole object is to give relief to the poor and miserable this it does with singular prudence and modesty 
and the less it wishes to be seen the better is it fitted for the exercise of christian charity and for the relief of suffering in the fourth place in order more easily to attain what we wish to your fidelity and watchfulness we commend in a special manner the young as being the hope of human society devote the greatest part of your care to their instruction and do not think that any precaution can be great enough in keeping them from manners and schools whence the pestilent breath of the sex is to be feared under your guidance let parents religious instructors and priests having the cure of souls use every opportunity in their christian teaching of warning their children and pupils of the infamous nature of these societies so that they may learn in good time to beware of the various and fraudulent artifices by which their promoters are accustomed to ensnare people and those who instruct the young in religious knowledge will act wisely if they induce all of them to resolve and to undertake never to bind themselves to any society without the knowledge of their parents or the advice of their parish priest or director we well know however that our united labors will by no means suffice to pluck up these pernicious seeds from the lord's field unless the heavenly master of the vineyard shall mercifully help us in our endeavors we trust therefore with great and anxious care implore of him the help which the greatness of the danger and of the need requires the sect of the freemasons shows itself insolent and proud of its success and seems as if it would put no bounds to its pertinacity its followers joined together by a wicked compact and by secret counsels give help one to another and excite one another to an audacity for evil things so vehement an attack demands an equal defence namely that all good men should form the widest possible association of action and of prayer we beseech them therefore with united hearts to stand together and unmoved against the advancing force of the sex and in mourning and supplication to stretch out their hands to god praying that the christian name may flourish and prosper that the church may enjoy its needed liberty that those who have gone astray may return to a right mind that error at length may give place to truth and vice to virtue let us take as our helper and intercessor the virgin mary mother of god so that she who from the moment of her conception overcame satan may show her power over these evil sects in which is revived the contumacious spirit of the demon together with his unsubdued perfidy and deceit let us beseech michael the prince of the heavenly angels who drove out the infernal foe and joseph the spouse of the most holy virgin and heavenly patron of the catholic church and the great apostles peter and paul the fathers and victorious champions of the christian faith by their patronage and by perseverance in united prayer we hope that god will mercifully and opportunely succor the human race which is encompassed by so many dangers as a pledge of heavenly gifts and of our benevolence we lovingly grant in the lord to you venerable brethren and to the clergy and all the people committed to your watchful care our apostolic benediction end of section five Section six of the Great Encyclical Letters of Pope Leo the Thirteenth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Christian Constitution of States. Encyclical Letter Immortale Dei, November first, eighteen eighty five. The Catholic Church, that imperishable handiwork of our all merciful God, has for her immediate and natural purpose the saving of souls and securing our happiness in heaven yet in regard to things temporal she is the source of benefits as manifold and great as if the chief end of her existence were to ensure the prospering of our earthly life and in truth wherever the church has set her foot she has straightway changed the face of things and has attempted the moral tone of the people with a new civilization and with virtues before unknown all nations which have yielded to her sway have become eminent for their culture their sense of justice and the glory of their high deeds and yet a hackneyed reproach of old date is levelled against her that the church is opposed to the rightful aims of the civil government 
and is wholly unable to afford help in spreading that welfare and progress which justly and naturally are sought after by every well-regulated state from the very beginning christians were harassed by slanderous accusations of this nature and on that account were held up to hatred and execration for being so they were called enemies of the empire the christian religion was moreover commonly charged with being the cause of the calamities that so frequently befell the state whereas in very truth just punishment was being awarded to guilty nations by an avenging god this odious calumny which most valid reason nerved the genius and sharpened the pen of st augustine who notably in his treatise on the city of god set forth in so bright a light the worth of christian wisdom in its relation to the public weal that he seems not merely to have pleaded the cause of the christians of his day but to have refuted for all future times impeachments so grossly contrary to truth the wicked proneness however to levy the like charges and accusations has not been lulled to rest many indeed are they who have tried to work out a plan of civil society based on doctrines other than those approved by the catholic church nay in these latter days a novel scheme of law has begun here and there to gain increase and in influence the outcome as it is maintained of an age arrived at full stature and the result of liberty and evolution but though endeavours of various kinds have been ventured on it is clear that no better mode has been devised for the building up and ruling the state than that which is the necessary growth of the teachings of the gospel we deem it therefore of the highest moment and a strict duty of our apostolic office to contrast with the lessons taught by christ the novel theories now advanced touching the state by this means we cherish hope that the bright shining of the truth may scatter the mists of error and doubt so that one and all may see clearly the imperious law of life which they are bound to follow and obey it is not difficult to determine what would be the form and character of the state were it governed according to the principles of christian philosophy man's natural instinct moves him to live in civil society for he cannot if dwelling apart provide himself with the necessary requirements of life nor procure the means of developing his mental and moral faculties hence it is divinely ordained that he should lead his life be it family social or civil with his fellow men amongst whom alone his several wants can be adequately supplied but as no society can hold together unless some one be over all directing all to strive earnestly for the common good every civilized community must have a ruling authority and this authority no less than society itself has its source in nature and is consequently god for its author hence it follows that all public power must proceed from god for god alone is the true and supreme lord of the world everything without exception must be subject to him and must serve him so that whosoever holds the right to govern holds it from one sole and single source namely god the sovereign ruler of all there is no power but from god the right to rule is not necessarily however bound up with any special mode of government it may take this or that form provided only that it be of a nature to ensure the general welfare but whatever be the nature of the government rulers must ever bear in mind that god is the paramount ruler of the world and must set him before themselves as their exemplar and law in the administration of the state for in things visible god has fashioned secondary causes in which his divine action can in some wise be discerned leading up to the end to which the course of the world is ever tending in like manner in civil society god has always willed that there should be a ruling authority and that they who are invested with it should reflect the divine power and providence in some measure over the human race they therefore who rule should rule with even-handed justice not as masters but rather as fathers for the rule of god over man is most just and is tempered always with a father's kindness government should moreover be administered for the well-being of the citizens because they who govern others 
possess authority solely for the welfare of the state. Furthermore, the civil power must not be subservient to the advantage of any one individual or of some few persons, inasmuch as it was established for the common good of all. But if those who are in authority rule unjustly, if they govern overbearingly or arrogantly, and if their measures prove hurtful to the people, they must remember that the Almighty will one day bring them to account, the more strictly in proportion to the sacredness of their office and preeminence of their dignity. The mighty shall be mightily tormented. Then truly will the majesty of the law meet with the dutiful and willing homage of the people, when they are convinced that their rulers hold authority from God, and feel that it is a matter of justice and duty to obey them, and to show them reverence and fealty, united to a love not unlike that which children show their parents. Let every soul be subject to higher powers. To despise legitimate authority, in whomsoever vested, is unlawful, as a rebellion against the divine will, and whoever resists that, rushes willfully to destruction. He that resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist, purchase to themselves damnation. To cast aside obedience, and by popular violence, to incite to revolt, is therefore treason, not against man only, but against God. As a consequence, the state, constituted as it is, is clearly bound to act up to the manifold and weighty duties linking it to God, by the public profession of religion. Nature and reason, which command every individual devoutly to worship God in holiness, because we belong to him and must return to him, since from him we came, bind off of the civil community to a like law. For men living together in society are under the power of God, no less than individuals are, and society, not less than individuals, owes gratitude to God, who gave it being and maintains it, and whose ever-bounteous goodness enriches it with countless blessings. Since, then, no one is allowed to be remiss in the service due to God, and since the chief duty of all men is to cling to religion, in both its teaching and practice, not such religion as they may have a preference for, but the religion which God enjoins, and which certain and most clear marks show to be the only one true religion. It is a public crime to act as though there were no God. So, too, is it a sin in the state not to have care for religion, as of something beyond its scope, or as of no practical benefit, or out of many forms of religion, to adopt that one which chimes in with the fancy. For we are bound absolutely to worship God in that way which he has shown to be his will. All who rule, therefore, should hold in honor the holy name of God, and one of their chief duties must be to favor religion, to protect it, to shield it under the credit and sanction of the laws, and neither to organize nor enact any measure that may compromise its safety. This is the bounden duty of rulers to the people over whom they rule. For one and all are we destined by our birth and adoption to enjoy, when this frail and fleeting life is ended, a supreme and final good in heaven, and to the attainment of this every endeavor should be directed. Since, then, upon this depends the full and perfect happiness of mankind, the securing of this end should be of all imaginable interests the most urgent. Hence, civil society, established for the common welfare, should not only safeguard the well-being of the community, but have also at heart the interests of its individual members, in such mode as not in any way to hinder, but in every manner to render as easy as may be, the possession of that highest and unchangeable good for which we all should seek. Wherefore, for this purpose, care must especially be taken to preserve unharmed and unimpeded the religion whereof the practice is the link connecting man with God. Now, it cannot be difficult to find out which is the true religion, if only it be sought with an earnest and unbiased mind, for proofs are abundant and striking. We have, for example, the fulfillment of prophecies, miracles in great number, the rapid spread of the faith in the midst of enemies and in face of overwhelming obstacles, the witness of the martyrs and the like. From all these it is evident that the only true religion is the one established by Jesus Christ himself, 
and which he committed to his church to protect and propagate for the only begotten son of god established on earth a society which is called the church and to it he handed over the exalted and divine office which he had received from his father to be continued through the ages to come as the father has sent me i also send you behold i am with you all days even to the consummation of the world consequently as jesus christ came into the world that men might have life and have it more abundantly so also has the church for its aim and end the eternal salvation of souls and hence it is so constituted as to open wide its arms to all mankind unhampered by any limit of either time or place preach ye the gospel to every creature over this mighty multitude god has himself set rulers with power to govern and he has willed that one should be the head of all and the chief and unerring teacher of truth to whom he has given the keys of the kingdom of heaven feed my lambs feed my sheep i have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not this society is made up of men just as civil society is and yet is supernatural and spiritual on account of the end for which it was founded and of the means by which it aims at attaining that end hence it is distinguished and differs from civil society and what is of highest moment it is a society chartered as of divine right perfect in its nature and in its title to possess in itself and by itself through the will and loving kindness of its founder all needful provision for its maintenance and action and just as the end at which the church aims is by far the noblest of ends so is its authority the most exalted of all authority nor can it be looked upon as inferior to the civil power or in any manner dependent upon it in very truth jesus christ gave to his apostles unrestrained authority in regard to things sacred together with the genuine and most true power of making laws as also with the twofold right of judging and of punishing which flows from that power all power is given to me in heaven and on earth going therefore teach all nations teaching them to observe all things whatsoever i have commanded you and in another place if he will not hear them tell the church and again in readiness to revenge all disobedience and once more that i may not deal more severely according to the power which the lord hath given me unto edification and not unto destruction hence it is the church and not the state that is to be man's guide to heaven it is to the church that god has assigned the charge of seeing to and legislating for all that concerns religion of teaching all nations of spreading the christian faith as widely as possible in short of administering freely and without hindrance in accordance with her own judgment all matters that fall within its competence now this authority perfect in itself and plainly meant to be unfeathered so long as sailed by a philosophy that truckles to the state the church has never ceased to claim for herself and openly to exercise the apostles themselves were the first to uphold it when being forbidden by the rulers of the synagogue to preach the gospel they courageously answered we must obey god rather than men this same authority the holy fathers of the church were always careful to maintain by weighty arguments according as occasion arose and the roman pontiffs had never shrunk from defending it with unbending constancy nay more princes and all invested with power to rule have themselves approved it in theory alike and in practice it cannot be called in question that in the making of treaties in the transaction of business matters in the sending and receiving ambassadors and in the interchange of other kinds of official dealings they have been wont to treat with the church as with a supreme and legitimate power and assuredly all ought to hold that it was not without a singular disposition of god's providence that this power of the church was provided with the civil sovereignty as the most sure safeguard of her independence the almighty therefore has appointed the charge of the human race between two powers the ecclesiastical and the civil the one being set over divine and the other over human things each in its kind is supreme each has fixed limits within which it is contained 
limits which are defined by the nature and special object of the province of each so that there is we may say an orbit traced out within which the action of each is brought into play by its own native right but inasmuch as each of these two powers has authority over the same subjects and as it might come to pass that one and the same thing related differently but still remaining one and the same thing might belong to the jurisdiction and determination of both therefore god who foresees all things and who is the author of these two powers has marked out the course of each in right correlation to the other for the powers that are are ordained of god were this not so deplorable contentions and conflicts would often arise and not infrequently men like travellers at the meeting of two roads would hesitate in anxiety and doubt not knowing what course to follow two powers will be commanding contrary things and it would be a dereliction of duty to disobey either of the two but it would be most repugnant to deem thus of the wisdom and goodness of god even in physical things albeit of a lower order the almighty has so combined the forces and springs of nature with tempered action and wondrous harmony that no one of them clashes with any other and all of them most fitly and aptly work together for the great purpose of the universe there must accordingly exist between these two powers a certain orderly connection which may be compared to the union of the soul and body in man the nature and scope of that connection can be determined only as we have laid down by having regard to the nature of each power and by taking account of the relative excellence and nobleness of their purpose one of the two has for its proximate and chief object the well-being of this mortal life the other the everlasting joys of heaven whatever therefore in things human is of a sacred character whatever belongs either of its own nature or by reason of the end to which it is referred to the salvation of souls or to the worship of god is subject to the power and judgment of the church whatever is to be ranged under the civil and political order is rightly subject to the civil authority jesus christ has himself given command that what is caesar's is to be rendered to caesar and that what belongs to god is to be rendered to god there are nevertheless occasions when another method of concord is available for the sake of peace and liberty we mean when rulers of the state and the roman pontiff come to an understanding touching some special matter at such times the church gives signal proof of her motherly love by showing the greatest possible kindliness and indulgence such then as we have briefly pointed out is the christian organization of civil society not rashly or fancifully shaped out but adduced from the highest and truest principles confirmed by natural reason itself in such an organization of the state there is nothing that can be thought to infringe upon the dignity of rulers and nothing unbecoming them nay so far from degrading the sovereign power in its due rights it adds to it permanence and lustre indeed when more fully pondered this mutual coordination has a perfection in which all other forms of government are lacking and from which excellent results would flow were the several component parts to keep their place and duly discharge the office and work appointed respectively for each and doubtless in the constitution of the state such as we have described divine and human things are equitably shared the rights of citizens assured to them and fenced round by divine by natural and by human law the duties incumbent on each one being wisely marked out and their fulfilment fittingly ensured in their uncertain and toilsome journey towards the city made without hands all see that they have safe guides and helpers on their way and are conscious that others have charge to protect their persons alike and their possessions and to obtain or preserve for them everything essential for their present life furthermore domestic society acquires that firmness and solidity so needful to it from the holiness of marriage one and indissoluble wherein the rights and duties of husband and wife are controlled with wise justice and equity due honour is assured to the woman the authority of the husband is conformed to the pattern afforded by the authority of god the power of the father is tempered by a due regard for the dignity of the mother and her offspring and the best possible provision is made for the guardianship welfare and education of the children 
in political affairs and in all matters civil the laws aim at securing the common good and are not framed according to the delusive caprices and opinions of the mass of the people but by truth and by justice the ruling powers are invested with a sacredness more than human and are withheld from deviating from the path of duty and from overstepping the bounds of rightful authority and the obedience of citizens is rendered with a feeling of honor and dignity since obedience is not the servitude of man to man but submission to the will of god exercising his sovereignty through the medium of men now this being recognized as undeniable it is felt that the high office of rulers should be held in respect that public authority should be constantly and faithfully obeyed that no act of sedition should be committed and that the civic order of the commonwealth should be maintained as sacred so also as to the duties of each one towards his fellow men mutual forbearance kindliness generosity are placed in the ascendant the man who is at once a citizen and a christian is not drawn aside by conflicting obligations and lastly the abundant benefits with which the christian religion of its very nature endows even the mortal life of man are acquired for the community and civil society and this to such an extent that it may be said in sober truth the condition of the commonwealth depends on the religion with which god is worshipped and between one and the other there exists an intimate and abiding connection admirably according to his wont does saint augustine in many passages enlarge upon the potency of these advantages but nowhere more markedly and to the point than when he addresses the catholic church in the following words thou thus teach and train children with much tenderness young men with much vigour old men with much gentleness as the age not of the body alone but of the mind of each requires women thou dost subject to their husbands in chaste and faithful obedience not for the gratifying of their lust but for bringing forth children and for having a share in the family concerns thou dost set husbands over their wives not that they may play false to the weaker sex but according to the requirements of sincere affection thou dost subject children to their parents in a kind of free service and dost establish parents over their children with a benign rule thou joinest together not in society only but in a sort of brotherhood citizen with citizen nation with nation and the whole race of men by reminding them of their common parentage thou teachest kings to look to the interests of their people and dost admonish the people to be submissive to their kings with all care dost thou teach all to whom honour is due and affection and reverence and fear consolation and admonition and exhortation and discipline and reproach and punishment thou showest that all these are not equally incumbent on all but that charity is owing to all and wrongdoing to none and in another place blaming the false wisdom of certain time-saving philosophers he observes let those who say that the teaching of christ is hurtful to the state produce such armies as the maxims of jesus have enjoined soldiers to bring into being such governors of provinces such husbands and wives such parents and children such masters and servants such kings such judges and such prayers and collectors of tribute as the christian teaching instructs them to become and then let them dare to say that such teaching is hurtful to the state nay rather will they hesitate to own that this discipline if duly acted up to is the very mainstay of the commonwealth there was once a time when states were governed by the principles of gospel teaching then it was that the power and divine virtue of christian wisdom had diffused itself throughout the laws institutions and morals of the people penetrating all ranks and relations of civil society then too the religion instituted by jesus christ established firmly in befitting dignity flourished everywhere by the favour of princes and the legitimate protection of the magistrates and church and state were happily united in concord and friendly interchange of good offices the state constituted in this wise bore fruits important beyond all expectation whose remembrance is still and always will be in renown witnessed to as they are by countless proofs which can never be blotted out or even obscured by any craft of any enemies christian europe has subdued barbarous nations and changed them from a savage to a civilized condition from superstition to true worship 
it victoriously rolled back the tide of mohammedan conquest retained the headship of civilization stood forth in the front rank as the leader and teacher of all in every branch of national culture bestowed on the world the gift of true and many-sided liberty and most wisely founded very numerous institutions for the solace of human suffering and if we inquire how it was able to bring about so altered a condition of things the answer is beyond all question in large measure through religion under whose auspices so many great undertakings were set on foot through whose aid they were brought to completion a similar state of things would certainly have continued had the agreement of the two powers been lasting more important results even might have been justly looked for had obedience waited upon the authority teaching and counsels of the church and had the submission been specially marked by greater and more unswerving loyalty for that should be regarded in the light of ever changeless law which ivo of chartres wrote to pope paschal the second when kingdom and priesthood are at one in complete accord the world is well ruled and the church flourishes and brings forth abundant fruit but when they are at variance not only smaller interests prosper not but even things of greatest moment fall into deplorable decay sad it is to call to mind how the harmful and lamentable rage for innovation which rose to a climax in the sixteenth century threw first of all into confusion the christian religion and next by natural sequence invaded the precincts of philosophy whence it spread amongst all classes of society from this source as from a fountain-head burst forth all those latter tenets of unbridled license which in the midst of the terrible upheavals of the last century were wildly conceived and boldly proclaimed as the principles and foundation of that new jurisprudence which was not merely previously unknown but was at variance on many points with not only the christian but even with the natural law among these principles the main one lays down that as all men are alike by race and nature so in like manner are all equal in the control of their life and that each one is so far his own master as to be in no sense under the rule of any other individual that each is free to think on every subject just as he may choose and to do whatever he may like to do that no man has any right to rule over other men in a society grounded upon such maxims all government is nothing more nor less than the will of the people and the people being under the power of itself alone is alone its own ruler it does choose nevertheless some to whom charge it may commit itself but in such wise that it makes over to them not the right so much as the business of governing to be exercised however in its name the authority of god is passed over in silence just as if there were no god or as if he cared nothing for human society or as if men whether in their individual capacity or bound together in social relations owed nothing to god or as if there could be a government of which the whole origin and power and authority did not reside in god itself then as is evident a state became nothing but a multitude which is its own master and ruler and since the populace is declared to contain within itself the spring-head of all rights and of all power it follows that the state does not consider itself bound by any kind of duty towards god moreover it believes that it is not obliged to make public profession of any religion or to inquire which of the very many religions is the only one true or to prefer one religion to all the rest or to show to any form of religion special favor but on the contrary is bound to grant equal rights to every creed so that public order may not be disturbed by any particular form of religious belief and it is a part of this theory that all questions that concern religion are to be referred to private judgment that every one is to be free to follow whatever religion he prefers or none at all if he disapprove of all from this the following consequences logically flow that the judgment of each one's conscience is independent of all law that the most unrestrained opinions may be openly expressed as to the practice or omission of divine worship and that every one has unbounded license to think whatever he chooses and to publish abroad whatever he thinks now when the state rests on foundations like those just named and for the time being they are greatly in favour 
it readily appears into what and how unrightful a position the church is driven for when the management of public business is in harmony with doctrines of such a kind the catholic religion is allowed a standing in civil society equal only or inferior to societies alien from it no regard is paid to the laws of the church and she who by the order and commission of jesus christ has the duty of teaching all nations finds herself forbidden to take any part in the instruction of the people with reference to matters that are of twofold jurisdiction they who administer the civil power lay down the law at their own will and in matters that appertain to religion defiantly put aside the most sacred decrees of the church they claim jurisdiction over the marriage of catholics even over the bond as well as the unity and the indissolvability of matrimony they lay hands on the goods of the clergy contending that the church could not possess property lastly they treat the church with such arrogance that rejecting entirely her title to the nature and rights of a perfect society they hold that she differs in no respect from other societies in the state and for this reason possesses no right nor any legal power of action save that which she holds by the concession in favor of the government if in any state the church retains her own right and this with the approval of the civil law owing to an agreement publicly entered into by the two powers men forthwith begin to cry out that matters affecting the church must be separated from those of the state their object in uttering this cry is to be able to violate unpunished their plighted faith and in all things to have unchecked control and as a church unable to abandon her chiefest and most sacred duties cannot patiently put up with this and ask that the pledge given to her be fully and scrupulously acted up to contentions frequently arise between the ecclesiastical and the civil power of which the issue commonly is that the weaker power yields to the one which is stronger in human resources accordingly it has become the practice and determination under this condition of public polity now so much admired by many either to forbid the action of the church altogether or to keep her in check and bondage to the state public enactments are in great measure framed with this design the drawing up of laws the administration of state affairs the godless education of youth the spoliation and suppression of religious orders the overthrow of the temporal power of the roman pontiff all alike aim at this one end to paralyze the action of christian institutions to cramp to the utmost the freedom of the catholic church and to curtail her every single prerogative now natural reason itself proves convincingly that such concepts of the government of a state are wholly at variance with the truth nature itself bears witness that all power of every kind has its origin from god who is its chief and most august source the sovereignty of the people however and this without any reference to god is held to reside in the multitude which is doubtless a doctrine exceedingly well calculated to flatter and to inflame many passions but which lacks all reasonable proof and all power of ensuring public safety and preserving order indeed from the prevalence of this teaching things have come to such a pass that many hold as an axiom of civil jurisprudence that seditions may be rightfully fostered for the opinion prevails that princes are nothing more than delegates chosen to carry out the will of the people whence it necessarily follows that all things are as changeable as the will of the people so that risk of public disturbance is ever hanging over our heads to hold therefore that there is no difference in matters of religion between forms that are unlike each other and even contrary to each other most clearly leads in the end to the rejection of all religion in both theory and practice and this is the same thing as atheism however it may differ from it in name men who really believe in the existence of god must in order to be consistent with themselves and to avoid absurd conclusions understand that differing modes of divine worship involving dissimilarity and conflict even on most important points cannot be equally probable equally good and equally acceptable to god so too the liberty of thinking and of publishing whatsoever each one likes without any hindrance is not in itself an advantage over which society can wisely rejoice on the contrary it is the fountain-head and origin of many evils 
liberty is a power perfecting man and hence should have truth and goodness for its object but the character of goodness and truth cannot be changed at option these remain ever one and the same and are no less unchangeable than nature herself if the mind assents to false opinions and the will chooses and follows after what is wrong neither can attain its native fullness but both must fall from their native dignity into an abyss of corruption whatever therefore is opposed to virtue and truth may not rightly be brought temptingly before the eye of man much less sanctioned by the favour and protection of the law a well-spent life is the only passport to heaven whither all are bound and on this account the state is acting against the laws and dictates of nature whenever it permits the license of opinion and of action to lead minds astray from truth and souls away from the practice of virtue to exclude the church founded by god himself from the business of life from the power of making laws from the training of youth from domestic society is a grave and fatal error a state from which religion is banished can never be well regulated and already perhaps more than is desirable is known of the nature and tendency of the so-called civil philosophy of life and morals the church of christ is the true and sole teacher of virtue and guardian of morals she it is who preserves in their purity the principles from which duties flow and by setting forth most urgent reasons for virtuous life bids us not only to turn away from wicked deeds but even to curb all movements of the mind that are opposed to reason even though they be not carried out in action to wish the church to be subject to the civil power in the exercise of her duty is a great folly and a sheer injustice whenever this is the case order is disturbed for things natural are put above things supernatural the many benefits which the church if free to act would confer on society are either prevented or at least lessened in number and a way is prepared for enmities and contentions between the two powers with how evil result to both the issue of events has taught us only too frequently doctrines such as these which cannot be approved by human reason and most seriously affect the whole civil order our predecessors the roman pontiffs well aware of what their apostolic office required of them have never allowed to pass uncondemned thus gregory the sixteenth in his encyclical letter morari vos of date august fifteenth eighteen thirty two inveighed with weighty words against the sophisms which even at his time were being publicly inculcated namely that no preference should be shown for any particular form of worship that it is right for individuals to form their own personal judgments about religion that each man's conscience is his sole and all-sufficing guide and that it is lawful for every man to publish his own views whatever they may be and even to conspire against the state on the question of the separation of church and state the same pontiff writes as follows nor can we hope for happier results either for religion or for the civil government from the wishes of those who desire that the church be separated from the state and the concord between the secular and ecclesiastical authority be dissolved it is clear that these men who yearn for a shameless liberty live in dread of an agreement which has always been fraught with good and advantageous alike to sacred and civil interests to the like effect also as occasion presented itself did pius the ninth brand publicly many false opinions which were gaining ground and afterwards ordered them to be condensed in summary form in order that in this sea of error catholics might have a light which they might safely follow footnote it will suffice to indicate a few of them proposition nineteen the church is not a true perfect and wholly independent society possessing its own unchanging rights conferred upon it by its divine founder but it is for the civil power to determine what are the rights of the church and the limits within which it may use them proposition thirty nine the state as the origin and source of all rights enjoys a right that is unlimited proposition fifty five the church must be separated from the state and the state from the church proposition seventy nine it is untrue that the civil liberty of every form of worship and the full power given to all of openly and publicly manifesting whatever opinions and thoughts lead to the more ready corruption of the minds and morals of the people and to the spread of the plague of religious indifference End of footnote. 
From these pronouncements of the Pope, it is evident that the origin of public power is to be sought for in God himself, and not in the multitude, and that it is repugnant to reason to allow free scope for sedition. Again, that it is not lawful for the state, any more than for the individual, either to disregard all religious duties, or to hold in equal favor different kinds of religion, that the unrestrained freedom of thinking and of openly making known one's thoughts is not inherent in the rights of citizens, and is by no means to be reckoned worthy of favor and support. In like manner, it is to be understood that the Church, no less than the State itself, is a society perfect in its own nature and its own right, and that those who exercise sovereignty ought not to act as to compel the Church to become subservient or subject to them, or to hamper her liberty in the management of her own affairs or to despoil her in any way of the other privileges conferred upon her by Jesus Christ. In matters, however, of mixed jurisdiction, it is in the highest degree consonant to nature, as also to the designs of God, that so far from one of the powers separating itself from the other, or still less coming into conflict with it, complete harmony, such as is suited to the end for which each power exists, should be preserved between them. This, then, is the teaching of the Catholic Church concerning the constitution and government of the state. By the words and decrees just cited, if judged dispassionately, no one of the several forms of government is in itself condemned, inasmuch as none of them contains anything contrary to Catholic doctrine, and all of them are capable, if wisely and justly managed, to ensure the welfare of the state. Neither is it blameworthy in itself, in any manner, for the people to have a share, greater or less, in the government. For at certain times, and under certain laws, such participation may not only be of benefit to the citizens, but may even be of obligation. Nor is there any reason why any one should accuse the Church of being wanting in gentleness of action, or largeness of view, or of being opposed to real and lawful liberty. The Church, indeed, deems it unlawful to place the various forms of divine worship on the same footing as the true religion, but does not, on that account, condemn those rulers who, for the sake of securing some great good, or of hindering some great evil, allow patiently custom or usage to be a kind of sanction for each kind of religion, having its place in the state. And, in fact, the Church is wont to take earnest heed that no one shall be forced to embrace the Catholic faith against his will, for as St. Augustine wisely reminds us, man cannot believe otherwise than of his own free will. In the same way, the Church cannot approve of that liberty which begets a contempt of the most sacred laws of God, and casts off the obedience due to lawful authority. For this is not liberty so much as license, and is most correctly styled by St. Augustine, the liberty of self-ruin, and by the Apostle St. Peter, the cloak of malice. Indeed, since it is opposed to reason, it is a true slavery, for whomsoever committeth sin is the slave of sin. On the other hand, that liberty is truly genuine, and to be sought after, which in regard to the individual does not allow men to be the slaves of air and of passion, the worst of all masters, which, too, in public administration, guides the citizens in wisdom and provides for them increased means of well-being, and which, further, protects the state from foreign interference. This honorable liberty, alone worthy of human beings, the Church approves most highly, and has never slackened her endeavor to preserve, strong and unchanged, among nations. And in truth, whatever in the state is of chief avail for the common welfare, whatever has been usefully established to curb the license of rulers who are opposed to the true interests of the people, or to keep in check the leading authorities from unwarrantably interfering in municipal or family affairs. Whatever tends to uphold the honor, manhood, and equal rights of individual citizens. Of all these things, as the monuments of past ages bear witness, the Catholic Church has always been the originator, the promoter, or the guardian. Ever therefore consistent with herself, while on the other hand she rejects the exorbitant liberty which in individuals and in nations ends in license or in thraldom. On the other hand, she willingly and most gladly welcomes whatever improvements the age brings forth, if these really secure the prosperity of life here below, which is, as it were, a stage in the journey to life that will know no ending. 
Therefore, when it is said that the Church is jealous of modern political systems, and that she repudiates the discoveries of modern research, the charge is a ridiculous and groundless calumny. Wild opinions she does repudiate, wicked and seditious projects she does condemn, together with that habit of mind which points to the beginning of a willful departure from God. But as all truth must necessarily proceed from God, the Church recognizes in all truth that is reached by research a trace of the divine intelligence. And as all truth in the natural order is powerless to destroy belief in the teachings of revelation, but can do much to confirm it, and as every newly discovered truth may serve to further the knowledge or the praise of God, it follows that whatsoever spreads the range of knowledge will always be willingly and even joyfully welcomed by the Church. She will always encourage and promote, as she does in other branches of knowledge, all study occupied with the investigation of nature. In these pursuits, should the human intellect discover anything not known before, the Church makes no opposition. She never objects to search being made for things that minister to the refinements and comforts of life. So far indeed from opposing these, she is now, as she ever has been, hostile alone to indolence and sloth, and earnestly wishes that the talents of men may bear more and more abundant fruit by cultivation and exercise. Moreover, she gives encouragement to every kind of art and handicraft, and through her influence, directing all strivings after progress towards virtue and salvation, she labors to prevent man's intellect and industry from turning him away from God and from heavenly things. All this, though so reasonable and full of counsel, finds little favor nowadays when states not only refuse to conform to the rule of Christian wisdom, but seem even anxious to receive from them further and further on each successive day. Nevertheless, since truth, when brought to light, is wont, of its own nature, to spread itself far and wide, and gradually take possession of the minds of men, we, moved by the great and holy duty of our apostolic mission to all nations, speak, as we are bound to do, with freedom. Our eyes are not closed to the spirit of the times. We repudiate not the assured and useful improvements of our age, but devoutly wish affairs of state to take a safer course than they are now taking, and to rest on a more firm foundation without injury to the true freedom of the people. For the best parent and guardian of liberty amongst men is truth. The truth shall make you free. If in the difficult times in which our lot is cast, Catholics will give ear to us, as it behooves them to do, they will readily see what are the duties of each one in matters of opinion as well as action. As regards opinion, whatever the Roman pontiffs have hitherto taught, or shall hereafter teach, must be held with a firm grasp of the mind, and so often as occasion requires, must be openly professed. Especially with reference to the so-called liberties, which are so greatly coveted in these days, all must stand by the judgment of the apostolic see, and have the same mind. Let no man be deceived by the outward appearance of these liberties, but let each one reflect whence these have had their origin, and by what efforts they are everywhere upheld and promoted. Experience has made us well acquainted with their results to the state, since everywhere they have borne fruits which the good and wise bitterly deplore. If there really exists anywhere, or if we in imagination conceive, a state waging wanton and tyrannical war against Christianity, and if we compare with it the modern form of government just described, this latter may seem the more endurable of the two. Yet, undoubtedly, the principles on which such a government is grounded are, as we have said, of a nature which no one can approve. Secondly, action may relate to private and domestic matters, or to matters public. As to private affairs, the first duty is to conform life and conduct to the gospel precepts, and to refuse to shrink from this duty when Christian virtue demands some sacrifice, difficult to make. All, moreover, are bound to love the church as their common mother, to obey her laws, promote her honor, defend her rights, and to endeavor to make her respected and loved by those over whom they have authority. It is also of great moment to the public welfare to take a prudent part in the business of municipal administration, and to endeavor above all to introduce effectual measures, so that, as becomes a Christian people, 
public provision may be made for the instruction of youth in religion and true morality upon these things the well-being of every state greatly depends furthermore it is in general fitting and salutary that catholics should extend their efforts beyond this restricted sphere and give their attention to national politics we say in general because these our precepts are addressed to all nations however it may in some places be true that for most urgent and just reasons it is by no means expedient for catholics to engage in public affairs or to take an active part in politics nevertheless as we have laid down to take no share in public matters would be equally as wrong we speak in general as not to have concern for or not to bestow labor upon the common good and this all the more because catholics are admonished by the very doctrines which they profess to be upright and faithful in the discharge of duty while if they hold aloft men whose principles offer but small guarantee for the welfare of the state will the more readily seize the reins of government this would tend also to the injury of the christian religion for as much as those would come into power who are badly disposed towards the church and those who are willing to befriend her will be deprived of all influence it follows therefore clearly that catholics have just reason for taking part in the conduct of public affairs for in doing so they assume not the responsibility of approving what is blameworthy in the actual methods of government but seek to turn these very methods so far as is possible to the genuine and true public good and to use their best endeavors at the same time to infuse as it were into all the veins of the state the healthy sap and blood of christian wisdom and virtue the morals and ambitions of the heathens differed widely from those of the gospel yet christians were to be seen living undefiled everywhere in the midst of pagan superstition and while always true to themselves coming to the front boldly whenever an opening was presented models of loyalty to their rulers submissive as far as was permitted to the sovereign power they shed around them on every side a halo of sanctity they strove to be helpful to their brethren and to attract others to the wisdom of jesus christ yet were bravely ready to withdraw from public life nay even to lay down their life if they could not without loss of virtue retain honours dignities and offices for this reason christian ways and manners speedily found their way not only into private houses but into the camp the senate and even the imperial palaces we are but of yesterday wrote tertullian yet we swarm in all your institutions we crowd your cities islands villages towns assemblies the army itself your wards and corporations the palace the senate and the law courts so that the christian faith when once it became lawful to make public profession of the gospel appeared in most of the cities of europe not like an infant crying in its cradle but already grown up and full of vigour in those our days it is well to revive these examples of our forefathers first and foremost it is the duty of all catholics worthy of the name and wishful to be known as most loving children of the church to reject without swerving whatever is inconsistent with so fair a title to make use of popular institutions so far as can honestly be done for the advancement of truth and righteousness to strive that liberty of action shall not transgress the bounds marked out by nature and the law of god to endeavour to bring back all civil society to the pattern and form of christianity which we have described it is barely possible to lay down any fixed method by which such purposes are to be attained because the means adopted must suit places and times widely different from one another nevertheless above all things unity of aim must be preserved and similarity must be sought after in all plans of action both these objects will be carried into effect without fail if all will follow the guidance of the apostolic see as their rule of life and obey the bishops whom the holy ghost has placed to rule the church of god the defence of catholicism indeed necessarily demands that in the profession of doctrines taught by the church all shall be of one mind and all steadfast in believing and care must be taken never to connive in any way at false opinions never to withstand them less strenuously than truth allows in mere matters of opinion it is permissible to discuss things with moderation with a desire of searching into the truth 
without unjust suspicion or angry recrimination. Hence, lest concord be broken by rash charges, let this be understood by all, that the integrity of Catholic faith cannot be reconciled with opinions verging on naturalism or rationalism, the essence of which is utterly to sterilize Christianity and to install in society the supremacy of man to the exclusion of God. Further, it is unlawful to follow one line of conduct in private and another in public, respecting privately the authority of the Church, but publicly rejecting it. For this would amount to joining together good and evil, and to putting man in conflict with himself, whereas he ought always to be consistent, and never in the least point, nor in any condition of life, to swerve from Christian virtue. But in matters merely political, as, for instance, the best form of government, and this or that system of administration, a difference of opinion is lawful. Those, therefore, whose piety is in other respects known, and whose minds are ready to accept, in all obedience, the decrees of the apostolic see, cannot in justice be accounted as bad men, because they disagree as to subjects. We have mentioned, and still graver wrongs will be done them, if, as we have more than once perceived with regret, they are seemed of violating, or of wavering in, the Catholic faith. Cannot injustice be accounted as bad men, because they disagree as to subjects we have mentioned, and still graver wrong will be done them, if, as we have more than once perceived with regret, they are accused of violating, or of wavering in, the Catholic faith. Let this be well borne in mind, by all who are in the habit of publishing their opinions, and above all by journalists. In the endeavor to secure interests of the higher order, there is no room for intestine strife or party rivalries, since all should aim with one mind and purpose to make safe that which is the common object of all, the maintenance of religion and of the state. If, therefore, there have hitherto been dissensions, let them henceforth be gladly buried in oblivion. If rash or injurious acts have been committed, whoever may have been at fault, let mutual charity make amends, and let the past be redeemed by a special submission of all to the apostolic see. In this way, Catholics will attain two most excellent results. They will become helpers to the Church in preserving and propagating Christian wisdom, and they will confer the greatest benefit on civil society, the safety of which is exceedingly imperiled by evil teachings and bad passions. This, venerable brethren, is what we have thought it our duty to expound to all nations of the Catholic world, touching the Christian constitution of states and the duties of individual citizens. It behooves us now, with earnest prayer, to implore the protection of heaven, beseeching God, who alone can enlighten the minds of men and move their will, to bring about these happy ends for which we yearn and strive, for his greater glory and the general salvation of mankind. As a happy augury of the divine benefits, and in token of our paternal benevolence to you, venerable brothers, and to the clergy, and to the whole people, committed to your charge and vigilance, we grant lovingly in the Lord the apostolic benediction. End of section 6section seven of the great encyclical letters of pope leo the thirteenth this LibriVox recording is in the public domain human liberty encyclical letter libertas praestantissimum june twentieth eighteen eighty eight liberty the highest of natural endowment being the portion only of intellectual or rational natures confers on man this dignity that he is in the hand of his counsel and his power over his actions but the manner in which such dignity is exercised is of the greatest moment inasmuch as on the use that is made of liberty the highest good and the greatest evil alike depend man indeed is free to obey his reason to seek moral good and to strive unswervingly after his last end yet he is free also to turn aside to all other things and in pursuing the empty semblance of good to disturb rightful order and to fall headlong into the destruction which he has voluntarily chosen the redeemer of mankind jesus christ 
having restored and exalted the original dignity of nature vouchsafed special assistance to the will of man and by the gifts of his grace here and the promise of heavenly bliss hereafter he raised it to a nobler state in like manner the great gift of nature has ever been and always will be deservingly cherished by the catholic church for to her alone has been committed the charge of handing down to all ages the benefits purchased for us by jesus christ yet there are many who imagine that the church is hostile to human liberty having a false and absurd notion as to what liberty is either they pervert the very idea of freedom or they extend it at their pleasure to many things in respect of which man cannot rightly be regarded as free we have on other occasions and especially in our encyclical letter immortali dei in treating of the so-called modern liberties distinguish between their good and evil elements and we have shown that whatsoever is good in those liberties is as ancient as truth itself and that the church has always most willingly approved and practised that good but whatsoever has been added as new is to tell the plain truth of a vitiated kind the fruit of the disorders of the age and of an insatiate longing after novelties seeing however that many cling so obstinately to their own opinion in this matter as to imagine these modern liberties cankered as they are to be the greatest glory of our age and the very basis of civil life without which no perfect government can be conceived we feel it a pressing duty for the sake of the common good to treat separately of this subject it is with moral liberty whether in individuals or in communities that we proceed at once to deal but first of all it will be well to speak briefly of natural liberty for though it is distinct and separate from moral liberty natural freedom is the fountainhead which liberty of whatsoever kind flows suavi suaque sponte the unanimous consent and judgment of men which is the trusty voice of nature recognizes this natural liberty in those only who are endowed with intelligence or reason and it is by his use of this that man is rightly regarded as responsible for his actions for while other animate creatures follow their senses seeking good and avoiding evil only by instinct man has reason to guide him in each and every act of his life reason sees that whatever things that are held to be good upon earth may exist or may not and discerning that none of them are of necessity for us it leaves the will free to choose what it pleases but man can judge of this contingency as we say only because he has a soul that is simple spiritual and intellectual a soul therefore which is not produced by matter and does not depend on matter for its existence but which is created immediately by god and far surpassing the condition of things material has a life and action of its own so that knowing the unchangeable and necessary reasons of what is true and good it sees that no particular kind of good is necessary to us when therefore it is established that man's soul is immortal and endowed with reason and not bound up with things material the foundation of natural liberty is at once most firmly laid as the catholic church declares in the strongest terms the simplicity spirituality and immortality of the soul so with unequalled constancy and publicity she ever also asserts its freedom these truths she has always taught and has sustained them as a dogma of faith and whenever heretics or innovators have attacked the liberty of man the church has defended it and protected this noble possession from destruction history bears witness to the energy with which she met the fury of the manichaeans and others like them and the earnestness with which in later years she defended human liberty in the council of trent and against the followers of jansenius is known to all at no time and in no place has she held truce with fatalism liberty then as we have said belongs only to those who have the gift of reason or intelligence considered as to its nature it is the faculty of choosing means fitted for the end proposed for he is master of his actions who can choose one thing out of many now since everything chosen as a means is viewed as good or useful 
and since good as such is the proper object of our desire it follows that freedom of choice is a property of the will or rather is identical with the will in so far as it has its action and faculty of choice but the will cannot proceed to act until it is enlightened by the knowledge possessed by the intellect in other words the good wished by the will is necessarily good in so far as it is known by the intellect and this the more because in all voluntary acts choice is subsequent to a judgment upon the truth of the good presented declaring to which good preference should be given no sensible man can doubt that judgment is an act of reason not of the will the end or object both of the rational will and of its liberty is that good only which is in conformity with reason since however both these faculties are imperfect it is impossible as is often seen that the reason should propose something which is not really good but which has the appearance of good and that the will should choose accordingly for as a possibility of error and actual error are defects of the mind and attest its imperfection so the pursuit of what has a false appearance of good though a proof of our freedom just as a disease is a proof of our vitality implies defect in human liberty the will also simply because of its dependence on the reason no sooner desires anything contrary thereto than it abuses its freedom of choice and corrupts its very essence thus it is that the infinitely perfect god although supremely free because of the supremacy of his intellect and of his essential goodness nevertheless cannot choose evil neither can the angels and saints who enjoy the beatific vision st augustine and others urged most admirably against the pelagians that if the possibility of a deflection from good belong to the essence or perfection of liberty then god jesus christ and the angels and saints who have not this power would have no liberty at all or would have less liberty than man has in his state of pilgrimage and imperfection this subject is often discussed by the angelic doctor in his demonstration that the possibility of sinning is not freedom but slavery it will suffice to quote his subtle commentary on the words of our lord whosoever committed sin is the slave of sin everything he says is that which belongs to it naturally when therefore it acts through a power outside itself it does not act of itself but through another that is as a slave but man is by nature rational when therefore he acts according to reason he acts of himself and according to his free will and this is liberty whereas when he sins he acts in opposition to reason is moved by another and is the victim of foreign misapprehensions therefore whosoever commendeth sin is the slave of sin even the heathen philosophers clearly recognized this truth especially they who held that the wise man alone is free and by the term wise man was meant as is well known the man trained to live in accordance with his nature that is in justice and virtue such then being the condition of human liberty it necessarily stands in need of light and strength to direct its actions to good and to restrain them from evil without this the freedom of our will would be our ruin first of all there must be law that is a fixed rule of teaching what is to be done and what is to be left undone this rule cannot affect the lower animals in any true sense since they act of necessity following their natural instinct and cannot of themselves act in any other way on the other hand as was said above he who is free can either act or not act can do this or do that as he please because his judgment precedes his choice and his judgment not only decides what is right or wrong of its own nature but also what is practically good and therefore to be chosen and what is practically evil and therefore to be avoided in other words the reason prescribes to the will what it should seek after or shun in order to the eventual attainment of man's last end for the sake of which all his actions ought to be performed this ordination of reason is called law 
in man's free will therefore or in the moral necessity of our voluntary arts being in accordance with reason lies the very root of the necessity of law nothing more foolish can be uttered or conceived than the notion that because man is free by nature he is therefore exempt from law were this the case it would follow that to become free we must be deprived of reason whereas the truth is that we are bound to submit to law precisely because we are free by our very nature for law is the guide of man's actions it turns him toward good by its rewards and deters him from evil by its punishments foremost in this office comes the natural law which is written and engraved in the mind of every man and this is nothing but our reason commanding us to do right and forbidding sin nevertheless all prescriptions of human reasoning can have force of law only inasmuch as they are the voice and the interpreters of some higher power on which our reason and liberty necessarily depend for since the force of law consists in the imposing of obligations and the granting of rights authority is the one and only foundation of all law the power that is of fixing duties and defining rights as also of assigning the necessary sanctions of reward and chastisement to each and all of its commands but all this clearly cannot be found in man if as his own supreme legislator he is to be the rule of his own actions it follows therefore that the law of nature is the same thing as the eternal law implanted in rational creatures and inclining them to their right action and end and can be nothing else but the eternal reason of god the creator and ruler of all the world to this rule of action and restraint of evil god has felt safe to give special and most suitable aids for strengthening and ordering the human will the first and most excellent of these is the power of his divine grace whereby the mind can be enlightened and the will wholesomely invigorated and moved to the constant pursuit of moral good so that the use of our inborn liberty becomes at once less difficult and less dangerous not that the divine assistance hinders in any way the free movement of our will just the contrary for grace works inwardly in man and in harmony with his natural inclinations since it flows from the very creature of his mind and will by whom all things are moved in conformity with their nature as the angelic doctor points out it is because divine grace comes from the author of nature that it is so admirably adapted to be the safeguard of all nature and to maintain the character efficiency and operations of each foremost in this office comes the natural law which is written and engraved in the mind of every man and this is nothing but our reason commanding us to do right and forbidding sin nevertheless all prescriptions of human reason can have force of law only inasmuch as they are the voice and the interpreters of some higher power on which our reason and liberty necessarily depend for since the force of law consists in the imposing of obligations and the granting of rights authority is the one and only foundation of all law the power that is of fixing duties and defining rights as also of assigning the necessary sanctions of reward and chastisement to each and all of its commands but all this clearly cannot be found in man if as his own supreme legislator he is to be the rule of his own actions it follows therefore that the law of nature is the same thing as the eternal law implanted in rational creatures and inclining them to their right action and end and can mean nothing else but the eternal reason of god the creator and ruler of all the world to this rule of action and restraint of evil god has felt safe to give special and most suitable aids for strengthening and ordering the human will the first and most excellent of these is the power of his divine grace whereby the mind can be enlightened and the will wholesomely invigorated and moved to the constant pursuit of moral good so that the use of our inborn liberty becomes at once less difficult and less dangerous not that the divine assistance hinders in any way the free movement of our will just the contrary for grace works inwardly in man and in harmony with his natural inclinations since it flows from the very creator of his mind and will by whom all things are moved in conformity with their nature as the angelic doctor points out 
it is because divine grace comes from the author of nature that it is so admirably adapted to be the safeguard of all natures and to maintain the character efficiency and operations of each what has been said of the liberty of individuals is no less applicable to them when considered as bound together in civil society for what reason and the natural law do for individuals that human law promulgated for their good does for the citizens of states of the laws enacted by men some are concerned with what is good or bad by its very nature and they command men to follow after what is right and to shun what is wrong adding at the same time a suitable sanction but such laws by no means derive their origin from civil society because just as civil society did not create human nature so neither can it be said to be the author of the good which befits human nature or of the evil which is contrary to it laws come before men live together in society and have their origin in the natural and consequently in the eternal law the precepts therefore of the natural law contained bodily in the laws of men have not merely the force of human law but they possess that higher and more august sanction which belongs to the law of nature and the eternal law and within the sphere of this kind of laws the duty of the civil legislator is mainly to keep the community in obedience by the adoption of a common discipline and by putting restraint upon refractory and viciously inclined men so that deterred from evil they may turn to what is good or at any rate may avoid causing trouble and disturbance to the state now there are other enactments of the civil authority which do not follow directly but somewhat remotely from the natural law and decide many points which the law of nature treats only in a general and indefinite way for instance though nature commands all to contribute to the public peace and prosperity still whatever belongs to the manner and circumstances and conditions under which such service is to be rendered must be determined by the wisdom of men and not by nature herself it is in the constitution of these particular rules of life suggested by reason and prudence and put forth by competent authority that human law properly so called consists binding on all citizens to work together for the attainment of the common end proposed to the community and forbidding them to depart from this end and in so far as human law is in conformity with the dictates of nature leading to what is good and deterring from evil from this it is manifest that the eternal law of god is the sole standard and rule of human liberty not only in each individual man but also in the community and civil society which men constitute when united therefore the true liberty of human society does not consist in every man doing what he pleases for this would simply end in turmoil and confusion and bring on the overthrow of the state but rather in this that through the injunctions of the civil law all may more easily conform to the prescriptions of the eternal law likewise the liberty of those who are in authority does not consist in the power to lay unreasonable and capricious commands upon their subjects which would equally be criminal and would lead to the ruin of the commonwealth but the binding force of human laws is in this that they are to be regarded as applications of the eternal law and incapable of sanctioning anything which is not contained in the eternal law as in the principle of all law thus saint augustine most wisely says i think that you can see at the same time that there is nothing just and lawful in that temporal law unless what men have gathered from this eternal law if then by any one in authority something be sanctioned out of conformity with the principles of right reason and consequently hurtful to the commonwealth such an enactment can have no binding force of law as being no rule of justice but certain to lead men away from that good which is the very end of civil society therefore the nature of human liberty however it be considered whether in individuals or in society whether in those who command or in those who obey supposes the necessity of obedience to some supreme and eternal law which is in no other than the authority of god commanding good and forbidding evil and so far from this most just authority of god over men diminishing or even destroying their liberty 
it protects and perfects it for the real perfection of all creatures is found in the prosecution and attainment of their respective ends but the supreme end to which human liberty must aspire is god these precepts of the truest and highest teaching made known to us by the light of reason itself the church instructed by the example and doctrine of her divine author has ever propagated and asserted for she has ever made them the measure of her office and of her teaching to the christian nations as to morals the laws of the gospel not only immeasurably surpass the wisdom of the heathen but are an invitation and an introduction to a state of holiness unknown to the ancients and bringing man nearer to god they make him at once the possessor of a more perfect liberty thus the powerful influence of the church has ever been manifested in the custody and protection of the civil and political liberty of the people the enumeration of its merits in this respect does not belong to our present purpose it is sufficient to recall the fact that slavery the old reproach of the heathen nations was mainly abolished by the beneficent efforts of the church the impartiality of law and the true brotherhood of man were first asserted by jesus christ and his apostles re-echoed his voice when they declared that in future there was to be neither jew nor gentile nor barbarian nor scythian but all were brothers in christ so powerful so conspicuous in this respect is the influence of the church that experience abundantly testifies how savage customs are no longer possible in any land where she has once set her foot but that gentleness speedily takes the place of cruelty and the light of truth quickly dispels the darkness of barbarism nor has the church been less lavish in the benefits she has conferred on civilized nations in every age either by resisting the tyranny of the wicked or by protecting the innocent and helpless from injury or finally by using her influence in the support of any form of government which commended itself to the citizens at home because of its justice or was feared by their enemies without because of its power moreover the highest duty is to respect authority and obediently to submit to just law and by this the members of a community are effectually protected from the wrongdoing of evil men lawful power is from god and whosoever resisteth authority resisteth the ordinance of god wherefore obedience is greatly ennobled when subjected to an authority which is the most just and supreme of all but where the power to command is wanting or where a law is enacted contrary to reason or to the eternal law or to some ordinance of god obedience is unlawful lest while obeying man we become disobedient to god thus an effectual barrier being opposed to tyranny the authority in the state will not have all its own way but the interests and rights of all will be safeguarded the rights of individuals of domestic society and of all the members of the commonwealth all being free to live according to law and right reason and in this as we have shown true liberty really consists if when men discuss the question of liberty they were careful to grasp its true and legitimate meaning such as reason and reasoning have just explained they would never venture to affix such a calumny on the church as to assert that she is the foe to individual and public liberty but many there are who follow in the footsteps of lucifer and adopt as their own his rebellious cry i will not serve and consequently substitute for true liberty what is sheer and most foolish license such for instance are the men belonging to that widely spread and powerful organization who usurping the name of liberty style themselves liberals what naturalists or rationalists aim at in philosophy that the supporters of liberalism carry out the principle laid down by naturalism are attempting in the domain of morality and politics the fundamental doctrine of rationalism is the supremacy of the human reason which refusing due submission to the divine and eternal reason proclaims its own independence and constitutes itself the supreme principle and source and judge of truth hence these followers of liberalism deny the existence of any divine authority to which obedience is due and proclaim that every man is the law to himself from which arises that ethical system which they style independent morality 
and which under the guise of liberty exonerates man from any obedience to the commands of god and substitutes a boundless license the end of all this it is not difficult to foresee especially when society is in question for when once man is firmly persuaded that he is subject to no one it follows that the efficient cause of the unity of civil society is not to be sought in any principle external to man or superior to him but simply in the free will of individuals that the authority in the state comes from the people only and that just as every man's individual reason is his own rule of life so the collective reason of the community should be the supreme guide in the management of all public affairs hence the doctrine of supremacy of the greater number and that all right and all duty reside in the majority but from what has been said it is clear that all this is in contradiction to reason to refuse any bond of union between man and civil society on the one hand and god the creator and consequently the supreme lawgiver on the other is plainly repugnant to the nature not only of man but of all created things for of necessity all effects must in some proper way be connected with their cause and it belongs to the perfection of every nature to contain itself within that sphere and grade which the order of nature has assigned to it namely that the lower should be subject and obedient to the higher moreover besides this a doctrine of such character is most hurtful both to individuals and to the state for once ascribed to human reason the only authority to decide what is true and what is good and the real distinction between good and evil is destroyed honor and dishonor differ not in their nature but in the opinion and judgment of each one pleasure in the measure of what is lawful and given a code of morality which can have little or no power to restrain or quiet the unruly propensities of man a way is naturally open to universal corruption with reference also to public affairs authority is severed from the true and natural principle whence it derives all its efficacy for the common good and the law determining what it is right to do and avoid doing is at the mercy of a majority now this is simply a road leading straight to tyranny the empire of god over man and civil society once repudiated it follows that religion as a public institution can have no claim to exist and that everything that belongs to religion will be treated with complete indifference furthermore with ambitious designs on sovereignty tumult and sedition will be common amongst the people and when duty and conscience cease to appeal to them there will be nothing to hold them back but force which of itself alone is powerless to keep their covetousness in check of this we have almost daily evidence in the conflict with socialists and members of other seditious societies who labor unceasingly to bring about revolution it is for those then who are capable of forming a just estimate of things to decide whether such doctrines promote that true liberty which alone is worthy of man or rather pervert and destroy it there are indeed some adherents of liberalism who do not subscribe to these opinions which we have seen to be fearful in their enormity openly opposed to the truth and the cause of most terrible evils indeed very many amongst them compelled by the force of truth do not hesitate to admit that such liberty is vicious nay is simple license whenever intemperate in its claims to the neglect of truth and justice and therefore they would have liberty ruled and directed by right reason and consequently subject to the natural law and to the divine eternal law and here they think they may stop holding that man as a free being is bound by no law of god except such as he makes known to us through our natural reason in this they are plainly inconsistent for if as they must admit and no one can rightly deny the will of the divine lawgiver is to be obeyed because every man is under the power of god and tends toward him as his end it follows that no one can assign limits to his legislative authority without failing in the obedience which is due indeed if the human mind be so presumptuous as to define the nature and extent of god's rights and its own duties reverence for the divine law will be apparent rather than real and arbitrary judgment will prevail over the authority and providence of god man must therefore take his standard of a loyal and religious life from the eternal law 
and from all and every one of those laws which god in his infinite wisdom and power has been pleased to enact and to make known to us by such clear and unmistakable signs as to leave no room for doubt and the more so because laws of this kind have the same origin the same author as the eternal law are absolutely in accordance with right reason and perfect the natural law these laws it is that embody the government of god who graciously guides and directs both the intellect and the will of man lest these fall into error let then that continue to remain in a holy and inviolable union which neither can nor should be separated and in all things for this is the dictate of right reason itself let god be dutifully and obediently served there are others somewhat more moderate though not more consistent who affirm that the morality of individuals is to be guided by the divine law but not the morality of the state so that in public affairs the commands of god may be passed over and may be entirely disregarded in the framing of laws hence follows the fatal theory of the need of separation between church and state but the absurdity of such a position is manifest nature herself proclaims the necessity of the state providing means and opportunities whereby the community may be enabled to live properly that is to say according to the laws of god for since god is the source of all goodness and justice it is absolutely ridiculous that the state should pay no attention to these laws or render them abortive by contrary enactments besides those who are in authority owe it to the commonwealth not only to provide for its external well-being and the conveniences of life but still more to consult the welfare of men's souls in the wisdom of their legislation but for the increase of such benefits nothing more suitable can be conceived than the laws which have god for their author and therefore they who in their government of the state take no account of these laws abuse political power by causing it to deviate from its proper end and from what nature itself prescribes and what is still more important and what we have more than once pointed out although the civil authority has not the same proximate end as the spiritual nor proceeds on the same line nevertheless in the exercise of their separate powers they must occasionally meet for their subjects are the same and not infrequently they deal with the same objects though in different ways whenever this occurs since a state of conflict is absurd and manifestly repugnant to the most wise ordinance of god there must necessarily exist some order or mode of procedure to remove the occasions of difference and contention and to secure harmony in all things this harmony has been not inaptly compared to that which exists between the body and the soul for the well-being of both one and the other the separation of which brings irremediable harm to the body since it extinguishes its very life to make this more evident the growth of liberty ascribed to our age must be considered apart in its various details and first let us examine that liberty in individuals which is so opposed to the virtue of religion namely the liberty of worship as it is called this is based on the principle that every man is free to profess as he may choose any religion or none but assuredly of all the duties which man has to fulfil that without doubt is the chiefest and holiest which commands him to worship god with devotion and piety this follows of necessity from the truth that we are ever in the power of god are ever guided by his will and providence and having come forth from him must return to him add to which no true virtue can exist without religion for moral virtue is concerned with those things which lead to god as man's supreme and ultimate good and therefore religion which as st thomas says performs those actions which are directly and immediately ordained for the divine honor rules and tempers all virtues and if it be asked which of the many conflicting religions it is necessary to adopt reason and the natural law unhesitatingly tell us to practise that one which god enjoins and which men can easily recognise by certain exterior notes whereby divine providence has willed that it should be distinguished because in a matter of such moment the most terrible loss will be the consequence of error 
wherefore when a liberty such as we have described is offered to man the power is given him to pervert or abandon with impunity the most sacred of duties and to exchange the unchangeable good for evil which as we have said is no liberty but its degradation and the abject submission of the soul to sin this kind of liberty if considered in relation to the state clearly implies that there is no reason why the state should offer any homage to god or should desire any public recognition of him that no one form of worship is to be preferred to another but that all stand on an equal footing no account being taken of the religion of the people even if they profess the catholic faith but to justify this it must needs be taken as true that the state has no duties towards god or that such duties if they exist can be abandoned with impunity both of which assertions are manifestly false for it cannot be doubted but that by the will of god men are united in the civil society whether its component parts be considered or its form which implies authority or the object of its existence or the abundance of the vast services which it renders to man god it is who has made man for society and has placed him in the company of others like himself so that what was wanting to his nature and beyond his attainment if left to his own resources he might obtain by association with others wherefore civil society must acknowledge god as its founder and parent and must obey and reverence his power and authority justice therefore forbids and reason itself forbids the state to be godless or to adopt a line of action which would end in godlessness namely to treat the various religions as they call them alike and to bestow upon them promiscuously equal rights and privileges since then the religion must be professed which alone is true and which can be recognized without difficulty especially in catholic states because the marks of truth are as it were engraven upon it this religion therefore the rulers of the state must preserve and protect if they would provide as they should do with prudence and usefulness for the good of the community for public authority exists for the welfare of those whom it governs and although its proximate end is to lead men to the prosperity found in this life yet in so doing it ought not to diminish but rather to increase man's capability of attaining to the supreme good in which his everlasting happiness consists which never can be attained if religion be disregarded all this however we have explained more fully elsewhere and we now only wish to add the remark that liberty of so false a nature is greatly hurtful to the true liberty of both rulers and their subjects religion of its essence is wonderfully helpful to the state for since it derives the prime origin of all power directly from god himself with grave authority it charges rulers to be mindful of their duty to govern without injustice or severity to rule their people kindly and with almost paternal charity it admonishes subjects to be obedient to lawful authority as to the ministers of god and it binds them to their rulers not merely by obedience but by reverence and affection forbidding all seditions and venturesome enterprises calculated to disturb public order and tranquillity and cause greater restrictions to be put upon the liberty of the people we need not mention how greatly religion conduces to pure morals and pure morals to liberty reason shows and history confirms the fact that the higher the morality of states the greater are the liberty and wealth and power which they enjoy we must now consider briefly liberty of speech and liberty of the press it is hardly necessary to say that there can be no such right as this if it be not used in moderation and if it pass beyond the bounds and end of all true liberty for right is a moral power which as we have before said and must again and again repeat is absurd to suppose that nature has accorded indifferently to truth and falsehood to justice and injustice men have a right freely and prudently to propagate throughout the state what things soever are true and honourable so that as many as possible may possess them but lying opinions than which no mental plague is greater 
and vices which corrupt the heart and moral life should be diligently repressed by public authority lest they insidiously work the ruin of the state the excesses of an unbridled intellect which unfailingly end in the oppression of the untutored multitude are no less rightly controlled by the authority of the law than are the injuries inflicted by violence upon the weak and this all the more surely because by far the greater part of the community is either absolutely unable or able only with great difficulty to escape from illusions and deceitful subtleties especially such as flatter the passions if unbridled license of speech and of writing be granted to all nothing will remain sacred and inviolate even the highest and truest mandates of nature justly held to be the common and noblest heritage of the human race will not be spared thus truth being gradually obscured by darkness perniciousness and manifold error as too often happens will easily prevail thus too license will gain what liberty loses for liberty will ever be more free and secure in proportion as license is kept in fuller restraint in regard however to all matters of opinion which god leaves to man's free discussion full liberty of thought and of speech is naturally within the right of every one for such liberty never leads men to suppress the truth but often to discover it and make it known a like judgment must be passed upon what is called liberty of teaching there can be no doubt that truth alone should imbue the minds of men for in it are found the well-being the end and the perfection of every intelligent nature and therefore nothing but truth should be taught to the ignorant and to the educated so as to bring knowledge to those who have it not and to preserve it in those who possess it for this reason it is plainly the duty of all who teach to banish error from the mind and by short safeguards to close the entry to all false convictions from this it follows as is evident that the liberty of which we have been speaking is greatly opposed to reason and tends absolutely to pervert men's minds inasmuch as it claims for itself the right of teaching whatever it pleases a liberty which the state cannot grant without failing in its duty and the more so because the authority of teachers has great weight with their hearers who can readily decide for themselves as to the truth or falsehood of the instruction given to them wherefore this liberty also in order that it may deserve the name must be kept within certain limits lest the office of teaching be turned with impunity into an instrument of corruption now truth which should be the only subject matter of those who teach is of two kinds natural and supernatural of natural truths such as the principles of nature and whatever is derived from them immediately by our reason there is a kind of common patrimony in the human race on this as on a firm basis morality justice religion and the very bonds of human society rest and to allow people to go unharmed who violate or destroy it would be most impious most foolish and most inhuman but with no less religious care must we preserve that great and sacred treasure of the truths which god himself has taught us by many and convincing arguments often used by defenders of christianity certain leading truths have been laid down namely that some things have been revealed by god that the only begotten son of god was made flesh to bear witness to the truth that a perfect society was founded by him the church namely of which he is the head and with which he has promised to abide till the end of the world to this society he entrusted all the truths which he had taught in order that it might keep and guard them and with lawful authority explain them and at the same time he commanded all nations to hear the voice of the church as if it were his own threatening those who would not hear it with everlasting perdition thus it is manifest that man's best and surest teacher is god the source and principle of all truth and the only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father the way the truth and the life the true light which enlightens every man and to whose teaching all must submit and they shall all be taught of god in faith and in the teaching of morality god himself made the church a partaker of his divine authority and through his heavenly gift she cannot be deceived 
she is therefore the greatest and most reliable teacher of mankind and in her dwells an inviolable right to teach them sustained by the truth received from her divine founder the church has ever sought to fulfil wholly the mission entrusted to her by god unconquered by the difficulties on all sides surrounding her she has never ceased to assert her liberty of teaching and in this way the wretched superstition of paganism being dispelled the wide world was renewed into christian wisdom now reason itself clearly teaches that the truths of divine revelation and those of nature cannot really be opposed to one another and that whatever is at variance with them must necessarily be false therefore the divine teaching of the church so far from being an obstacle to the pursuit of learning and the progress of science or in any way retarding the advance of civilization in reality brings to them the sure guidance of shining light and for the same reason it is of no small advantage for the perfecting of human liberty since our saviour jesus christ has said that by truth is man made free you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free therefore there is no reason why genuine liberty should grow indignant or true science feel aggrieved at having to bear the just and necessary restraint of laws by which in the judgment of the church and of reason itself human teaching has to be controlled the church indeed as facts have everywhere proved looks chiefly and above all to the defence of the christian faith while careful at the same time to foster and promote every kind of human learning for learning is in itself good and praiseworthy and desirable and further all erudition which is the outgrowth of sound reason and in conformity with the truth of things serves not a little to confirm what we believe on the authority of god the church truly to our great benefit has carefully preserved the monuments of ancient wisdom has opened everywhere homes of science and has urged on intellectual progress by fostering more diligently the arts by which the culture of our age is so much advanced lastly we must not forget that a vast field lies freely open to man's industry and genius containing all those things which have no necessary connection with christian faith and morals or as to which the church exercising no authority leaves the judgment of the learned free and unconstrained from all this may be understood the nature and character of that liberty which the followers of liberalism so eagerly advocate and proclaim on the one hand they demand for themselves and for the state a license which opens the way to every perversity of opinion and on the other they hamper the church in divers ways restricting her liberty within narrowest limits although from her teaching not only is there nothing to be feared but in every respect very much to be gained another liberty is widely advocated namely liberty of conscience if by this is meant that every one may as he chooses worship god or not it is sufficiently refuted by the arguments already adduced but it may also be taken to mean that every man in the state may follow the will of god and from a consciousness of duty and free from every obstacle obey his commands this indeed is true liberty a liberty worthy of the sons of god which nobly maintains the dignity of man and is stronger than all violence or wrong a liberty which the church has always desired and held most dear this is the kind of liberty the apostles claim for themselves with intrepid constancy which the apologists of christianity confirm by their writings and which the martyrs in vast numbers consecrated by their blood and deservedly so for this christian liberty bears witness to the absolute and most just dominion of god over man and to the chief and supreme duty of man towards god it has nothing in common with a seditious and rebellious mind and in no tittle derogates from obedience to public authority for the right to command and to require obedience exists only so far as it is in accordance with the authority of god and is within the measure that he has laid down but when anything is commanded which is plainly at variance with the will of god there is a wide departure from this divinely constituted order and at the same time a direct conflict with the divine authority therefore it is right not to obey by the patrons of liberalism however 
who make the state absolute and omnipotent, and proclaim that man should live altogether independently of God, the liberty of which we speak, which goes in hand with virtue and religion, is not admitted, and whatever is done for its preservation is accounted an injury and an offence against the state. Indeed, if what they say were really true, there would be no tyranny, no matter how monstrous, which we should not be bound to endure and submit to. The Church most earnestly desires that the Christian teaching, of which we have given an outline, should penetrate every rank of society, in reality and in practice. For it would be of the greatest efficacy in healing the evils of our day, which are neither few nor slight, and are the offspring in great part of the false liberty, which is so much extolled, and in which the germs of safety and glory were supposed to be contained. The hope has been disappointed by the result. The fruit, instead of being sweet and wholesome, has proved cankered and bitter. If then a remedy is desired, let it be sought for in a restoration of sound doctrine, from which alone the preservation of order and, as a consequence, the defense of true liberty can be confidently expected. Yet, with the discernment of a true mother, the Church weighs the great burden of human weakness, and well knows the course down which the minds and actions of men are in this our age being born. For this reason, while not conceding any right to anything save what is true and honest, she does not forbid public authority to tolerate what is at variance with truth and justice for the sake of avoiding some greater evil or of obtaining or preserving some greater good god himself in his providence though infinitely good and powerful permits evil to exist in the world partly that greater good may not be impeded and partly that greater evil may not ensue in the government of states it is not forbidden to imitate the ruler of the world and as the authority of man is powerless to prevent every evil, it has, as St. Augustine says, to overlook and leave unpunished many things which are punished, and rightly, by divine providence. But if, in such circumstances, for the sake of the common good, and this is the only legitimate reason, human law may or even should tolerate evil, it may not and should not approve or desire evil for its own sake. For evil of itself being a privation of good, is opposed to the common welfare, which every legislator is bound to desire and defend to the best of his ability. In this, human law must endeavor to imitate God, who, as St. Thomas teaches, in allowing evil to exist in the world, neither wills evil to be done, nor wills it not to be done, but wills only to permit it to be done, and this is good. This saying of the angelic doctor contains briefly the whole doctrine of the permission of evil. But, to judge aright, we must acknowledge that the more a state is driven to tolerate evil, the further is it from perfection, and that the tolerance of evil, which is dictated by political prudence, should be strictly confined to the limits which its justifying cause, the public welfare, requires. Wherefore, if such tolerance would be injurious to the public welfare, and entail greater evils on the state, it would not be lawful. For in such case the motive of good is wanting, and although in the extraordinary condition of these times the Church usually acquiesces in certain modern liberties, not because she prefers them in themselves, but because she judges it expedient to permit them, she would in happier times exercise her own liberty, and, by persuasion, exhortation, and entreaty, would endeavor, as she is bound, to fulfill the duty assigned to her by God of providing for the eternal salvation of mankind. One thing, however, remains always true, that the liberty which is claimed for all to do all things is not, as we have often said, of itself desirable, inasmuch as it is contrary to reason that error and truth should have equal rights. And as to tolerance, it is surprising how far removed from the equity and prudence of the Church are those who profess what is called liberalism. For, in allowing that boundless license of which we have spoken, they exceed all limits, and end at last by making no apparent distinction between truth and error, honesty and dishonesty. And because the Church, the pillar and ground of truth, and the unerring teacher of morals, is forced utterly to reprobate and condemn 
tolerance of such an abandoned and criminal character they calumniate her as being wanting in patience and gentleness and thus fail to see that in doing so they impute to her as a fault what is in reality a matter for commendation but in spite of all this show of tolerance it very often happens that while they profess themselves ready to lavish liberty on all in the greatest profusion they are utterly intolerant towards the catholic church by refusing to allow her the liberty of being herself free and now to reduce for clearness's sake to its principal heads all that has been set forth with its immediate conclusions the summing up is this briefly that man by a necessity of his nature is wholly subject to the most faithful and ever enduring power of god and that as a consequence any liberty except that which consists in submission to god and in subjection to his will is unintelligible to deny the existence of this authority in god or to refuse to submit to it means to act not as a free man but as one who treasonably abuses his liberty and in such a disposition of mind the chief and deadly vice of liberalism essentially consists the form however of the sin is manifold for in more ways and degrees than one can the will depart from the obedience which is due to god or to those who share the divine power for to reject the supreme authority of god and to cast off all obedience to him in public matters or even in private and domestic affairs is the greatest perversion of liberty and the worst kind of liberalism and what we have said must be understood to apply to this alone in its fullest sense next comes the system of those who admit indeed the duty of submitting to god the creator and ruler of the world and as much as all nature is dependent on his will but who boldly rejects all laws of faith and morals which are above natural reason but are revealed by the authority of god or who at least impudently assert that there is no reason why regard should be paid to these laws at any rate publicly by the state how mistaken these men also are and how inconsistent we have seen above from this teaching as from its source and principle flows that fatal principle of the separation of church and state whereas it is on the contrary clear that the two powers though dissimilar in functions and unequal in degree ought nevertheless to live in concord by harmony in their action and the faithful discharge of their respective duties but this teaching is understood in two ways many wish the state to be separated from the church wholly and entirely so that regard to every right of human society in institutions customs and laws the offices of state and the education of youth they would pay no more regard to the church than if she did not exist and at most would allow the citizens individually to attend to their religion in private if so minded against such as these all the arguments by which we disprove the principle of separation of church and state are conclusive with this superadded that it is absurd the citizen should respect the church while the state may hold her in contempt others oppose not the existence of the church nor indeed could they yet they despoil her of the nature and rights of a perfect society and maintain that it does not belong to her to legislate to judge or to punish but only to exhort to advise and to rule her subjects in accordance with their own consent and will by such opinion they pervert the nature of this divine society and attenuate and narrow its authority its office of teacher and its whole efficiency and at the same time they aggrandize the power of the civil government to such extent as to subject the church of god to the empire and sway of the state like any voluntary association of citizens to refute completely such teaching the arguments often used by the defenders of christianity and set forth by us especially in the encyclical letter immortali dei are of great avail for by those arguments it is proved that by a divine provision all the rights which essentially belong to a society that is legitimate supreme and perfect in all its parts exist in the church lastly there remain those who while they do not approve the separation of church and state think nevertheless that the church ought to adapt herself to the time and conform to what is required by the modern system of government such an opinion is sound if it is to be understood of some equitable adjustment consistent with truth and justice 
in so far namely that the church in the hope of some great good may show herself indulgent and may conform to the times in so far as her sacred office permits but it is not so in regard to practices and doctrines which a perversion of morals and a warped judgment have unlawfully introduced religion truth and justice must ever be maintained and as god has entrusted these great and sacred matters to the care of the church she can never be so unfaithful to her office as to dissemble in regard to what is false or unjust or to connive at what is hurtful to religion from what has been said it follows that it is quite unlawful to demand to defend or to grant unconditional freedom of thought of speech of writing or of worship as if these were so many rights given by nature to man for if nature had really granted them it would be lawful to refuse obedience to god and there would be no restraint on human liberty it likewise follows that freedom in these things may be tolerated wherever there is just cause but only with such moderation as will prevent its degenerating into license and excess and where such liberties are in use men should employ them in doing good and should estimate them as the church does for liberty is to be regarded as legitimate in so far only as it affords greater facility for doing good but no farther whenever there exists or there is reason to fear an unjust oppression of the people on the one hand or a deprivation of the liberty of the church on the other it is lawful to seek for such a change of government as will bring about due liberty of action in such case an excessive and vicious liberty is not sought for but only some relief for the common welfare in order that while license for evil is allowed by the state the power of doing good may not be hindered again it is not of itself wrong to prefer a democratic form of government if only the catholic doctrine be maintained as to the origin and exercise of power of the various forms of government the church does not reject any that are fitted to procure the welfare of the subject she wishes only and this nature itself requires that they should be constituted without involving wrong to any one and especially without violating the rights of the church unless it be otherwise determined by reason of some exceptionable condition of things it is expedient to take part in the administration of public affairs and the church approves of every one devoting his services to the common good and doing all that he can for the defence preservation and prosperity of his country neither does the church condemn those who if it can be done without violation of justice wish to make their country independent of any foreign or despotic power nor does she blame those who wish to assign to the state the power of self-government and to its citizens the greatest possible measure of prosperity the church has always most faithfully fostered civil liberty and this was seen especially in italy in the municipal prosperity and wealth and glory which were obtained at a time when the solitary power of the church had spread without opposition to all parts of the state these things venerable brothers which under the guidance of faith and reason in the discharge of our apostolic office we have now delivered to you we hope especially by your cooperation with us will be useful unto very many in lowliness of heart we raise our eyes in supplication to god and earnestly beseech him to shed mercifully the light of his wisdom and of his counsel upon men so that strengthened by these heavenly gifts they may in matters of such moment discern what is true and may afterwards in public and in private at all times and with unshaken constancy live in accordance with the truth as a pledge of these heavenly gifts and in witness of our good will to you venerable brothers and to the clergy and people committed to each of you we most lovingly grant in the lord the apostolic benediction end of section seven Section 8 of The Great Encyclical Letters of Pope Leo XIII. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Right Ordering of Christian Life. Encyclical Letter Ezuente Yam Anno. December 25, 1888. At the close of the year in which, by the singular blessing and benefit of God, we have in sound health celebrated the 50th anniversary of our priesthood, we naturally look back upon the past months and with great pleasure recall to memory each and all of them 
and not without reason for while the event so far as it regarded us personally was of itself neither great nor wonderful it has moved the hearts of men in an unusual manner and has been celebrated with so many manifestations of joy and congratulations that nothing was left to be desired this general joy was indeed most pleasing to us and most gratifying but what we valued most in connection with it was the significance of these heartfelt demonstrations and the constancy of faith which they so unmistakably displayed for the congratulations which came to us from all sides express clearly this fact that in all places the minds and hearts of men are turned to the vicar of jesus christ that in the many evils which press upon us from every quarter men look with confidence to the apostolic see as to an ever-flowing and ever-pure source of salvation and that in every land where the catholic religion flourishes the roman church mother and mistress of all churches is reverenced and honoured as is right and fitting with one mind and with ardent love for these reasons we have often during the past months lifted up our eyes to the ever holy and eternal god in thanksgiving for the most gracious gift of life bestowed upon us and for the many consolations vouchsafed to us in our sorrows and during all this time we have used every occasion of showing our gratitude to those to whom it was due now however the closing days of the year and of the jubilee bid us renew the recollection of benefits received and to our very great satisfaction the whole church is joining with us in fresh thanksgiving at the same time we anxiously wish by this letter to declare publicly that as so many testimonies of devotion and kindness and love have done much to lighten our burden so too a grateful remembrance of them will live always in our mind but a holier and higher duty yet remains for in this affectionate and extraordinary eagerness to show honour to the roman pontiff we seem called upon to acknowledge the power and design of god who often draws and alone can draw the beginnings of great good from events of the smallest moment for god in his most loving providence seems to have wished to arouse faith in the midst of widespread disbelief and to recall the christian people to the pursuit of a higher life wherefore we must strive diligently that laying the foundation of good a favourable change may be inaugurated and that the intentions of god may be both understood and put in practice the obedience shown to the apostolic see will indeed be full and perfect if joined with the admiration for christian virtue it leads to the salvation of souls the only end worth seeking and one which will abide for ever in the exercise of the high apostolic office bestowed upon us by the goodness of god we have many times as in duty bound undertaken the defence of truth and have striven to expound particularly that teaching which seemed the most opportune for the public welfare so that in seeking the truth all might watchfully and carefully avoid the dangers of error but now as a loving parent of his children we wish to address all christians and in simple homely words to exhort all and each to lead a holy life for beyond the mere profession of faith christian virtues and practices are necessary for the christian and upon these depend not only the eternal salvation of souls but also the stable peace and true prosperity of the human family and of society if we inquire into the kind of life men everywhere lead it is impossible for any one to avoid the conclusion that public and private morals differ vastly from the precepts of the gospel too sadly alas do the words of the apostle st john apply to our age all that is in the world is the concupiscence of the flesh and the concupiscence of the eyes and the pride of life for in truth most men with little heed as to whence they have come or whither they are going place all their thoughts and all their care upon the vain and fleeting goods of this life and contrary to nature and right order they voluntarily give themselves up to serve things of which their reason tells them they should be the masters it is a short step from the desire of comfort and luxury to the striving after the means to obtain them hence arises the unbridled eagerness to become rich which binds those whom it possesses and while they are seeking the gratification of their passion hurries them along often without reference to justice or injustice and not infrequently even with insolent contempt for the penury of others thus very many who live in luxury call themselves the brethren of the multitudes whom in the depths of their hearts they despise 
with minds puffed up with pride they strive to be subject to no law and to have respect for no authority they call self-love liberty and think themselves born free like a wild ass's colt snares and temptations to sin abound impious and immoral dramas are exhibited on the stage books in the daily press jeer at virtue and noble crime and the fine arts themselves which were intended for virtuous use and for rightful recreation are made to minister to depraved passions nor can we look to the future without fear for new seeds of evil are continually being sown broadcast in the hearts of the rising generation as for the public schools it is well known to you that there is no ecclesiastical authority left in them and during the years when tender minds should be trained carefully and conscientiously in christian virtue the precepts of religion are for the most part even left untaught youths somewhat advanced in age encounter a still graver peril namely from evil teaching which is of such a kind as to deceive them by misleading words instead of filling them with a the knowledge of what is true for many nowadays seek to learn truth by the aid of reason alone putting divine faith entirely aside and through the exclusion of this strength and of this light they fall into many errors and fail to discover the truth they teach for instance that matter alone exists in the world that men and beasts have the same origin and a like nature and some even there are who go so far as to doubt the existence of god the ruler and maker of the world or to err most grievously like unto the heathen as to his divine nature hence the very essence and form of virtue of justice and of duty are of necessity distorted thus it is that while they hold up to admiration the high authority of reason and unduly extol the subtlety of the human intellect they fall into the just punishment of pride through ignorance of what is the greatest importance when the mind has thus been poisoned the moral character becomes at the same time deeply and substantially corrupt and so diseased a state can be cured only with the utmost difficulty in this class of men because on the one side their opinions vitiate the judgment of what is right and on the other they have not the light of christian faith which is the principle and foundation of all righteousness daily we see with our own eyes as it were the numerous evils that afflict all classes of men from these causes poisonous doctrines have corrupted both public and private life rationalism materialism and atheism have begotten socialism communism and nihilism fatal and pestilential evils which naturally and almost necessarily flow forth from such principles in good sooth if the catholic religion may be rejected with impunity whose divine origin is made clear by such unmistakable signs why should not all other forms of religion be rejected when it is clear that they have not the same evidence of truth if the soul is by nature one with the body and if therefore no hope of a happy eternity remains when the body dies what reason is there why men should endure toil and suffering here and the endeavour to subject the appetites to right reason the highest good of man will consist in enjoying the comforts and pleasures of life and since there is absolutely no one who does not by an instinct and impulse of nature strive after happiness every man will naturally lay hands on all he can in the hope of living happily on the spoils of others nor will there be any power mighty enough to bridle passions when fully set astir for if the supreme and eternal law which commands what is right and forbids what is wrong be rejected it follows that the power of law is thwarted and that all authority is loosened hence the bonds of civil society will be utterly shattered when every man is driven by insatiable greed to a perpetual struggle some striving to keep what they possess others to obtain what they covet such is more or less the spirit and tone of our age there is nevertheless some consolation for us even while looking at existing evils and we may lift up our heart in good hope for god created all things that they might be and he made the nations of the earth for health but as all this world cannot be upheld save by the will and providence of him who called it out of nothing so also can men be healed only by the power of him by whose goodness they were recalled from death to life for jesus christ redeemed the human race once by the abundant shedding of his blood and the efficacy of this great work and gift is for all ages 
neither is there salvation in any other. Hence, they who strive by the enforcement of law to extinguish the ever-growing flame of popular passions strive indeed for what is right and just, but they will labor with little or no result so long as they obstinately reject the power of the gospel and refuse the assistance of the church. These evils can be cured only by a change of principles and by returning in public and private conduct to Jesus Christ and to a Christian rule of life. Now the whole essence of a Christian life is not to take part in the corruption of the world, but to oppose constantly any indulgence in that corruption. This is taught by all the words and actions, by all the laws and institutions, by the very life and death of Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of faith. Hence, however strongly we are drawn back by our evil nature and the profligacy that is around us, it is our duty to run to the fight proposed to us, armed and prepared with the same courage and the same weapons as he who, having joy set before him, endured the cross. Wherefore men are bound to consider and understand this above all, that it is contrary to the profession and duty of a Christian to follow, as they are wont to do, every kind of pleasure, to shrink from the hardship attending a virtuous life, and to allow oneself all that gratifies and delights the senses. They that are Christ's have crucified their flesh with the vices and concupiscences. Hence it follows that they who are not accustomed to suffer and to disregard ease and pleasure belong not to Christ. By the infinite goodness of God, man was restored to the hope of an immortal life, from which he had been cut off but he cannot attain to it if he strives not to walk in the very footsteps of Christ, and to conform his mind and life to that of Christ by meditating on his example. Therefore, this is not a counsel, but a duty, and the duty, not only of those who desire a more perfect life, but of all, always bearing about in our body the mortification of Jesus. How else shall the natural law, which commands man to live virtuously, be kept? For by holy baptism the sin which we contracted at birth is taken away, but the evil and perverse roots which sin has planted in our hearts are by no means removed. That part of man which is without reason, although harmless to those who fight manfully by the grace of God, nevertheless struggles with reason for supremacy, disturbs the whole soul, and tyrannically bends the will away from virtue, with such power that we cannot escape vice or do our duty except by a daily struggle. The Council of Trent says, This holy synod teaches that in the baptized there remains concupiscence, or an inclination to evil, which being left to be fought against cannot hurt those who, instead of yielding to it, manfully fight against it by the grace of Jesus Christ. For he who hath lawfully striven shall be crowned. There is in this struggle a degree of valor to which only a very perfect virtue attains such as belongs to those who, by putting to flight impulses opposed to right reason, have made such advances in virtue as to seem almost to live a heavenly life on earth. Granted that few attain excellence so great, yet even the philosophy of the ancients taught that every man should conquer his evil desires, and still more, and with greater care, should those do so who, from daily contact with the world, are more sorely tempted, unless it be foolishly thought that, where the danger is greater, watchfulness is less needed, or that they whose maladies are most grievous need medicine more seldom. But the toil which is to be borne in this conflict is compensated by great blessings, over and above its eternal reward in heaven, and particularly because by the quelling of the passions nature is in a measure restored to its original dignity. For man has been born under a law that the soul should rule the body, and that the appetites should be restrained by mind and reason. And hence it follows that to restrain evil passions, striving for the mastery over us, is our noblest and greatest freedom. Moreover, it is difficult to see what can be expected of a man, even as a member of society, who is not thus disposed. Will anyone be inclined to do right who has been accustomed to make self-love the sole rule of what he should do or avoid doing? No man can be high-souled, or kind, or merciful, or restrained, who has not learned to conquer self, and to despise all worldly things when opposed to virtue. 
nor must we refrain from affirming that it seems to have been determined in the designs of god that there should be no salvation for men without struggle and pain indeed when god gave to man pardon for sin he gave it under the condition that his only begotten son should pay its just and due penalty and though jesus christ might have satisfied divine justice in other ways nevertheless he preferred to satisfy it by the utmost suffering and the sacrifice of his life therefore he has imposed it upon his followers as a law signed with his blood that their life should be in the strife with the vices of their age what made the apostles unconquerable in their mission of teaching truth to the world what strengthened our countless martyrs in bearing witness by their blood to the christian faith their more than readiness to obey fearlessly this law all who have taken heed to live a christian life and to seek after virtue have trodden the same path we too must walk along this road if we desire to assure either our own salvation or that of others therefore in the unbounded license that prevails it is necessary for every one to guard manfully against the allurements of luxury and since on every side there is so much pretentious display of enjoyment in wealth the soul must be strengthened against the dangerous snare of wealth lest in striving after what are called the good things of life which cannot satisfy and soon fade away the soul should lose the treasure in heaven which faileth not finally it is a further matter of deep grief that free thought and evil example have had such an influence in enfeebling the minds of men as to make many ashamed of the name of christian a shame which is the sign either of hopeless wickedness or of extreme cowardice either of these is detestable and each injurious in the extreme for what salvation remains for men or on what hope can they rely if they cease to glory in the name of jesus christ if they openly and constantly refuse to live by the precepts of the gospel it is a common complaint that the age is barren of courageous men bring back into vogue a christian rule of life and the minds of men will forthwith regain their strength and constancy but man's power of itself is not equal to the responsibility of so many and such various duties as we must ask of god our daily bread for the sustenance of the body so must we pray to him for strength of soul that we may be sustained in virtue hence that universal condition and law of our life which we have said is a perpetual warfare brings with it the necessity of prayer to god for as is well and gracefully said by st augustine devout prayer passes beyond the world's space and calls down the mercy of god from heaven in order to conquer the assaults of our passions and the snares of the devil lest we be led into evil we are commanded to seek the divine help in the words pray that ye enter not into temptation how much more is this necessary if we wish to labor profitably for the salvation of others also christ our lord the only begotten son of god though source of all grace and virtue first showed by example what he taught in word he passed the whole night in the prayer of god and when nigh to the sacrifice of his life he prayed the longer the frailty of nature would be much less perilous and the moral character less weak and languid if that divine precept of prayer were not so much disregarded and treated almost with dislike god is easily appeased he desires to do good to men having clearly promised to give his grace and abundance to those who ask for it nay he even invites men to ask and almost insists upon their asking with most loving words i say unto you ask and it shall be given to you seek and you shall find knock and it shall be opened unto you and that we may have no fear in doing this with all confidence and familiarity comparing himself to a most loving father who desires nothing so much as the love of his children if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to them that ask him whoever considers these things will not wonder at the efficacy of human prayer seeming so great to st john chrysostom that he thought it might be compared with the divine power for as god created all things by his word so man by prayer obtains whatever he wills nothing has so great a power to obtain grace for us as prayer when rightly made for it contains the motives by which god easily allows himself to be appeased and to incline to mercy 
In prayer we separate ourselves from things on earth. Filled with the thought of God alone, we become conscious of our human weakness, and therefore, resting in the goodness and embrace of our Heavenly Father, we seek refuge in the power of Him who created us. We approach the author of all good as if pressing him to look upon our weak souls, unsteadfast strength and great poverty, and full of hope we implore his aid and guardianship, who alone can heal our infirmities, and give help to us in our weakness and misery. By such a condition of mind, in which, as is fitting, we think humbly of ourselves, God is greatly moved to mercy, for God resisteth the proud, but to the humble he giveth grace. Let, then, the habit of prayer be sacred to all. Let the mind and heart and voice pray together, and let our life be in conformity with our prayer, so that by keeping the divine laws, the course of our days may seem a continual ascent towards God. The virtue of prayer of which we are speaking is, like other virtues, produced and nourished by divine faith. For God is the author of all true and alone desirable blessings, and to him also we owe our knowledge of his infinite goodness and of the merits of Jesus our Redeemer. But on the other hand, nothing is more fitted for the nourishment and increase of faith than the pious habit of prayer. And the need of the virtue of faith is seen plainly at this our time, through its weakness in most men, and its absence in so many. For faith is especially the source whereby not only each one's life may be amended, but also right judgment may be obtained, as to those matters which by their conflict hinder states from living in peace and security. If the multitude thirsts and raves for excess of liberty, if the indignation of the lower orders is with difficulty constrained, if the greed of the wealthier classes is insatiable, and if to these be added other evils of the same kind, which we have elsewhere fully set forth, it will be found that nothing can remedy them more fully or more surely than Christian faith. And here it is fitting that we should turn our thoughts and words to you whom God has made his helpers, by giving you his divine power to dispense his mysteries. If the sources of public and private moral welfare are examined, it will, without doubt, be found that the lives of the clergy may be of immense influence. Let them therefore remember that they have been called by Jesus Christ the light of the world, and that the soul of the priest should shine like a light illuminating the whole world. The light of learning, and this in no small degree is needed in the priest, because it is his duty to fill others with wisdom, to overcome error, and to be a guide to the many in the steep and slippery paths of life. Learning, however, must above all be accompanied by innocence of life, because in the reformation of man example avails far more than precept. Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works. The meaning of this divine precept is that the perfection of virtue in priests should be such that they should be like a mirror to the rest of men. Nothing leads others more surely to the love and worship of God than the life and example of those dedicated to the divine ministry. For since they are separated from the world and placed in a higher sphere, others look on them as on a mirror, to seek from them an example which they may follow. Therefore, if all men must watchfully take heed against the allurements of sin and against the too eager seeking after fleeting pleasures, it is clear that priests ought to do the same much more faithfully and steadfastly. But it is not enough for them merely to restrain their passions. Their sacred dignity requires of them, in addition, the habit of stringent self-denial, and that they should devote all the powers of their soul, particularly the intellect and will, which hold the highest powers in man, to the service of Christ. If thou hast a mind to leave all, says St. Bernard, remember to reckon thyself among the things that thou wishest to abandon. Nay, deny thyself first and before everything. Not until their soul is unshackled and free from every unhallowed desire will priests have a ready and generous zeal for the salvation of others, and without this they cannot properly secure their own. One thing only shall they seek and rejoice at, in those subject to them. In one thing only shall they glory, to make of them, if possible, a perfect people. For this they will strive in every way, with great labor of mind and body, in toil and suffering, in hunger and thirst, in cold and nakedness. 
frequent meditation upon the things of heaven wonderfully nourishes and strengthens virtue of this kind and makes it always ready and fearless of the greatest difficulties for the good of others the more pains they take in such meditation the more clearly will priests understand the greatness the excellence the holiness of their office they will see how sad it is that so many men redeemed by jesus christ should run headlong to eternal ruin and by meditation upon the divine nature they will themselves be more strongly moved and will more effectually excite others to the love of god such then is the surest way to secure the general welfare but let us not be frightened by the greatness of our difficulties or despair of cure by reason of the long continuance of evil the impartial and unchangeable justice of god reserves due reward for good deeds and fitting punishment for sin but since the life of peoples and nations does not outlast this world these necessarily receive the retribution upon this earth indeed it is not a new thing for prosperity to have place in a sinful nation and this by the just designs of god who from time to time rewards good deeds with prosperity for no people is altogether without worth this saint augustine considered to have been the case with the roman people the law nevertheless remains clear that nations may prosper it is to the interest of all that virtue and especially justice the mother of all virtues should be publicly practised justice exalteth a nation but sin maketh nations miserable it is not our purpose here to consider how far evil deeds may succeed or whether some kingdoms while flourishing according to their desires may nevertheless bear within them the seeds of ruin and misery this one thing of which history has innumerable examples we wish to be understood that injustice is always punished and with greater severity the longer it has been continued we however are greatly consoled by the words of the apostle st paul for all things are yours and you are christ's and christ is god's that is by the hidden dispensation of divine providence the course of earthly things is so guided and governed that all things that happen to man turn to the glory of god and lead to the salvation of the true disciples of jesus christ of these the mother and sustainer the leader and guardian is the church which united to christ her spouse in intimate and unchangeable charity is also joined to him in common contest and in common conquest hence we are not and cannot be anxious for the sake of the church but we greatly fear for the salvation of very many who in their pride despise the church and by many kinds of error are borne along to their own destruction we are anxious for those states which we cannot but see have turned from god and are sleeping in the midst of danger with dull security and insensibility nothing is equal in power to the church how many have opposed the church and have themselves perished the church reaches to the heavens such is the church's greatness she conquers when attacked when beset by snares she triumphs she struggles and is not overthrown she fights and is not overcome not only is she not conquered but she preserves entire that reforming power and efficient principle of salvation which she derives unceasingly from god and which remains unchanged by time and if by this power she freed the world grown old in vice and lost in superstition why should she not by the same bring it back again to the right way let suspicion and enmity cease at length let all obstacles be removed and let the church whose duty it is to guard and spread abroad the benefits obtained by jesus christ be restored everywhere to her rights then shall we know by experience how far the light of the gospel can reach and what the power of christ our redeemer can effect this year now coming to a close has given as we have said many signs of a reviving faith would that this little spark may increase till it become a mighty flame which burning up the roots of vice may quickly prepare the way for the restoration of morals and for solitary works we indeed who command the mystical bark of the church in so formidable a storm fix our mind and heart upon the divine pilot who sits unseen at the helm thou seest o lord how the winds have burst forth from every side how the sea rages and the waves are lashed to fury command we beseech thee who alone canst do so the winds and the sea 
give back to mankind that tranquillity of order, that true peace which the world cannot give. By thy grace and impulse, let men be restored to proper order, with piety towards God, with justice and love towards their neighbor, with temperance in regard to themselves, and with reason controlling all their passions. Let thy kingdom come, let the duty of submitting to thee and serving thee be learnt by those who, far from thee, seek truth and salvation with a purpose that is all vain. In thy law's justice and a father's gentleness are found, and thou grantest to us of thy own good will the power to keep thy commands. The life of man on earth is a warfare, but thou lookest down upon the struggle and helpest man to conquer. Thou raisest him that falls and crownest him that triumphs. Our mind is upheld by these thoughts to a joyful and firm hope, and as a pledge of heavenly favors and of our good will, we most lovingly in the Lord grant to you, venerable brothers, and to the clergy and people of the whole Catholic world, the apostolic blessing. End of section 8Section 9 of The Great Encyclical Letters of Pope Leo XIII. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On the Chief Duties of Christians as Citizens. Encyclical Letter Sapientiae Christiane. January 10th, 1890. From day to day it becomes more and more evident how needful it is that the principles of Christian wisdom should be ever borne in mind and that the life, the morals, and the institutions of nations should be wholly conformed to them. From the fact of these principles having been disregarded, mischiefs so vast have accrued, that no right-minded man can face the trials of the time being without grave solicitude, nor contemplate the future without serious alarm. Progress, not inconsiderable indeed, has been made toward securing the well-being of the body and of material things. But all natural advantages that administer to the senses of men, while bringing in their train the possession of wealth, power, and limitless resources, may indeed greatly avail to procure the comforts and increase the enjoyments of life, but are incapable of satisfying the soul created for higher and more glorious benefits. To fix the gaze on God and to aim earnestly at becoming like Him is the supreme law of the life of man. For we were created in the divine image and likeness, and are vehemently urged by our very nature to return to him from whom we have origin. But not by bodily motion or effort do we make advance towards God, but through acts of the soul, that is, through knowledge and love. God is, in very deed, the primal and supreme truth, and truth the food on which alone the soul is nourished. And God is holiness and perfection and the sovereign good, to which solely the will may aspire, and which it may attain, when virtue is its guide. But what applies to individual men applies equally to society, domestic alike and civil. Nature did not fashion society with intent that man should seek in it his last end, but that in it and through it he should find suitable aids, whereby to attain to his own perfection. If, then, a civil government strives after external advantages merely, and the attainment of such objects as adorn life, if in administering public affairs it is wont to put God aside, and show no solicitude for the upholding of moral law, it deflects woefully from its right course and from the injunctions of nature. Nor should such a gathering together and association of men be accounted as a commonwealth, but only as a deceitful imitation and make-believe of civil organization. As to what we have termed the well-being of the soul, which consists chiefly in the practice of the true religion and unswerving observance of the Christian precepts, we perceive that it is daily losing esteem among men, either by reason of forgetfulness or disregard, in such wise that the greater the advance made in the well-being of the body, the greater is the falling away in that of the soul. A striking proof of the lessening and enfeebling of Christian faith is seen in the insults that are, alas, so frequently, in open day and before our very eyes, offered to the Catholic Church. Insults, indeed, to which an age cherishing religion would on no account have submitted. 
for these reasons how great a multitude of men is involved in danger as to their eternal salvation surpasses belief but more than this nations and even vast empires themselves cannot long remain unharmed since upon the lapsing of christian institutions and morality the main foundation of human society must necessarily be uprooted force alone will remain to preserve public tranquillity and order force however is very feeble when the bulwark of religion has been removed and being more apt to beget slavery than obedience it bears within itself the germs of ever-increasing troubles the present century has encountered notable disasters nor is it clear that some equally terrible are not impending the very times in which we live are warning us to seek remedies there where alone they are to be found namely by re-establishing in the family circle and throughout the whole range of society the doctrines and practices of the christian religion in this lies the sole means of freeing us from the ills now weighing us down of forestalling the dangers now threatening the world for the accomplishment of this end venerable brothers we must bring to bear all the activity and diligence that lies within our power although we have already under other circumstances and whenever occasion required treated of these matters in other letters we deem it expedient in this message to you to define more in detail the duties of catholics inasmuch as these would if strictly observed avail with wondrous power to save society in all its length and breadth we are engaged as regards matters of highest moment in a violent and well-nigh daily struggle wherein it is hard at times for the minds of many not to be deluded not to go astray not to yield it behooves us venerable brothers to warn instruct and exhort each of the faithful with an earnestness befitting the occasion that none may abandon the way of truth it cannot be doubted that duties more numerous and of greater moment devolve on catholics than upon such as are either not sufficiently enlightened in relation to the catholic faith or who are entirely unacquainted with its doctrines considering that forthwith upon salvation being brought out for mankind jesus christ laid upon his apostles the injunction to preach the gospel to every creature he imposed it is evident upon all men the duty of learning thoroughly and believing what they were taught this duty is intimately bound up with the gaining of eternal salvation he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved but he that believeth not shall be condemned but the man who has embraced the christian faith as in duty bound is by that very fact a subject of the church as one of the children born of her and becomes a member of that greatest and holiest body which it is the special charge of the roman pontiff to rule with supreme power under its invisible head jesus christ now if the natural law enjoins us to love devotedly and to defend the country in which we had birth and in which we were brought up so that every good citizen hesitates not to face death for his native land very much more is it the urgent duty of christians to be ever quickened by like feelings towards the church for the church is the holy city of the living god born of god himself and by him built up and established upon the earth indeed she accomplishes her pilgrimage but by instructing and guiding men she summons them to eternal happiness we are bound then to love dearly the country whence we have received the means of enjoyment this mortal life affords but we have a much more urgent obligation to love with ardent love the church to which we owe the life of the soul a life that will endure for ever for fitting it is to prefer the good of the soul to the well-being of the body inasmuch as duties toward god are of a far more hallowed character than those toward men moreover if we would judge aright the supernatural love for the church and the natural love of our own country proceed from the same eternal principle since god himself is their author and originating cause consequently it follows that between the duties they respectively enjoin neither can come into collision with the other we can certainly and should love ourselves bearing ourselves kindly towards our fellow-men nourishing affection for the state and the governing powers but at the same time we can and must cherish towards the church a feeling of filial piety and love god with the deepest love of which we are capable the order of precedence of these duties is however at times 
either under stress of public calamities or through the perverse will of men invert it for instances occur where the state seems to require from men as subjects one thing and religion from men as christians quite another and this in reality without any other ground than that the rulers of the state either hold the sacred power of the church of no account or endeavor to subject it to their own will hence arises a conflict and an occasion through such conflict of virtue being put to the proof the two powers are confronted and urge their behest in a contrary sense to obey both is wholly impossible no man can serve two masters for to please the one amounts to condemning the other as to which should be preferred no one ought to balance for an instant it is a high crime indeed to withdraw allegiance from god in order to please men an act of consummate wickedness to break the laws of jesus christ in order to yield obedience to earthly rulers or under pretext of keeping the civil law to ignore the rights of the church we ought to obey god rather than men this answer which of old peter and the other apostles were used to give the civil authorities who enjoined unrighteous things we must in like circumstances give always and without hesitation no better citizen is there whether in time of peace or war than the christian who is mindful of his duty but such a one should be ready to suffer all things even death itself rather than abandon the cause of god or of the church hence they who blame and call by the name of sedition this steadfastness of attitude in the choice of duty have not rightly apprehended the force and nature of true law we are speaking of matters widely known and which we have before now more than once fully explained law is of its very essence a mandate of right reason proclaimed by a properly constituted authority for the common good but true and legitimate authority is void of sanction unless it proceed from god the supreme ruler and lord of all the almighty alone can commit power to a man over his fellow-men nor may that be accounted as right reason which is in disaccord with truth and with divine reason nor that held to be true good which is repugnant to the supreme and unchangeable good or that rests aside and draws away the wills of men from the charity of god hallowed therefore in the minds of christians is the very idea of public authority in which they recognize some likeness and symbol as it were of the divine majesty even when it is exercised by one unworthy a just and due reverence to the laws abides in them not from force and threats but from a consciousness of duty for god hath not given us a spirit of fear but if the laws of the state are manifestly at variance with the divine law containing enactments hurtful to the church or conveying injunctions adverse to the duties imposed by religion or if they violate in the person of the supreme pontiff the authority of jesus christ then truly to resist becomes a positive duty to obey a crime a crime moreover combined with misdemeanor against the state itself and as much as every offence levelled against religion is also a sin against the state here anew it becomes evident how unjust is the reproach of sedition for the obedience due to rulers and legislators is not refused but there is a deviation from their will in those precepts only which they have no power to enjoin commands that are issued adversely to the honour due to god and hence are beyond the scope of justice must be looked upon as anything rather than laws you are fully aware venerable brothers that this is the very contention of the apostle st paul who in writing to titus after reminding christians that they are to be subject to princes and powers and to obey at a word at once adds and to be ready to every good work thereby he openly declares that if laws of men contain injunctions contrary to the eternal law of god it is right not to obey them in like manner the prince of the apostles gave this courageous and sublime answer to those who would have deprived him of the liberty of preaching the gospel if it be just in the sight of god to hear you rather than god judge ye for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard wherefore to love both countries that of earth below and that of heaven above yet in such mode that the love of our heavenly surpasses the love of our earthly home and that human laws be never set above the divine law 
is the essential duty of Christians, and the fountainhead, so to say, from which all other duties spring. The Redeemer of mankind, of himself, has said, For this was I born, and for this came I into the world, that I should give testimony to the truth. In like manner, I am come to cast fire upon earth, and what will I but that it be kindled? In the knowledge of this truth, which constitutes the highest perfection of the mind, in divine charity, which, in like manner, completes the will, all Christian life and liberty abide. This noble patrimony of truth and charity, entrusted by Jesus Christ to the Church, she defends and maintains ever with untiring endeavor and watchfulness. But with what bitterness, and in how many guises, war has been waged against the Church, it will be ill-timed now to urge. From the fact that it has been vouchsafed to human reason to snatch from nature, through the investigation of science, many of her treasured secrets, and to apply them befittingly to the diverse requirements of life, men have become possessed, with so arrogant a sense of their own powers, as already to consider themselves able to banish from social life the authority and empire of God. Led away by this delusion, they make over to human nature the dominion of which they think God has been despoiled. From nature, they maintain, we must seek the principle and rule of all truth. From nature, they aver, alone spring, and to it should be referred all the duties that religious feeling prompts. Hence they deny all revelation from on high, and all fealty due to the Christian teaching of morals, as well as all obedience to the Church. And they go so far as to deny her power of making laws, and exercising every other kind of right, even disallowing the Church any place among the civil institutions of the State. These men aspire unjustly, and with their might strive to gain control over public affairs, and lay hands on the rudder of the State in order that the legislation may the more easily be adapted to these principles, and the morals of the people influenced in accordance with them. Whence it comes to pass that in many countries Catholicism is either openly assailed or else secretly interfered with, full impunity being granted to the most pernicious doctrines, while the public profession of Christian truth is shackled oftentimes with manifold constraints. Under such evil circumstances, therefore, each one is bound in conscience to watch over himself, taking all means possible to preserve the faith inviolate in the depths of his soul, avoiding all risks, and arming himself on all occasions, especially against the various specious sophisms rife among non-believers. In order to safeguard this virtue of faith in its integrity, we declare it to be very profitable and consistent with the requirements of the time, that each one, according to the measure of his capacity and intelligence, should make a deep study of Christian doctrine, and imbue his mind with as perfect a knowledge as may be of those matters that are interwoven with religion, and lie within the range of reason. And as it is necessary that faith should not only abide untarnished in the soul, but should grow with ever painstaking increase, the suppliant and humble entreaty of the apostles ought constantly to be addressed to God, increase our faith. But in this same matter, touching Christian faith, there are other duties whose exact and religious observance, necessary at all times in the interest of eternal salvation, become more especially so in these our days. Amid such reckless and widespread folly of opinion, it is, as we have said, the office of the Church to undertake the defense of truth and uproot errors from the mind, and this charge has to be at all times sacredly observed by her, seeing that the honor of God and the salvation of men are confided to her keeping. But when necessity compels, not those only who are invested with power of rule are bound to safeguard the integrity of faith. But, as St. Thomas maintains, each one is under obligation to show forth his faith, either to instruct and encourage others of the faithful, or to repel the attacks of unbelievers. To recoil before an enemy, or to keep silence when from all sides such clamors are raised against truth, is the part of a man either devoid of character, or who entertains doubt as to the truth of what he professes to believe. In both cases, such mode of behaving is base and is insulting to God, and both are incompatible with the salvation of mankind. This kind of conduct is profitable only to the enemies of the faith, 
for nothing emboldens the wicked so greatly as the lack of courage on the part of the good moreover want of vigor on the part of christians is so much the more blameworthy as not seldom little would be needed on their part to bring to naught false charges and refute erroneous opinions and by always exerting themselves more strenuously they might reckon upon being successful after all no one can be prevented from putting forth that strength of soul which is the characteristic of true christians and very frequently by such display of courage our enemies lose heart and their designs are thwarted christians are moreover born for combat whereof the greater the vehemence the more assured god aiding the triumph have confidence i have overcome the world nor is there any ground for alleging that jesus christ the guardian and champion of the church needs not in any manner the help of men power certainly is not wanting to him but in his loving kindness he would assign to us a share in obtaining and applying the fruits of salvation procured through his grace the chief elements of this duty consist in professing openly and unflinchingly the catholic doctrine and in propagating it to the utmost of our power for as is often said with the greatest truth there is nothing so hurtful to christian wisdom as that it should not be known since it possesses when loyally received inherent power to drive away error so soon as catholic truth is apprehended by a simple and unprejudiced soul reason yields assent now faith as a virtue is a great boon of divine grace and goodness nevertheless the objects themselves to which faith is to be applied are scarcely known in any other way than through the hearing how shall they believe him of whom they have not heard and how shall they hear without a preacher faith then cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of christ since then faith is necessary for salvation it follows that the word of christ must be preached the office indeed of preaching that is of teaching lies by divine right in the province of the pastors namely of the bishops whom the holy ghost has placed to rule the church of god it belongs above all to the roman pontiff vicar of jesus christ established as the head of the universal church teacher of all that pertains to morals and faith no one however must entertain the notion that private individuals are prevented from taking some active part in this duty of teaching especially those on whom god has bestowed gifts of mind with the strong wish of rendering themselves useful these so often as circumstances demand may take upon themselves not indeed the office of the pastor but the task of communicating to others what they have themselves received becoming as it were living echoes of their masters in the faith such cooperation on the part of the laity has seemed to the fathers of the vatican council so opportune and fruitful of good that they thought well to invite it all faithful christians but those chiefly who are in a prominent position or engaged in teaching we entreat by the compassion of jesus christ and enjoined by the authority of the same god and saviour that they bring aid to ward off and eliminate these errors from holy church and contribute their zealous help in spreading abroad the light of undefiled faith let each one therefore bear in mind that he both can and should so far as may be preach the catholic faith by the authority of his example and by open and constant profession of the obligations it imposes in respect consequently to the duties that bind us to god and the church it should be borne earnestly in mind that in propagating christian truth and warding off errors the zeal of the laity should as far as possible be brought actively into play the faithful would not however so completely and advantageously satisfy these duties as is fitting they should were they to enter the field as isolated champions of the faith jesus christ indeed has clearly intimated that the hostility and hatred of men which he first and foremost experienced would be shown in like degree toward the work founded by him so that many would be barred from profiting by the salvation for which all are indebted to his loving-kindness wherefore he will not only to train disciples in his doctrine but to unite them into one society and closely conjoin them in one body which is the church whereof he would be the head the life of jesus christ pervades therefore the entire framework of this body cherishes and nourishes its every member uniting each with each 
and making all work together to the same end, albeit the action of each be not the same. Hence it follows that not only is the Church a perfect society, far excelling every other, but it is enjoined by her founder that for the salvation of mankind she is to contend as an army drawn up in battle array. The organizations and constitution of Christian society can in no wise be changed. Neither can any one of its members live as he may choose, nor elect that mode of fighting which best pleases him. For in effect he scatters and gathers not, who gathers not with the church and with Jesus Christ. And all who fight not jointly with him and with the church are in very truth contending against God. To bring about such a union of minds and uniformity of action, not without reason so greatly feared by the enemies of Catholicism, the main point is that a perfect harmony of opinion should prevail, in which intent we find Paul the Apostle exhorting the Corinthians with earnest zeal and solemn weight of words. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no schisms among you, but that you be perfectly in the same mind and in the same judgment. The wisdom of this precept is readily apprehended. In truth, thought is the principle of action, and hence there cannot exist agreement of will nor similarity of action if people all think differently one from the other. In the case of those who profess to take reason as their sole guide, there would hardly be found, if, indeed, there ever could be found, unity of doctrine. Indeed, the art of knowing things as they really are is exceedingly difficult. Moreover, the mind of man is by nature feeble, and drawn this way and that by a variety of opinions, and not seldom led astray by impressions coming from without. And furthermore, the influence of the passions oftentimes takes away, or certainly at least diminishes, the capacity for grasping the truth. On this account, in controlling state affairs, means are often taken to keep those together by force who cannot agree in their way of thinking. It happens far otherwise with Christians. They receive their rule of faith from the Church, by whose authority and under whose guidance they are conscious that they have beyond question attained to truth. Consequently, as the Church is one, because Jesus Christ is one, so throughout the whole Christian world there is, and ought to be, but one doctrine, our Lord, one faith, but having the same spirit of faith. They possess the saving principle, whence proceeds spontaneously one and the same will in all, and one and the same tenor of action. Now, as the Apostle Paul urges, this unanimity ought to be perfect. Christian faith reposes not on human but on divine authority, for what God has revealed, we believe not on account of the intrinsic evidence of the truth perceived by the natural light of our reason, but on account of the authority of God revealing who cannot be deceived nor himself deceive. It follows as a consequence that whatever things are manifestly revealed by God, we must receive with a similar and equal assent. To refuse to believe any one of them is equivalent to rejecting them all. For those at once destroy the very groundwork of faith, who deny that God has spoken to men, or who bring into doubt his infinite truth and wisdom. To determine, however, which are the doctrines divinely revealed belongs to the teaching church, to whom God has entrusted the safekeeping and interpretation of his utterances. But the supreme teacher in the church is the Roman pontiff. Union of minds, therefore, requires, together with a perfect accord in the one faith, complete submission and obedience of will to the church and to the Roman pontiff, as to God himself. This obedience should, however, be perfect, because it is enjoined by faith itself, and has this in common with faith, that it cannot be given in shreds. Nay, were it not absolute and perfect in every particular, it might wear the name of obedience, but in essence would disappear. Christian usage attaches such value to this perfection of obedience that it has been, and will ever be, accounted the distinguishing mark by which we are able to recognize Catholics. Admirably does the following passage from St. Thomas of Aquinas set before us the right view. The formal object of faith is primary truth, as it is shown forth in the Holy Scriptures and in the teaching of the Church, which proceeds from the fountainhead of truth. 
it follows therefore that he who does not adhere as to an infallible divine rule to the teaching of the church which proceeds from the primary truth manifested in the holy scriptures possesses not the habit of faith but matters of faith he holds otherwise than true faith but it is evident that he who clings to the doctrines of the church as to an infallible rule yields his assent to everything the church teaches but otherwise if with reference to what the church teaches he holds what he likes but does not hold what he does not like he adheres not to the teaching of the church as to an infallible rule but to his own will the faith of the whole church should be one according to the precept one corinthians one ten let all speak the same thing and let there be no schisms among you and this cannot be observed save on condition that questions which arise touching faith should be determined by him who presides over the whole church whose sentence must consequently be accepted without wavering and hence to the sole authority of the supreme pontiff does it pertain to publish a new revision of the symbol as also to decree all other matters that concern the universal church in defining the limits of the obedience owed to the pastors of souls but most of all to the authority of the roman pontiff it must not be supposed that it is only to be yielded in relation to dogmas of which the obstinate denial cannot be disjoined from the crime of heresy nay further it is not enough sincerely and firmly to assent to doctrines which though not defined by any solemn pronouncement of the church are by her proposed to belief so divinely revealed in her common and universal teaching and which the vatican council declared are to be believed with catholic and divine faith but this likewise must be reckoned amongst the duties of christians that they allow themselves to be ruled and directed by the authority and leadership of bishops and above all of the apostolic see and how fitting it is that this should be so any one can easily perceive for the things contained in the divine oracles have reference to god in part and in part to man and to whatever is necessary for the attainment of his eternal salvation now both these that is to say what we are bound to believe and what we are obliged to do are laid down as we have stated by the church using her divine right and in the church by the supreme pontiff wherefore it belongs to the pope to judge authoritatively what things the sacred oracles contain as well as what doctrines are in harmony and what in disagreement with them and also for the same reason to show forth what things are to be accepted as right and what to be rejected as worthless what it is necessary to do and what to avoid doing in order to attain eternal salvation for otherwise there would be no sure interpreter of the commands of god nor would there be any safe guide showing man the way he should live in addition to what has been laid down it is necessary to enter more fully into the nature of the church she is not an association of christians brought together by chance but is a divinely established and admirably constituted society having for its direct and proximate purpose to lead the world to peace and holiness and since the church alone has through the grace of god received the means necessary to realize such end she has her fixed laws special spheres of action and a certain method fixed and conformable to her nature of governing christian peoples but the exercise of such governing power is difficult and leaves room for numberless conflicts inasmuch as the church rules people scattered through every portion of the world differing in race and customs who living under the sway of the laws of their respective countries owe obedience alike to the civil and religious authorities the duties enjoined are incumbent on the same persons as already stated and between them there exists neither contradiction nor confusion for some of these duties have relation to the prosperity of the state others refer to the general good of the church and both have as their object to train men to perfection the tracing out of these rights and duties being thus set forth it is plainly evident that the governing powers are wholly free to carry out the business of the state and this not only not against the wish of the church but manifestly with her cooperation and as much as she strongly urges to the practice of piety which implies right feeling towards god and by that very fact inspires a right mindedness towards the rulers in the state the spiritual power however has a far loftier purpose the church directing her aim to govern the minds of men in the defending of the kingdom of god and his justice a task she is wholly bent upon accomplishing no one can however without risks to faith 
foster any doubt as to the church alone having been invested with such power of governing souls as to exclude altogether the civil authority in truth it was not to caesar but to peter that jesus christ entrusted the keys of the kingdom of heaven from this doctrine touching the relations of politics and religion originate important consequences which we cannot pass over in silence a notable difference exists between every kind of civil rule and that of the kingdom of christ if this latter bear a certain likeness and character to a civil kingdom it is distinguished from it by its origin principle and essence the church therefore possesses the right to exist and to protect herself by institutions and laws in accordance with her nature and since she not only is a perfect society in herself but superior to every other society of human growth she resolutely refuses prompted alike by right and by duty to link herself to any mere party and to subject herself to the fleeting exigencies of politics on like grounds the church the guardian always of her own right and most observant of that of others holds that it is not her province to decide which is the best amongst many diverse forms of government and the civil institutions of christian states and amid the various kinds of state rule she does not disapprove of any provided the respect due to religion and the observance of good morals be upheld by such standard of conduct should the thoughts and mode of acting of every catholic be directed there is no doubt but that in the sphere of politics ample matter may exist for legitimate difference of opinion and that the single reserve being made of the rights of justice and truth all may strive to bring into actual working the ideas believed likely to be more conducive than others to the general welfare but to attempt to involve the church in party strife and seek to bring her support to bear against those who take opposite views is only worthy of partisans religion should on the contrary be accounted for every one as holy and inviolate nay in the public order itself of states which cannot be severed from the laws influencing morals and from religious duties it is always urgent and indeed the main preoccupation to take thought how best to consult the interests of catholicism wherever these appear by reason of the efforts of adversaries to be in danger all difference of opinion among catholics should forthwith cease so that like thoughts and counsels prevailing they may hasten to the aid of religion the general and supreme good to which all else should be referred we think it well to treat this matter somewhat more in detail the church alike and the state doubtless both possess individual sovereignty hence in the carrying out of public affairs neither obeys the other within the limits to which each is restricted by its constitution it does not hence follow however that church and state are in any manner severed and still less antagonistic nature in fact has given us not only physical existence but moral life likewise hence from the tranquillity of public order whose immediate purpose is civil society man expects that this may be able to secure all his needful well-being and still more supply the sheltering care which perfects his moral life which consists mainly in the knowledge and practice of virtue he wishes moreover at the same time as in duty bound to find in the church the aids necessary to his religious perfection which consist in the knowledge and practice of the true religion of that religion which is the queen of virtues because in binding these to god it completes them all and perfects them therefore they who are engaged in framing constitutions and in enacting laws should bear in mind the moral and religious nature of man and take care to help him but in a right and orderly way to gain perfection neither enjoining nor forbidding anything save what is reasonably consistent with civil as well as with religious requirements on this very account the church cannot stand by indifferent as to the import and significance of laws enacted by the state not so far indeed as they refer to the state but in so far as passing beyond their due limits they trench upon the rights of the church from god has the duty been assigned to the church not only to interpose resistance if at any time the state rule should run counter to religion but further to make a strong endeavour that the power of the gospel may pervade the law and institutions of the nations and inasmuch as the destiny of the state depends mainly on the disposition of those who are at the head of affairs it follows that the church cannot give countenance or favour to those whom she knows to be imbued with a spirit of hostility to her who refuse openly to respect her rights 
who make it their aim and purpose to tear asunder the alliance that should by the very nature of things connect the interests of religion with those of the state on the contrary she is as she is bound to be the upholder of those who are themselves imbued with the right way of thinking as to the relations between church and state and who strive to make them work in perfect accord for the common good these precepts contain the abiding principle by which every catholic should shape his conduct in regard to public life in short where the church does not forbid taking part in public affairs it is fit and proper to give support to men of acknowledged worth and who pledge themselves to deserve well in the catholic cause and on no account may it be allowed to prefer to them any such individuals as are hostile to religion whence it appears how urgent is the duty to maintain perfect union of minds especially at these our times when the christian name is assailed with designs so concerted and subtle all who have it at heart to attach themselves earnestly to the church which is the pillar and ground of the truth will easily steer clear of masters who are lying and promising them liberty when they themselves are slaves of corruption nay more having made themselves sharers in the divine virtue which resides in the church they will triumph over the craft of their adversaries by wisdom and over their violence by courage this is not now the time and place to inquire whether and how far the inertness and internal dissensions of catholics have contributed to the present condition of things but it is certain at least that the perverse-minded would exhibit less boldness and would not have brought about such an accumulation of ills if the faith which worked by charity had been generally more energetic and lively in the souls of men and had there not been so universal drifting away from the divinely established rule of morality throughout christianity may at least the lessons afforded by the memory of the past have the good result of leading to a wiser mode of acting in the future as to those who mean to take part in public affairs they should avoid with the very utmost care two criminal excesses so-called prudence and false courage some there are indeed who maintain that it is not opportune boldly to attack evil doing in its might and when in the ascendant as they say opposition should exasperate minds already hostile these make it a matter of guesswork as to whether they are for the church or against her since on the one hand they give themselves out as professing the catholic faith and yet wish that the church should allow certain opinions at variance with her teaching to be spread abroad with impunity they moan over the loss of faith and the perversion of morals yet trouble themselves not to bring any remedy nay not seldom even add to the intensity of the mischief through too much forbearance or harmful dissembling these same individuals would not have any one entertain a doubt as to their good will towards the holy see yet they have always a something by way of reproach against the supreme pontiff the prudence of men in this caste is of that kind which is termed by the apostle paul wisdom of the flesh and death of the soul because it is not subject to the law of god neither can it be nothing is less calculated to amend such ills than prudence of this kind for the enemies of the church have for their object and they hesitate not to proclaim it and many among them boast of it to destroy outright if possible the catholic religion which is alone the true religion with such a purpose in hand they shrink from nothing for they are fully conscious that the more faint-hearted those who withstand them become the more easy will it be to work out their wicked will therefore they who cherish the prudence of the flesh and who pretend to be unaware that every christian ought to be a valiant soldier of christ they who would fain obtain the rewards owing to conquerors while they are leading the lives of cowards untouched in the fight are so far from thwarting the onward march of the evil disposed that on the contrary they even help it forward on the other hand not a few impelled by a false zeal or what is more blameworthy still affecting sentiments which their conduct belies take upon themselves to act a part which does not belong to them they would fain see the church's mode of action influenced by their ideas and their judgment to such an extent that everything done otherwise they take ill or accept with repugnance some yet again expend their energies in fruitless contention being worthy of blame equally with the former to act in such manner is not to follow lawful authority but to forestall it 
and, unauthorized, assume the duties of the spiritual rulers, to the great detriment of the order which God established in his church, to be observed for ever, and which he does not permit to be violated with impunity by any one, whoever he may be. Honor, then, to those who shrink not from entering the arena as often as need calls, believing and being convinced that the violence of injustice will be brought to an end, and finally give way to the sanctity of right and religion. They truly seem invested with the dignity of time-honored virtue, since they are struggling to defend religion, and chiefly against the faction banded together to attack Christianity with extreme daring and without tiring, and to pursue with incessant hostility the sovereign pontiff fallen into their power. But men of this high character maintain without wavering the love of obedience, nor are they wont to undertake anything upon their own authority. Now, since a like resolve to obey, combined with constancy and sturdy courage, is needful, so that whatever trials the pressure of events may bring about, they may be deficient in nothing. We greatly desire to fix deep in the minds of each one that which Paul calls the wisdom of the Spirit. For in controlling human actions, this wisdom follows the excellent rule of moderation, with the happy result that no one either timidly despairs through lack of courage, or presumes over much from want of prudence. There is, however, a difference between the political prudence that relates to the general good and that which concerns the good of individuals. This latter is shown forth in the case of private persons, who obey the prompting of right reason in the direction of their own conduct, while the former is the characteristic of those who are set over them, and chiefly of rulers of the state, whose duty it is to exercise the power of command, so that the political prudence of private individuals would seem to consist wholly in carrying out faithfully the orders issued by lawful authority. Footnote. Prudence proceeds from reason, and to reason especially pertains to guide and govern. Whence it follows that insomuch as any one takes part in the control and government of affairs, in so far ought he to be gifted with reason and prudence. But it is evident that the subject, so far as subject, and the servant, so far as servant, ought neither to control nor govern, but rather to be controlled and governed. Prudence, then, is not the special virtue of the servant, so far as servant, nor the subject, so far as subject. But because any man, on account of his character of a reasonable being, may have some share in the government according to the degree which reason determines, it is fitting that in such proportion he should possess the virtue of prudence. Whence it manifestly results that prudence exists in the ruler, as it exists in the architect, with regard to the building he has to construct, just as is expressed in the sixth book of morals, and that it exists in the subject as it exists in the workmen employed in the construction. St. Thomas. End of footnote. The like disposition and the same order should prevail in every Christian state by so much the more than the political prudence of the pontiff embraces diverse and multiform things, for it is his charge not only to rule the church, but generally so to regulate the actions of Christian citizens, that these may be in apt conformity to their hope of gaining eternal salvation. Whence it is clear that in addition to the complete accordance of thought and deed, the faithful should initiate the practical political wisdom of ecclesiastical authority. Now the administration of Christian affairs, immediately under the Roman pontiff, appertains to the bishops, who, although they attain not to the summit of pontifical power, are, nevertheless, truly princes in the ecclesiastical hierarchy, and as each one of them administers a particular church, they are as master workers, in the spiritual edifice. And they have members of the clergy to share their duties and carry out their decisions. Everyone has to regulate his mode of conduct according to the constitution of the church, which it is not in the power of any man to change. Consequently, just as in the exercise of their episcopal authority, the bishops ought to be united with the apostolic see, so should the members of the clergy and the laity live in close union with their bishops. Among the prelates, indeed, one or other they may be, affording scope to criticism, either in regard to personal conduct or in reference to opinions by him entertained about points of doctrine. But no private person may arrogate to himself the office of judge, which Christ our Lord has bestowed on that one alone 
whom he placed in charge of his lambs and of his sheep. Let every one bear in mind that most wise teaching of Gregory the Great. Subjects should be admonished not rashly to judge their prelates, even if they chance to see them acting in a blameworthy manner. Lest reproving what is wrong, they be led by pride into greater wrong. They are to be warned against the danger of setting themselves up in audacious opposition to the superiors whose shortcomings they may notice. Should, therefore, the superiors really have committed grievous sins, their inferiors, penetrated with the fear of God, ought not to refuse them respectful submission. The actions of superiors should not be smitten by the sword of the word, even when they are rightly judged to have deserved censure. However, all endeavors will avail but little unless our life be regulated conformably with the discipline of the Christian virtues. Let us call to mind what Holy Scripture records concerning the Jewish nation. As long as they sinned not in the sight of their God, it was well with them, for their God hateth iniquity. And even, when they had revolted from the way that God had given them to walk therein, they were destroyed in battle by many nations. Now the nation of the Jews bore an inchoate semblance to the Christian people, and the vicissitudes of their history in olden times have often foreshadowed the truth that was to come, saving that God in his goodness has enriched and loaded us with far greater benefits, and on this account the sins of Christians are more greater, and bear the stamp of more shameful and criminal ingratitude. The church, it is certain, at no time and in no particular is deserted by God. Hence there is no reason why she should be alarmed at the wickedness of men. But in the case of nations falling away from Christian virtue, there is not a like ground of assurance, for sin maketh nations miserable. If every bygone age has experienced the force of this truth, wherefore should not our own? There are, in truth, very many signs which proclaim that just punishments are already menacing, and the condition of modern states tend to confirm this belief since we perceive many of them in sad plight from intestine disorders, and not one entirely exempt. But should these leagued together in wickedness hurry onward in the road they have boldly chosen, should they increase in influence and purposes the crafty schemes, there will be ground to fear lest the very foundations nature has laid for states to rest upon be utterly destroyed. Nor can such misgivings be removed by any mere human effort, especially as a vast number of men, having rejected the Christian faith, are on that account justly incurring the penalty of their pride, since blinded by their passions they search in vain for truth, laying hold on the false for the true, and thinking themselves wise when they call evil good, and good evil, and put darkness in the place of light, and light in the place of darkness. It is therefore necessary that God come to the rescue, and that, mindful of his mercy, he turned an eye of compassion on human society. Hence we renew the urgent entreaty we have already made to redouble zeal and perseverance, when addressing humble supplications to our merciful Lord, so that the virtues whereby a Christian life is perfected may be reawakened. It is, however, urgent before all that charity, which is the main foundation of the Christian life, and apart from which the other virtues exist not or remain barren, should be quickened and maintained. Therefore is it that the Apostle St. Paul, after having exhorted the Colossians to flee all vice and cultivate all virtue, adds, Above all things have charity, which is the bond of perfection. Yes, truly, charity is the bond of perfection, for it binds intimately to God those whom it has embraced, and with loving tenderness causes them to draw their life from God, to act with God, to refer all to God. Howbeit the love of God should not be severed from the love of our neighbor, since men have a share in the infinite goodness of God, and bear in themselves the impress of his image and likeness. This commandment we have from God, that he who loveth God love also his brother. If any man say, I love God, and he hateth his brother, he is a liar. And this commandment concerning charity, its divine proclaimer, styled new, not in the sense that the previous law, or even nature itself, had not enjoined that men should love one another, but because the Christian precept of loving each other in that manner was truly new, and quite unheard of in the memory of man. 
for that love with which jesus christ is beloved by his father and with which he himself loves men he obtained for his disciples and followers that they might be of one heart and of one mind in him by charity as he himself and his father are one by their nature no one is unaware how deeply and from the very beginning that precept has been implanted in the breast of christians and what abundant fruits of concord mutual benevolence piety patience and fortitude it has produced why then should we not devote ourselves to imitate the examples set by our fathers the very times in which we live should afford sufficient motives for the practice of charity since impious men are bent on giving fresh impulse to their hatred against jesus christ christians should be quickened anew in piety and charity which is the inspirer of lofty deeds should be imbued with new life let dissensions therefore if there be any wholly cease let those strifes which waste the strength of those engaged in the fight without any advantage resulting to religion be scattered to the winds let all minds be united in faith and all hearts in charity so that as it behooves life may be spent in the practice of the love of god and the love of men this is a suitable moment for us to exhort especially heads of families to govern their households according to these precepts and to be solicitous without failing for the right training of their children the family may be regarded as the cradle of civil society and it is in great measure within the circle of family life that the destiny of the state is fostered whence it is that they who would break away from christian discipline are working to corrupt family life and to destroy it utterly root and branch from such an unholy purpose they allow not themselves to be turned aside by the reflection that it cannot even in any degree be carried out without inflicting cruel outrage on the parents these hold from nature their right of training the children to whom they have given birth with the obligation superadded of shaping and directing the education of their little ones to the end for which god vouchsafed the privilege of transmitting the gift of life it is then incumbent on parents to strain every nerve to ward off such an outrage and to strive manfully to have and to hold exclusive authority to direct the education of their offspring as is fitting in a christian manner and first and foremost to keep them away from schools where there is risk of drinking in the poison of impiety where the right education of youth is concerned no amount of trouble or labor can be undertaken how great soever but that even greater still may not be called for in this regard indeed there are to be found in many countries catholics worthy of general admiration who incur considerable outlay and bestow much zeal in founding schools for the education of youth it is highly desirable that such noble example may be generously followed where time and circumstances demand yet all should be intimately persuaded that the minds of children are most influenced by the training they receive at home if in their early years they find within the walls of their homes the rules of an upright life and the discipline of christian virtues the future welfare of the state will in great measure be guaranteed and now we seem to have touched upon those matters which catholics ought chiefly nowadays to follow or mainly to avoid it rests with you venerable brothers to take measures that our voice may reach everywhere and that one and all may understand how urgent it is to reduce to practice the teachings set forth in this our letter the observance of these duties cannot be troublesome or onerous for the yoke of jesus christ is sweet and his burden is light if anything however appear too difficult of accomplishment you will afford aid by the authority of your example so that each one of the faithful may make more strenuous endeavour and display a soul unconquered by difficulties bring it home to their minds as we have ourselves oftentimes conveyed the warning that matters of the highest moment and worthy of all honour are at stake for the safeguarding of which every most toilsome effort should be readily endured and that a sublime reward is in store for the labours of a christian life on the other hand to refrain from doing battle for jesus christ amounts to fighting against him he himself assures us he will deny before his father in heaven those who shall have refused to confess him on earth as for ourselves and you all never assuredly so long as life lasts shall we allow our authority our counsels and our solicitude to be in any wise lacking in the conflict nor is it to be doubted but that a special aid of the great god will be vouchsafed 
so long as the struggle endures, to the flock alike and to the pastors. Sustained by this confidence, as a pledge of heavenly gifts, and of our loving kindness in the Lord to you, venerable brothers, to your clergy and to all your people, we accord the apostolic benediction. End of section 9